Okay, so let us begin. I'm really glad to welcome Professor Tim Williamson from Oxford to give the Craig Lectures 2019. 18. 18. <laughs> <laughs> I thought there's something smart going on. Okay. So, Tim Williamson is, is famous for several important books and, and papers on lots of language, metaphysics, logic. Uh, I'm not going to name all the books, but maybe you should know all of them. But well, I just mentioned just a few. So, knowledge and its Limits, which we read here also together some years ago. Philosophy, philosophy and then uh, Model Logic as Metaphysics. And most recently, a uh, book, Doing Philosophy, on which these lectures are being partly based on. Highly recommended. Okay. So, and the other thing to note is that please sign the name. Okay. And uh, these are two lectures today, and uh, two signatures. Same thing tomorrow. <laughs> right. Uh, well, thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to, to be here. Um, I, I hope that in, in these uh, lectures I'm not going to uh, say anything that would make uh, Frege uh, spin too fast in his grave. Um, but I, 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 and I can uh, boast at least one um, common property that I, I share with uh, him, which is that um, both of us uh, were born in Sweden without being Swedes. Uh, I mean, if you look on the map, the, the place where Frege was born, Wismar, is, 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 now it's in Germany. But at the time uh, he was born, it was officially uh, it's still technically in, in Sweden. So, um, and I was born in Uppsala. Anyway, um, what I'm going to be uh, doing in these uh, lectures is uh, developing a conception of uh, philosophy, not, not by any means a, a, a completely new conception, uh, but I think one which uh, has uh, a lot uh, more to be said for it than many people uh, realize. Um, and the, I mean, the, the center of it is anti-exceptionalism uh, about uh, philosophy. In other words, uh, philosophy is uh, much less uh, different, much less fundamentally d different um, from other kinds of uh, inquiry than, uh, than many uh, philosophers uh, like to uh, think. Uh, I've, on my view that I'm going to be uh, developing in these uh, lectures, uh, philosophy is in a broad sense a, a science uh, like other sciences, by which I, uh, I mean that uh, it's a, a form of uh, systematic, um, theoretical, critical uh, inquiry, um, and uh, that it's based on argument and evidence in a, a way which is not fundamentally different from other sciences. Of course, all sciences differ from each other in various uh, ways, including methodological uh, ways. But, it, but it, it only differs in, in those kind of uh, ways. And so philosophy is, is, not, uh, is not that special. Uh, um, it's neither, as it were, very specially good nor very specially bad. Um, and and when I say that it's a science, I really mean that it's a science in its own right. I don't mean that it somehow um, is a, a science in a parasitic sense because it, it draws on other recognized uh, sciences. And, uh, and so it's, it's neither the, the queen nor the uh, handmaid of the, uh, the sciences. Uh, it's it's just it's one more uh, science, but I mean, with a distinctive character, just as other uh, sciences uh, have a distinctive 
uh, character. But in saying that it's a science, I do not mean that it's a natural science, where uh, by a natural science I mean something like uh, physics or chemistry or uh, biology. Uh, and if you wonder how something could be a science without being a natural science, the, the most obvious uh, example uh, is mathematics, which is uh, one of the, the most, uh, maybe the most rigorous uh, science that, that we possess, but which is not in any useful sense a natural science. Uh, of course, in saying that it's not a natural science, I'm, I mean, m mathematics, of course, is, uh, is used it, all over the natural sciences, and, uh, and it, sometimes mathematical developments are inspired by uh, developments in the other sciences, but it's a science in its own right. And similarly with philosophy, I'm not suggesting that, that philosophy doesn't have important uh, connections uh, with influence going in both uh, directions with, with other sciences, but it, it only has those in the s roughly the same sort of way that other sciences are not hermetically uh, sealed off uh, from, uh, from each other. It, it, it's not, as it were, dependent on, on other sciences for its scientific uh, status. Um, and, and so it's, in that sense, it's not, I mean, there's no distinctive sense in which it's a natural science. I'm also going to be uh, defending a view on which it's a science uh, in a, uh, a broadly uh, realistic uh, sense of uh, science, where I'm taking it that sciences are uh, forms of uh, inquiry into a reality that is um, mainly uh, independent of, of us. And I mean, that will come out in, in various ways. And of course, it's a somewhat uh, Fragian conception of uh, inquiry as well, but I, I won't be developing the Frege connection. Um, so, uh, in this lecture, I want to, to say something about the, the connection uh, between um, common sense and, uh, and philosophy. Uh, as, as something about the, uh, the starting point of uh, philosophy, and, but also uh, something about, the w not about common sense, not only as a starting point for philosophy, but as a, uh, a continuing uh, constraint uh, on its uh, activities. And I think, I mean, the, I mean, the initial point is just that, that philosophy, uh, like all forms of inquiry, starts with uh, common sense uh, in, in that it starts with the kind of um, cognitive faculties that, uh, that human beings uh, have, I mean, faculties for um, perception, memory, thought, imagination, communication, and, and so on. And uh, just as, in fact, as with the natural sciences and mathematics and other sciences, it's, uh, it's really just a gradual development, uh, a refinement of uh, those kinds of uh, ways of of thinking, um, and and just as as we would expect in the in the case of the natural sciences, it's it's one that that never completely uh, as it were transcends its origin because after all, if if you were uh, if you were an, a natural scientist, but you were uh, continually uh, suffering from uh, hallucinations. Then I mean you would just be in no position to uh, to do natural science uh, in a worthwhile uh, way, and and so uh, it's not it's not as though as though, uh, if the science can ever get to a, a point where it's so advanced that it doesn't depend on the the basic cognitive uh, faculties uh, of of the the people who are uh, doing it, um, and. Uh, and I'm taking it also that, that philosophy uh, begins in common sense um, in, in that it's, it's driven 
by a, a kind of uh, curiosity that, uh, that, that we have, which is after all, I mean, not so different from what many, many uh, species of animal have. I mean, the, you know, all sorts of animals are, are curious about their environment. It makes, it makes sense to, as it were, to acquire knowledge of, of what things are going on, but, uh, how, how your situation is and so on, because, because you don't know when such knowledge um, may come in invaluable. Uh, so that can be, turn out to be of use. So, I mean, you can't tell in advance what, what knowledge is going to be useful and what, what isn't. Um, and, I, and I take it that the, the initial kinds of question from which philosophy gets uh, started are questions which are very, very uh, similar to the questions Perhaps, perhaps, in fact, largely overlap the questions uh, with which uh, science, uh, in the a more restricted sense of natural science, gets uh, started. So, uh, I mean, I don't think that all philosophical questions are, are questions of the form, what is, but it just as it were for definiteness, if we uh, concentrate on what is uh, questions, then I mean, there are questions like, I mean, that, well, at a, a very low level, there are you know, questions like, what, you know, what is, what is milk or, you know, what is honey or uh, what, what is water? Uh, but, and then you, you, gradually you get more abstract questions like, um, you know, what is light? What is sound? Uh, what is life? Uh, what is what is time? What is space? Which which are partly scientific questions, but also clearly philosophical uh, questions as well. And uh, and then um, if you like more archetypically uh, philosophical questions. Or I'd, actually, I would have thought what is time is itself an archetypically philosophical question. But things like what is justice? What is knowledge? And so on. I mean, these are these are philosophical questions. And I I think it would be a, a mistake to think that there's anything fundamentally different in origin from those ones which we would now classify as, um, as philosophical questions, like what is uh, knowledge and what is justice, uh, that, they're, that they're in their origins that they're any, any different uh, from uh, what we now think of as much more scientific questions like what is light, what is sound, and the fact that what is space and what is time are, uh, the, are somehow in the overlap uh, th there is, is suggestive of, uh, of that. Th these are all questions which are which it's natural to, to ask w when, we, w w when we get curious about the, the kinds of uh, Distinctions that we're applying uh, in ordinary life, and and maybe when when they become in some way tricky to apply, then we w then uh, that's a kind of prompt to to ask such uh, more general questions as well. What is what are these things uh, anyway? And uh, and one thing I want to emphasize is that in their origin, none of these are questions about words or concepts. Unless you specific, I mean, of course, you can ask questions like, what is language? What are words? I mean, the, you know, ones which are explicitly about words. But uh, that, that's, as it were, because of the specific subject matter. But, but when, we're, when we're asking um, what is light, for example, we're not asking about what is the meaning of the word light. We're not asking um, what is the concept of light. We're asking about light itself, this uh, phenomenon that, that we interact with through our senses and so on. And that's, I think that's also equally true of a uh, question like what is time, that, that what we fundamentally want to, to know about uh, is time itself. And although, I mean, you could ask questions about how we use the word time or, or what our experience of time is. So I think the, 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 the natural primary question is what is time it's, it, itself? What is it? and, and in asking that question, we're not engaging in some kind of terrible uh, 
reification where we, we somehow stupidly think that, that, that time is, uh, is something that we can hold in our hands. Or we, we're, we're just asking a rather abstract uh, question. Um, and the, the, sa the same goes for uh, the, as it were, the more, if you, as these classifications go, the more distinctively philosophical uh, questions like uh, w what is knowledge and what is uh, justice. That w w when we're interested in justice, the, the natural thing to be interested in is justice itself, not not what we mean by the word justice, although of course there's, there's going to be some connection, but, but the primary thing is, is justice itself. What, what is this distinction uh, between um, the just and unjust acts and so on? And similarly, uh, in the case of knowledge, that the, uh, the, the primary thing to be interested uh, in is, um, is knowledge itself. In other words, the distinction between uh, the difference between knowing something and not knowing it. And, uh, I mean, we can have some kind of secondary interest in uh, how we use these words, but the, the primary interest is, is not in uh, our use of the words, but in this thing that we use the words to talk about. Um, I'm, I'm going to say much more in... Uh, both in this, this afternoon and, and to some extent in, in further lectures about um, this, the question of in, in what way philosophy might or might not uh, be co connected uh, with concepts. But I think if we just take this initial starting point, uh, there's, there's just no plausibility in the idea that, that what's special about these philosophical questions is that they're, uh, they're questions about concepts or something like that, whereas other questions are, are not. That, 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 that's not how philosophy starts. It's, it starts uh, in, in a much more straightforward and, to my mind, intellectually healthier way uh, than, than that. Um, so, as it were, that's, that's how, roughly speaking, how we get into these uh, questions and, um, and the, the kind of um, starting point that we, that we have. Uh, and uh, and in, in our initial investigation of these questions, we're, we're, we're going to be mainly reliant on uh, uh, common sense ways of knowing. We're going to, we're going to uh, rely on uh, what we already know or uh, believe about things uh, um, and, and on the kinds of methods that we have for acquiring new uh, knowledge and belief and roughly speaking common sense methods. And when, I, when I'm talking about common sense here, I, I just mean something like uh, what is generally believed in the case of common sense belief and gen what is generally known in the case of common sense knowledge um, by members of a, a given uh, society at a, a given uh, time. So I'm not, I'm not assuming that, that common sense is, uh, is something that is universal and unchanging across different societies and uh, different times. Um, and I'm not assuming that, that common sense uh, is by definition, as it were, if we're just uh, uh, always a source of uh, truth, because I'm allowing that there are common sense beliefs uh, which, uh, which may be false. Of course, common sense knowledge isn't going to be false because the nature of, of knowledge re uh, requires truth. But uh, so it, it might be in a certain society, um, it might be a, a common sense uh, belief that uh, slavery is morally okay or something like that. I mean, it would, would just be a, uh, a, a false uh, common sense belief. And I, I take it in our society, it is common sense knowledge, not just true belief. Uh, that, that slavery is not morally uh, okay. Um, so so I'm, I, I don't want to beg too many questions by in talking about, uh, about common sense in this way. So I, I'm 
as I say, I'm allowing that common sense can sometimes be a source of uh, falsity as, as well as of uh, truth. Um, now, what, what I've been talking about so far is, has mainly been to do with uh, common sense as the, the kind of origin of of philosophy, as, as it is of, of really of all, all of our uh, I inquiries, that, that as a word, it's, a, if you like, the, the, some kind of shared or, or ordinary mode of uh, cognition that w where we start asking these questions and making our initial uh, attempts uh, to answer them without, without any special philosophical faculties or, or anything like uh, that. But in the in, in the next part of the, the lecture, I, I want to say something about what the the continuing role of uh, of common sense uh, is, um, particularly in in philosophy. Uh, I mean, I've already hinted at something by saying that that you know e even in the case of uh, the, the the natural sciences. I, I mean, if if your uh, if your ordinary uh, faculties were completely misfiring because you, know, you, ha you were having lots of hallucinations and so on, uh, you would not be in a position to, uh, to pursue uh, natural science. And we shouldn't expect you to be in a position to, uh, to pursue uh, philosophy in a productive uh, way either. Um, so, but I w w want to say something a bit more um, explicit and systematic about uh, this uh, a, a, a continuing role of common sense, and as it were, to what extent is common sense simply a starting point, as it were, a, that we maybe, if you like, in Wittgensteinian terms, a, a, a ladder that we might throw away once we've climbed up it, uh, and to what extent is it a, a constraint on the conclusion that we can come to uh, in, in philosophy. Uh, so that, as it were, I mean, you know, on a strong view, it would, the, the idea would be that uh, whenever you come to a conclusion uh, which is uh, in, inconsistent with uh, common sense, then, then there must be something wrong with that uh, conclusion. And of course, there's, I mean, there's a, a long tradition of what one might broadly uh, call common sense uh, philosophy in, in the history of the subject. I mean, you know, Aristotle and Thomas Reed and G. E. Moore and uh, and and others, in, in a way, represent a kind of uh, common sense uh, style of philosophy. Although, of course, in, in retrospect, some of their views may seem highly th theoretical and contentious. And um, and I've already um, said some things which also cast doubt on, on the idea that common sense is just automatically a, a, um, a constraint on, um, on our philosophical conclusions, because I've said that, that there are common sense beliefs which are false, uh, and I've also made common sense something which is uh, dependent on the, the social context and the, and the time, so that uh, something, that, I mean, the fact that maybe there were societies in which there's a common sense belief that slavery was morally okay certainly does not constrain us uh, to, to stick to uh, moral, moral theories that are consistent with the moral okayness of, of slavery. So in that sense, I'm, I'm not adopting a, uh, a, a very a, a st strong constraint of uh, consistency uh, with, um, with common sense. If one's, suddenly if one's talking about common sense beliefs, because they, which they can be uh, false. Um, of course, as I've said, uh, common sense knowledge is knowledge, and therefore it, it's, not, it's not going to be false. And so, of course, it's kind of trivial that, uh, that any uh, any philosophical conclusion that we come to which is inconsistent uh, with, with common sense uh, knowledge, 
because it's inconsistent with something true, is itself going to be uh, false. But that's, you might think, that well, that's not very helpful because, after, because the whole question is whether uh, common sense is providing us uh, with, uh, with knowledge. Although I, I take it that uh, it's clear that, that we get, have quite a lot of common sense uh, knowledge. But, um, but I think, I mean, th there is a very understandable uh, concern amongst many uh, philosophers that, that I if, we, if we give common sense some kind of, uh, something like a power of uh, veto over, um, over our conclusions, then, then what we're uh, effectively uh, doing is, is just constraining ourselves by our own um, prejudices. And, and this, I mean, this is an attitude which you get in somebody like Bertrand Russell, for example, who described uh, common sense as the, the metaphysics uh, of, of savages. Um, but it seems that, <laughs> on the other hand, we're going to be in some trouble if we just think that we can, as it were, dismiss uh, common, common sense. It, and it seems that actually not just in philosophy but in the natural sciences as well, there's uh, something, uh, there's, there's some kind of uh, constraint uh, there. And so, I mean, for example, uh, you know, it seems that you know, if you come to a, uh, let's say, the con a conclusion that nothing ever changes, that the, I mean, which is surely, it, that's, if you like, inconsistent with, with common, uh, common sense. It's just common sense that things, that things do change. Then something must have gone wrong. Um, and, and that isn't just something that about the way philosophy works. It would also be that if you, know, if you, if you came, if somebody proposed some scientific uh, theory, and then you, you, could, you did a calculation and you showed that the, that the only solutions of the, the equations of this theory were ones on, on which the, uh, the universe never changed at all. I mean, that would be, uh, for, on scientific grounds, a reason for dismissing uh, that sort of uh, view. Um, so, uh, I think the, the issue that we're re really dealing with here is what, what kind of evidence do we have to, to go on in uh, philosophy? What's, what's, the, uh, what's the evidence that, that our theories are supposed to be uh, consistent with? Uh, on the, the evidence maybe that they're supposed uh, to, to explain in, in some way. Um, and I, I think once, once people have, have seen that uh, common sense can be a uh, a source of uh, false beliefs as well as of uh, true ones. There's a, a, a often a, a reaction uh, to that o o along the lines, well, really this shows that w common sense shouldn't be our evidence. We shouldn't use it as, uh, as evidence because, um, because it's unreliable. And w what we need um, is some al alternative source of uh, evidence that, that can be relied on. And, um, I mean, historically, the tendency has, has been to, to look for kinds of uh, evidence which, uh, or of their nature, can't be false. Um, and... That has tended to drive people into a, a very highly subjective conception of what uh, evidence is. Uh, in particular, a picture along the lines that the, the evidence that we have to, to go on is just uh, appearances. And in fact, not simply appearances in general, but that, that at any given time, the only evidence 
that a, a given individual has are appearances to that very individual at that very time. Because, of course, you know, as soon as you start thinking, well, um, it's not just appearances to me, it should be appearances to other people, um, or, or appearances to me yesterday, then, then you're subject to all the, the kind of typ typical uh, sceptical issues about um, the, your knowledge of other minds, you know, in order to find out how things do appear to other people, and, uh, and uh, memory knowledge and so on. And for both of those, we, you know, there are all these standard uh, sceptical uh, scenarios. And so if you, what you're really looking for is a, a, a source of evidence um, such that, that you can't be mistaken about what, what is genuine evidence and, and what isn't, then um, it seems that, that you're, you're driven to your own present appearances. Um, but that's, that's not in, in any way a, a satisfactory uh, solution to this uh, problem for, for various uh, reasons. I mean, um, I mean one, one is, of course, that these, um, these appearances, um, they, they, they're gone as, as soon as uh, they've come because uh, it's only your present appearances. And, uh, and so, uh, you know, if you're, for example, you know, if you think in probabilistic terms where you're updating on, uh, on evidence as it comes in, I mean, you're, you know, when you, uh, in a probabilistic model, that would mean that you were, let's say, you were conditionalizing on this uh, evidence. Um, I mean, you, you would you'd be modifying your probability function to, um, to by giving, by condition making, looking at the, the, the new probabilities as the result of the conditional probabilities on, on the old probability distribution uh, of the of the hypothesis on this new evidence that came in, and so then you'd be that involves treating the new evidence as certain. But of course, as, as soon as uh, the you know, a moment has passed, then, then the, the evidence uh, that you were conditionalizing on is no longer certain because it's in the past and so you're relying on your memory and so there's, there's room for skepticism. But in fact, even, even with your own present appearances, um, there's, there's room for, uh, for error because, um, well, for a start, in, within philosophy, to be par part of philosophical uh, discourse, uh, we've got to 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 describe the uh, appearances. Otherwise, they, they can't be used in philosophical uh, argumentation. And uh, and there's always the the, the possibility uh, of of misdescribing how things uh, appear to you. And in fact, I mean, I've uh, I argued in knowledge and its limits that it's not just a, a problem of description, but but that in in various ways even how things subjectively appear to you in, at, at that very moment is not something that, that you're um, omniscient uh, about. Uh, so, so as we're going subjective uh, in this way, uh, does not seem like a, a promising solution to the problem of uh, evidence. And, and one thing that's very uh, notable uh, is that th that it is radically different from what happens in the natural uh, sciences, where the the kind of thing that is treated as evidence is not something like, as it were, appearances to to me now, but the kind of evidence that is. Uh, publicly available that can be scrutinized uh, by other people and uh, and so uh, you know, it, it, it's not it's not to do with you know uh, this is how right these are my current sense data it's it's something much more uh, public and uh, accessible and and I, so I take it that the the way things work in in the this science is Generally, is that that we're not we're not trying to uh, 
pursue some hopeless model on which um, we, we've got some very, very special source of evidence such that, that you cannot be mistaken about what's in your evidence base and what isn't. Um, because that just leads off on this wild goose chase. The, what we have is rather a, a recognition that we can, we can make mistakes about what evidence uh, we have. And that the, the, what we need to do is, is not somehow be so strict that mistakes become impossible, but rather to have um, things set up in such a way that, that when, when we do make mistakes, uh, we can find out um, post hoc that we've made mistakes and correct them. Right. And, and so what that requires uh, is the, the kind of evidence uh, that, that we have uh, should be accessible to, to scrutiny by other people at later times and so on. And, and, that, that, and that we have collectively an, you know, an attitude on which we're, we're willing to, to call into question the, the status of something that has been treated as evidence. Uh, but the, we call it into uh, question when some serious reason for doubt has been provided. It, it's, it, it's, it's, not, it's not that we, as it were, try to uh, establish some kind of cast iron status for it in the first place. And, and, it's not, and it's not that as soon as anybody just decides that they don't like some bit of evidence and just, you know, uh, challenges it, that, that, that automatically that disqualifies it. Uh, but, but rather that you're supposed to provide some specific reason for doubting some particular bit of uh, purported evidence, for doubting that it is part of one's uh, evidence. And uh, it seems to me that that, that is a, uh, a much uh, healthier model uh, for, uh, for how to handle uh, evidence uh, than, uh, than the, the, the one on, on which we're, we're, as we're, we're looking for some kind of standard of certainty you know, in advance as to whether something is part of one's uh, evidence. And th this, this model is, is just as uh, appropriate uh, for, uh, for philosophy as it is for the natural uh, sciences. I mean, the ev I, that's not to say that the evidence is always of exactly the same kind, but that w so that we should not be expecting in philosophy to, to have um, access to uh, evidence such that, that, w that we as long as we, we understand properly what evidence is, we're not going to make any mistakes about what, what evidence we uh, possess that we can use to measure our uh, theories against. It's just that we've got some kind of um, access to, uh, to sources of uh, evidence, which enables us to get a lot of evidence, and sometimes we will make mistakes. But we've got to be in a position then when we make mistakes to recognize the mistakes. Uh, and, well, I mean, but, uh, th these issues, in, in fact, about what, what constitutes evidence, I mean, these are quite general epistemological uh, issues. They're, they're not ones uh, which are confined to uh, philosophy. And I, th I think part of the, the trouble with a lot of uh, philosophical uh, discussion of, of our methodology has been uh, uh, treating these issues as if they were utterly specific to philosophy, when in fact they're quite general ones, and, and not even really providing um, a, a, you know, any general standard of, of evidence that we can then apply in the particular case of philosophy. Uh, I mean, you know, my own view is that um, one's evidence is simply the totality of what one knows. Uh, and I mean, that's obviously a view on which we can be 
uh, mistaken about what uh, evidence we have because we can be mistaken about what, what we know. I mean, we could think when we're making errors, we think we know things, although in fact we don't know them because they're not even true in many cases. Uh, and, but, that, but that is just the inevitable situation that we're going to be uh, in. And, um, and, it, it, and it, doesn't, it doesn't warrant any kind of general uh, skepticism. It, the, I mean, just the mere fact that we can sometimes misidentify what our e evidence is. And, uh, and it does suggest a, a fairly central role for, uh, for common sense um, evidence uh, in, in philosophy, because um, as common sense is a, uh, a natural source of, uh, of knowledge about our environment, uh, and, uh, it's, it's and so on the view that, um, that our evidence is just our knowledge, then whatever common sense knowledge uh, we have is part of our evidence base, and so can legitimately uh, be be used for, to to measure theories against. And so, we, if we have a piece of uh, of common sense uh, knowledge, and some philosophical theory is inconsistent with it, like as you know, with, let's say with the case of the of a theory that um, that nothing ever changes or or whatever, then. Uh, then it's entirely legitimate to, to use that piece of common sense uh, knowledge as evidence against the theory. In fact, it refutes the, uh, the theory. And, and that is not, not different from what goes on fundam fundamentally in other uh, sciences. And of course, it's also legitimate for somebody, if they've got a good argument for it, to uh, some good reason for doubt, to, uh, to challenge whether the, th the, the piece of common sense knowledge that we've been invoking against some philosophical uh, theory r really is knowledge. I mean, it might m and suggest that maybe uh, it's false uh, after all. Um, I might just say something about a, a particular kind of uh, skepticism about, about common sense um, in in general, as a source of, of knowledge, um, which you sometimes come across, where, where there's a sort of uh, picture that common sense ways of uh, thinking uh, have really uh, evolved to be useful rather than to be a, a source of uh, truth. Um, and and so that, that somehow the, the, the idea is that this is just it's just in general we shouldn't expect uh, common sense to give us knowledge because that's that's not really what it's uh, for. And I should uh, I should emphasize here that I, I, I think there is a, I mean there is a genuine distinction here. I'm not you know I, I'm not uh, a, I don't. I don't think there's much to be said for any kind of uh, pragmatist theory of truth, according to which if it's, if it's useful, then it's de, uh, de facto uh, true and um, in, in, you know, for that very reason. And in fact, the, I mean, the usefulness w wouldn't, I don't think would even, w w that you might think of as being uh, associated with evolution wouldn't even be the usefulness of the kind of standard that you'd require for it was something to give you a, 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 a workable theory of, uh, of truth, I mean, because it only has to be useful for uh, current uh, purposes and, and so on. So, so I'll just say so, so a, a little bit about that, that kind of general sort of skepticism. I mean, the so I, I do think that it, it, a, it is possible for a belief to be useful uh, without being true. I mean, it, it might be useful for people, for example, to, to overestimate how popular they are, right? Because, you know, I mean, there's, I think there's supposed to be some evidence that the, pe the people who are, uh, who are most uh, accurate in their 
judgments of what other people think of them are people who are clinically depressed. Um, and, and so, you know, it, it might be that, that, that for, for our general functioning, it is best that we, um, we overestimate how much people like us. Um, so, you know, that, that's a general... Uh, uh, I mean, that, you know, in principle, there are, that, that is a possibility, and, and I'm sure there are such some uh, real-life uh, examples uh, of that. Although it's it's a it's a lot harder than um, than people often think to see how how something can be um, as useful. In, in a general purpose kind of way without being true. It's not, it's not impossible, but it's, it's actually quite difficult for things to, be, uh, to have that sort of general purpose uh, usefulness uh, w without, w without truth. So that, as it were, it's, as in a lot of cases, the, the, as it were, the easiest way to design, you know, if you were designing a robot and, and you were thinking, well, <coughs> what we really want this robot to have is a whole bunch of useful beliefs about its environment. The, for most purposes, the best way of getting it to have useful beliefs about its environment would be to get it to have true beliefs about its environment. Right? I mean, the, you know, the, the, you, you, there isn't some nice way of identifying what would be a useful belief uh, with, with, independently of, of truth. So that... The, although there is this, I mean, there is this kind of gap in principle between usefulness and, and truth, uh, um, it's, it's much harder for evolution to exploit it than I think some people think. But, you know, I think an, a, a, just a kind of useful test to apply to this way of thinking it is a response to the kind of the fear that it, it's not crazy for us to have that... Um, that in some way, our, our confidence in common sense comes uh, from a, a, a kind of par parochial point of view, that, that, that we have this, perhaps, uh, perhaps if we, specifically if we're thinking about uh, the common sense uh, that is um, shared amongst uh, different societies and at uh, different times, not rather than just uh, you know, what's commonly believed in a particular society at a particular time. You, you might think, well, e even when we generalize to, you know, uh, as it were, a common sense over different human societies at different uh, times, um, aren't we still focusing on, as it were, some kind of general human point of view, which uh, might just be um, dis utterly distorted by the specific situation of our species, and uh, that, that we're, what we're not doing is kind of a stepping back from the, uh, the position of our species in the universe uh, to, to see how, um, how one-sided it's... Um, its perspective is, and uh, that, as it were, there's a kind of um, species-wide narcissism, if you like, about uh, our our own uh, cognitive uh, abilities. I think a good test of uh, that attitude is is just to to think about other species. And uh, and their cognitive faculties and what we think about them because because we, we, you know when we're thinking about non-human species uh, w there isn't the the same as it were uh, pressure towards self-deception and wishful thinking that that you might think there is in when when we we, we as a species are thinking about uh, our uh, collective uh, cognitive capacities and I, you know I take it that. Uh, that many, many uh, species of uh, animals uh, have uh, knowledge and belief. That I mean, you know, not just the higher apes, but uh, cats and dogs, and and probably quite a long way further down the uh, the evolutionary uh, scale. That, um, 
And so, for example, you know, if, if you think about predators and, and prey, I mean, well, the example I use in the book is, is because I'd just been to a conference in South Africa was um, the time I, I wrote that uh, chapter was uh, leopards and uh, impalas. Uh, I, I take it that that both of those species are f forming beliefs about their environment. I mean, the you know the leopards the leopards are, uh, eat the impalas, and so they they they, the, they have to have beliefs about where the impalas are and whether the impalas have spotted them, and the impalas have to ha have beliefs about where the leopards are and all and all these sorts of uh, things. And you know, it, if if there was this kind of huge gap between usefulness and truth, then it should be very evident to us when we think about other species that you know that oh, well i mean the leopards and the impalas they ha have all these beliefs and but you know and which are useful for them but of course the, you know they're wildly wrong but but that isn't the case at all i think the the natural thing to to say about other species is that they have a mass of knowledge of their environment and you know for for leopards and impalas it's a matter of life and death to have that knowledge Lit i mean absolutely literally i mean um and, I mean, of course, the, 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 like us, they're capable of false uh, beliefs. I mean, they, you know, they might believe that there's no leopard around, whereas, in fact, there's one lurking behind the rock very close to them. But, but it, although they're subject to, to some false beliefs, it's, it, the, the natural interpretation of them, where, as I say, uninfluenced by any kind of um, species-wide self-deception, uh, is... Uh, that that they they have lots and lots of knowledge, what, what, as were the uh, leopard or impala analog of common sense knowledge uh, about their environment, both their general environment and and about the specific goings on in at the at the time, and and so you know this idea that it, that there's something there's some kind of uh, narcissism involved in thinking of common sense as a source of knowledge is it, utterly implausible once you apply it to uh, other species. Um, so, w w w I'll just say a, a few words to uh, end with about uh, the the issue of. Uh, disagreement in philosophy, which uh, I'm th th I'll, I'll be saying a lot more uh, that bears on this question in later uh, lectures. But it's something that, that I think is already raised by the, the characterization of co philosophy as beginning with common sense knowledge and belief, where these are thought of as uh, specific to particular societies, so that uh, that when we meet somebody from a different society, d different social group, uh, that we uh, may be coming, ac coming across somebody for whom co common sense uh, has a, a, involves a different set of beliefs and perhaps beliefs that are inconsistent uh, with ours. Um, and, and so, on the one hand, you know, we, I think we can, I mean, the, a, See that disagreement is is one way in which um, is a spur to progress in philosophy because uh, it's as where it it's disagreement that that may wake us from our dogmatic slumbers and uh, and get us to improve uh, our beliefs and to correct uh, some of our errors. But of course, there is also the idea that um, disagreement is is some sort of uh, massive uh, problem uh, in philosophy because you, you can never get uh, philosophers uh, to agree on uh, anything. And um, I mean, you, you might, there's more than one way of thinking about that. I mean, you might just think, well, that's, that's evidence that, phil that philosophers haven't, haven't really learnt anything if they can't. Uh, agree, but it might also, you know, if you thought of the desirable end state as one where there's consensus about everything, then then the f disagreement by itself would mean that we that we weren't getting to that uh, end state. Um, 
So I think one, as I say, I'll, I'll have more to say about this issue in later lectures, but one point that is worth making now is that many of the disagreements in, in philosophy are in principle disagreements with, uh, which have ramifications over all of science. Right? So they're not, they're not in fact specific to philosophy at, at all. Um, so, I mean, for example, if you take the uh, philosophical views on which there are no macroscopic objects, you know, where there are just atoms in the void or, or whatever. Um, I mean, that's, that's of, often presented in as, as an example of how you know, we can't get agreement in metaphysics on even the most basic issues. But of course, I mean, the view that there are no macroscopic objects is inconsistent with theories in virtually every other science. I mean, maybe it's not inconsistent with mathematics, but it's, um, but I mean, most uh, other sciences uh, uh, take for granted the existence of macroscopic objects. And so a whole mass of their theories are false if there are no macroscopic objects. Um, and uh, of course, Philosophers worry more about this disagreement than, than people in other sciences do. Um, and uh, and th the, there are more adherents of the, of the, as if you like, the anti-commonsensical view within philosophy on such matters. I mean, there are more people who, who are willing to, to say that there, there are no macroscopic objects in philosophy. But... But the, insofar as there's a disagreement on a, que on a qu question, it's a, qu it's a question which uh, is, um, is a question just as much within the natural sciences as it is a question uh, in, um, in philosophy, in, in metaphysics, because it, it concerns um, the truth of um, many, many uh, theories put forward in the natural sciences and, of course, the social sciences uh, as well. And it, it's just that, you know, of course, that there is a tendency to say, oh, well, that, you know, if, if, as it were, if somebody were to, uh, to raise this issue in the natural sciences, uh, people might say, well, now you're doing philosophy or something like that. But, uh, and, and so it, the issue isn't uh, taken, uh, taken seriously. Um, it's, it, as it were, it's, it's passed off uh, somewhere else. But it, you know, it's not as though theories in other areas are immune to the types of scepticism that are raised about philosophical theories. It's just that people are less interested in those types uh, of, of scepticism. Right. So th this is... This is the phenomenon of disagreement in philosophy, it, it, it's been misidentified, it's misdescribed if, uh, you know, if you think it, that it's something to do with the nature of philosophical uh, questions. W what it's, what it's uh, to do with is the, the tolerance of uh, philosophy for uh, asking certain kinds of very fundamental question which sort of, uh, if you take them seriously, prevent you from getting on with the bread and butter work which is being done in other sciences. So um, it, th these, these are kinds of disagreement which, as I say, are entertained more fully in philosophy but do not uh, have to do with the, the nature of uh, philosophical uh, questions. So that's a, a yet another way in which uh, philosophy is nothing like as exceptional as philosophers like to think. Okay, I'll stop there and we can have some discussion. <laughs> Yeah, thanks. Uh, 
So I was wondering to what extent does so if you take common sense to do evidence of philosophy, uh, to what extent does the evidence have to be so independent from the philosophical activity itself? So I guess when it comes to I don't know epistemology, you can kind of like ask how you feel about knowledge attributions and so on and so on. But when it comes to issues like slavery or justice, I think you can make a pretty plausible case that many of our beliefs about slavery are actually philosophical beliefs. So they perhaps they go back to the French Revolution, Enlightenment, and so on. And if we rely then do more philosophy on those beliefs, so would philosophy become somehow self-supporting in some sense? Is that a problem? Does evidence have to be independent from I don't think there's any requirement of independence. Uh, so that, uh, and after all, if you think about the, let's say, <laughs> physics, the a lot of the evidence that physicists are relying on itself comes from using um, elaborate uh, measurement instruments, so I mean, you know, microscopes and telescopes and much more sophisticated things than that, uh, and. Uh, and you can't ex extract the evidence that you want from um, such things without having a physical theory of the um, of how these instruments work and so on. So that um, I mean, the, you know, the idea that, that a, a discipline has to use has to be confined to evidence which has been gathered from outside the discipline. I, th I think it's it's uh, it's, it's not. It's not a workable one, um, and um, and so you know. I, so I don't think there's anything wrong in principle with you know philosophy contributing to uh, a, a more enlightened uh, attitude to, towards slavery, where it becomes co you know just common sense knowledge that slavery is is wrong, which I think it actually is in our society, and um, and. Uh, and then, and that's something that then f philosophical theories can themselves be be tested by. And so, you know, I I if um, you know, if, if we, if somebody put forward some moral theory, and then we, w when we worked out its consequences, so we saw what that one of its consequences was that slavery is morally okay. I would think, you know, we'd be we absolutely fine to reject the theory on that on that basis, even though uh, philosophy has played a role in. In uh, us acquiring the, the common sense knowledge on the basis of which we're rejecting it, and you know, of course, um, you know, as it were, you can still have you know conspiracy theory type doubts about whether this or this is all legitimate, and you know, and and it is possible for things to go wrong when when this when that happens. I mean, so that and um, you know. The, I mean, maybe, maybe you know, in, let's say in the case of introspectionist psychology, that things went wrong because it, it, the introspectionist theories were playing a large role in the gathering of evidence, and then it kind of eventually turned out that this was these were mainly just artifacts of the the theories and didn't really show anything very much about about people's um, mental mental states. But but. Well, of course, that's an, ex an example from psychology, not from philosophy. The, uh, so that you know, the fact that theory plays a role in the gathering and interpretation of, of e evidence, to, you know, it, it, it makes us in principle vulnerable. But ju th that's just the kind of risk that we have to take in an inquiry. And, and the, main, the main thing is that, uh, to be you know, alert enough so that w once we start getting a lot of warning signs that something like that has been going on, that, that, we're, you know, that we're ready to have a, uh, another look. But, but, but I mean, you can't, but what we shouldn't try to do is just to, as it were, look, get, get guarantees in advance that nothing like that can ever happen to us. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, th I think th that, um, I mean, you know, com common sense isn't something that, as, as we're pure, it, it's, I mean, you know, some of it may come from things that are basically just hired, hardwired into, you know, any normal human being or something, but, but, I, but the way I've been defining it, it, it includes much, much more than that. 
I mean, you know, it's like it's, you know, it's, it's a piece of, I mean, well, I mean, I think, you know, it's, it's kind of common sense that, that water contains a lot of H, H2O or something like, like that. And that we've, that, that's been, of course, that's based on some scientific thing. It's not, it's not something that's hardwired into us. And uh, I think that's fine. And I think it's, it's fine that, in principle, that philosophy should contribute as w in the same sort of way. Okay, you said a lot about, you talked a lot about what makes philosophy similar to other sciences. I wonder if you could spend a few minutes talking about what you think makes it distinctive, and if, whether there's any interesting epistemological issues about uh, how philosophy is distinctive. So, I think it's actually quite hard to generalize about philosophy because. Um, you know, if you if you look at, for example, philosophy of physics, a lot of a lot of what philosophers of physics do is basically theoretical physics. I mean, it's, it is philosophy as well, but it's but it is, uh, and the and and you know, m many of them are people who can move between physics departments and philosophy departments, and you know, and philosophers of biology are um, are doing. Um, things which, in, ma in many cases, are equally well classifiable as highly theoretical biology, and um, so you know. And then you know, if you if you take people who are doing philosophy in a very historical way, of course, a lot of what, what they're doing is uh, extremely similar to what historians have to do. Um, you know, I, I think that you know, if, if we want a few kind of just generic de generalizations, I mean, I, th I think it's clear that that philosophy is is a highly theoretical discipline, and uh, and particularly, I mean, some of the the most theoretical parts of it are the um, anti. -the Theory diatribes, which are themselves based on a whole mass of, of metaphilosophical theory. Um, uh, it's uh, it's a uh, it, it doesn't do much in the uh, in the way of um, experimentation. Uh, I mean, of course, we've got X phi, and I you know I, I, I want to allow that X phi is, is a part of philosophy. I don't, you know, I don't um, but but it's certainly hi historically it's true. That that philosophers have mainly n not done experiments, although you know, I mean, Hume regarded himself as doing experiments, but but, but by current standards, we, you know, we don't we we're, we're not an experimental discipline. I mean, sometimes I think that that the the divide between experimental and theoretical branches of Natural science is greater than the divide between theoretical natural science and and philosophy. You know, I th I think that w that we do we do b we certainly do do a lot of uh, if you like armchair argumentation and uh, and formal methods uh, play a less central role in philosophy than they do in mathematics. Uh, or, although, uh, well, I have some things to say actually about mathematics at various points. Uh, uh, although, again, I don't think the the contrast is so great. So that, you know, I think that one can, you know, say, say some very very broad brush things about philosophy that, are, are, you know, of that general general kind. Um, but but I, you know, I don't I don't think that that one can give. You know, I wouldn't want to try to give a, a methodological definition of philosophy or, or anything like that. I, you know, I, th I mean, after all, um, the, the division of um, you know uh, intellectual life into different d disciplines. You know, it, I mean, it, it is to some extent a matter of you know in just accidents of institutional history and I, I mean I guess here we're in a department of philosophy and semiotics is that right an institute yes so you know that's which uh, um, and 
you know, and then you ha and th there's sort of history and philosophy of science, you know, which has acquired a certain identity of its of its own. So, you know, I, I, I think one can can make this this kind of very crude, you know, rule of thumb generalizations like that. But I, I doubt that that you know, one can do very much more than than that. Um, when laying out your view of, uh, of common sense and its role in philosophical thinking, um, then there were certain e expressions you used at certain key points which sound like expressions or appeals to common sense. So you said things like, you spoke about what was unhealthy. Yes. Thinking, you spoke about what was plausible. And you spoke about what was the natural thing to say. Yes. Um, and I'm wondering, I'm, I'm wondering how to think about like a justification of a... Uh, of of a certain view about the role of common sense within philosophical thinking, which itself appeals to common sense in the process. Like, so one view to take would be that that's problematically circular. I take it that's not your view. Yeah. And so I'm wondering what your view is about that. Yeah, so of course, s some of those comments were, were ones which I, I made very early, early on in the lecture, you know, e.g. In, in talking <laughs> Uh, about w uh, what the healthy and <laughs> natural attitude is, and, and where um, where you the primary interest is in X, and then and then the um, sort of secondary um, interest is in you know it, something that might be called the concept of X or something like like that, and and of course uh, there's uh, there's. Uh, uh, What's at the back of that is uh, is is part. I mean, it's not just common sense. It's also a, a, as were well a, a whole lot of externalist baggage about um, the right way to uh, understand meaning and thought and so on. And and so uh, th those those were very theory laden claims. And in fact, but but where I haven't actually. <laughs> Since it was right, it was right at the beginning. I hadn't had you know time to say much about the the theory that that they're that they're laden uh, with, um, but but just on the more general issue that you you raise about uh, circularity, I mean, I mean this is very closely connected with I issues about certain kinds of sceptical arguments, right? Because um, you know so. I mean, suppose that we raise these issues just about human cognitive faculties, right? And then, you know, and then I was, um, I mean, any kind of judgment that we make about the, let's say, the, the potential of, of human cognitive faculties is itself going to be based using human cognitive faculties. And, you know, and so somebody, somebody who thinks that that that's circular is in effect demanding a justification for reliance on human cognitive faculties that doesn't itself use any human cognitive faculties and you know that's that's clearly not something that we can do i mean it's just it's it's setting a standard that we can't possibly meet and it's you know it's like um you know an extreme uh, skeptic who you know who demands uh, you know why sh why should we um, why should we pay any attention to uh, to rational argument and then if somebody tries to give them a rational argument for uh, for paying attention to rational argument they say ha ha you're begging the question you're using a rational argument and <laughs> and um, you know and so the, there are various there are various kinds of uh, skeptical you know. Argument, which just which depend on on setting a bar that we can tell in advance that we can't meet, and um, and there's no there's no special reason for thinking that um, that something is knowledge only if it if it can meet that kind of requirement. I mean, I think I mean you know the thing is there's I, I mean there, there's a serious issue. Uh, here, because um, there are various kinds of self-criticism which uh, are legitimate w w 
when they're done lo when done locally. I mean, so that you know, it, it's it's often it's often quite a good thing to do, to as it were to put a f you know some little cluster of one's beliefs on hold and then to th and to step back from them and to think you know uh, uh, independently of those. Do I really have any any reason for uh, for believing any of this stuff? And you know, and I think for example, somebody might. Um, might rationally give up their religious beliefs on, on, a, on the basis of a thought process like that. To, um, you know, one could give maybe less contentious examples as well. Um, and, and so that you know, the, the ki this kind of putting on hold and then stepping back and critically appraising from, you know, uh, from an independent point of view, it, it's, it, it's a good thing when done in moderation. But but it, you know if you try if you try to put too much of your uh, cognitive system you know in question at the same time then th then this method is hopeless because it, because you're left with too little to to be a good basis for uh, appraising the stuff that you've put on hold and 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 the, the trouble is that the, it, there isn't some kind of n easily identifiable. Uh, dividing line between the cases where it's, you know, it's local enough to be a good exercise and where in the cases where it's too global to, to be a sensible thing to do. I mean, we've, you know, to some extent, I think it, in doing philosophy, we've, you know, in the development, in the history of philosophy, we had to kind of develop a better sense for, for when things are getting out of hand and when they're not. And, you know, and, and I think that, that, that one, one thing that we've learned to do is, you know, to, to identify where somebody's basically using a, gene form, a, a generic style of sceptical argument, but you know, applied to a particular case. And, um, you know, and so, we, we, actually, we, we just have to rely on you know, this a kind of sense of, of moderation, and, and, uh, about, uh, which, of course, is further reliance on our own cognitive capacities, about, about what, what, what level of as it were, critical distance on our own beliefs is optimal. <laughs> you, yeah, thanks. Uh, my question uh, was in fact similar to the one gentleman asked, but uh, I'll ask it anyway. Uh, since you claim that uh, philosophy is science, among other sciences, then how would you describe its uh, object? Or how would you define its uh, object domain? Because as I gathered from your, from your answer, it turned out that philosophy is a kind of parasitic on other sciences. Yeah. You then say that... Uh, that well, no, I, I wouldn't say parasitic on other sciences, but... Well, it preys on them in the sense that uh, it takes their legitimate objects and does something Yes, but I mean, the, but equally, they're taking our legitimate objects and doing something of their own. I mean, it's not. It, what is this subject? Well, so you know, I I don't think there's any unified answer to that that question um, because I mean, you know, even if you ask, what, well, what's what's the subject matter of physics? You know, what's, I mean, when people have tried, you know, when people have been interested in defining physicalism, the, you know, and that's, so they've, they wanted to, to define, you know, what, what is physical, what, you know, and they've had notorious trouble in doing that. Um, and, uh, you know, and they've tend, and very often they've tended to say, well, the, the, the physical is just whatever, a completed physics <laughs> would would talk about or something like that, and you know, and so I, d I don't think this is just something particularly problematic about philosophy. I think that um, that you have so you know uh, you you have these um, kinds of discipline which are, are actually somewhat heterogeneous. I mean, so, I mean, another example, of course, quite closely related to philosophy, is logic. I, I, you know, I think people have tried to give unitary answers to the question, what's the subject matter of logic, you know, validity or something. But if you actually look at logic as an ongoing practice, 
It's, it's extremely heterogeneous, you know, the set theory, recursive function theory, you know, the model theory, proof theory, and so on. And, and there, 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 isn't mu there isn't very much that you can say ab about, you know, what the unitary subject matter of, um, of logic is. And I, th I think it's similar with philosophy, that, that you know, we, of course, we've got, you know, a whole bunch of traditional philosophical questions, and we're playing, you know, associated with different branches of philosophy and, and we're playing variations on those uh, themes and, uh, and we've, we've also got uh, you know, a bunch of you know, ways of dealing with questions which you know, we're, we're better at than other people are and, you know, and so uh, questions you know, are, are kind of legitimately handled by philosophy when the kinds of methods that we have available are quite good at dealing with, with them, but it's often not obvious in advance which those are going to be. And so you know, I, I don't, you know, we're asking a whole bunch of pretty theoretical, abstract, Questions w which you know are, are not are not ones that are can be dealt with just by ordinary mathematics, and, and they're not ones which can be you know dealt with by ordinary physics and and so on. But you know, I don't I don't think I don't think that we need to have more unity than that. Or or and I, you know, and I think um, it, you know, even if you ask what you know what what's the subject matter of history or something. I mean, you know, you can. You can say, well, it's, you can say something, well, it's, yes, but I mean, it most, but lots of aspects of the past are not to do with history. And, you know, you can say it's the, the human past, but there are all sorts of things which, you know, have to do with the human past that historians wouldn't, wouldn't deal with, you know, about the, you know, um, <laughs> you know, what, what exact you know, changes in the human anatomy or something. And, uh, you know, and so, and so it, you know, I, d I don't think that one, that it's a, a constraint on a successful discipline, that there is some clear answer to the question, what's it about? As, you know, as, I mean, of course, there have to be, you know, people have to be asking questions, and the, you know, the, there have to be relatively clear questions, you know, in order to make progress, you know, on, on those. But, but the, the questions don't all have to be unified by all, all being about, you know, it's some well demarcated subject matter. Uh, coming back to this uh, broad sense of common, uh, of common sense and structure, why well, like the distinction between common sense and intuition, if there's any such distinction within this common sense, of, uh, this broad sense of common sense? What do you mean by intuition? <laughs> uh, if we, like, when we have, like, intuitions about, um, like, metaphysical intuitions or moral intuitions or how are they? Are they actually common sense, or can we just like? Well, can you? Uh, them common sense? So, I mean, I reacted like that because uh, I, I, I don't think that the the category of uh, intuition is clearly enough defined to be useful, um, and I, I think that a, a lot of damage has been done by by philosophers. Um, <laughs> treating it um, as, well, partly the, the, the general category of intuition and partly the category of philosophical intuition, uh, p treating these as if we, we knew what we were uh, talking about. I mean, you know, if, if by metaphysical intuition you just mean a, um, that's something like a judgment that, that a particular philosopher is inclined to make about metaphysics, with maybe without having any developed argument for it, um, then who knows where that comes from? I mean, it could come from any. I mean, it could, it, you know, it could be, it could be a matter of common sense. I mean, if you know, if uh, I mean, for example, the the judgment that there are mountains, you know, which which involve entails the uh, the existence of macroscopic uh, objects. That's kind of uh, relevant in some metaphysical disputes, but, but it's also, but I mean, it's, it's not exactly an, I mean, you can call it an intuition if you like, I mean, it's, uh, uh, but it, it's, 
it's a, just a, a judgment of a well-known geographical fact. And, um, and, then, and then other people's, you know, they might call something an intuition which is, let's say, based on religious belief or, or based on, um, you know, some kind of perverse caprice of the... the Logic and mathematics are well. I'll I'll, I'll be talking about more about them uh, in, I guess, uh, tomorrow. But um, but I, I, I don't think I don't think that the the category of um, I intuition is particularly useful in the epistemology of logic and and mathematics. I mean the. I mean, when ma I mean, mathematicians do sometimes talk about I intuition, and, and uh, but what they mean there is something more like um, a you know a hunch about how sh how things should be. You know, so it's a, it's a, something like a kind of educated guess or something like that. And and they might you know they might talk about geometrical intuition, which you know would involve a certain kind of of uh, picture thinking and and so on. But um, and it, but also, you know, I, th I think the, the, as well as the category of intuition being, I mean, you know, the, the main problem with the attempts to define intuition is, is that uh, the that generally w w what what you get is something so inclusive that you know it includes. Um, you, you know, a, a vast proportion of all human judgments. Um, Without, I don't think, I, I think the, uh, uh, in present metaphilosophical discussion, the category of intuition is doing far more harm than good. So we have about five minutes and four questions. So let's be short. Sure. Francesca. Yeah. Um, thank you. Um, how would you describe the, what we might call the, the, the uh, reason giving fact or reason giving consideration that we appeal to when we appeal to common sense? knowledge as a, as a source of evidence. Would you describe it as something like common sense knows P to be true or common sense knows P to be false? Well, so w w one has to be very careful to distinguish the fact that is part of one's evidence from the fact that it is part of one's evidence. Right. So let, let, so suppose, for example, let's take uh, the, since I mentioned before the, the, the case of the um, common sense knowledge that there are mountains. Then, in the first, the first thing that goes into the evidence base is just the fact that there are mountains. That that, that if you like, the true proposition that, that there are mountains. Um, of course, it, it's part of our evidence because we know it, and the way that we know it, if, you know, is, is a kind of commonsensical way, and. Uh, but that's that's just a, a comment on how it gets to be part of our evidence. It's not a comment on the nature of the thing. Or, or, or it's not a comment on the the content of of the evidence itself. Of course, we might it might also be that we that we know that it is a that that it is a piece of common sense knowledge that there are mountains. And then, if we know that that then the fact that it's a piece of common sense knowledge that there are mountains, that could also go into our, our evidence as well. But, but that's, a, that's a secondary, as it were, you know, if you like, more uh, reflective uh, thing. And, and what, would be, what would be doing the work in, um, in metaphysical disputes might just be the, f the fact that there are mountains. Right? I mean, that's, that's what metaphysical theories, some metaphysical theories would be inconsistent with. Somebody challenged that, so like, how do you know that there are mountains, or give me a reason why I should believe that there are mountains, and then one would answer, well, it's common sense knowledge that there are. Yeah, I mean, in yeah, in yes, yeah, in many places where I've given talks, I could say, look out of the window, but <laughs> but it wouldn't uh, that wouldn't work and here. And sorry. the thing about look out of the window is that actually we are not using common sense anymore, but then we're using the senses. Yeah, but I'm taking the, but I'm taking it that. The, the using the, the, the senses are, I mean, that's, that, that is a common sense way of knowing. And so that, that, that uh, we're just, uh, as it were, <laughs> so it's, it's all part of that, that common sense, uh, if you like, uh, relation to the, the world. I mean, of course, 
uh, somebody, uh, somebody can, um, they can raise those questions. Just, you know, just as, you know, they, they could raise those questions when a, with a physicist. I mean, you know, if, if, I mean, supposing the physicist is doing an experiment and, you know, the, and the, the, it says on the dial 10.71, and then, you know, you could say, oh, how do you know that it says 10.71? <laughs> Uh, but I mean, it's it's not that it's not that that you, you, you know what, what it's not that just a mere the, the question how do you know it, it, th that until that question has been answered then the original claim is is on hold because because otherwise you know a skeptic can bring everything to a halt very very easily so, so that you know if if they want to i mean of course you know if if they can produce good reasons for doubt then then you know we can we can discuss that, those reasons but but i mean they they but just you know kind of generic challenge how do you know is you know can't be allowed to to disqualify something as part of one's evidence my question is a bit personal so you have said that to take common sense to be the start of philosophy. I guess that's the personal reflection of, of, uh, on your personal life, just how you started doing philosophy. You have said that uh, people don't have the, this ordinary mode of cognition, cannot do philosophy in a productive way. I guess what you mean is that you cannot do that in a knowledge maximizing way, the knowledge to understand knowledge about the world. So the problem is that I don't have this ordinary mode of condition. I lost that very, very early. I don't, I don't think you did. <laughs> I, I mean, you, you've obviously heard my lecture. Yeah. So you, were, you, you, I mean, you have some knowledge of what I said. So that's, I mean, that, that's just using co your common sense per perceptual and uh, communicative <laughs> faculties. But. Well, I mean, you know some people who in their childhood have some sad and violent issues and they are doing maybe some defensive mechanism, split their personality, put their first hand experience into a third person spectator. So instead of I am experiencing it turns to be I see that I see this person is experiencing pain. So that kind of condition is what I have and I really cannot go back to the ordinary way of condition. But at the same time, I'm really, I have those philosophical questions that you are into. Do you think I can do philosophy not perhaps as a form of science, but more as a form of art to maximize my belief, to understand myself? Do you think this kind of philosophy is worth doing? I, nothing that you have said convinces me that um, that you've lost most of your common sense ways of acquiring knowledge. Um, I mean, I, I'm I'm not suggesting that the that your early experiences m m had no effect on you or anything like like that. But um, I, the 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 kind of basic ways of acquiring knowledge, you know, which I was, I mean, you know, I listed like perce perception, memory. Um, Thought, imagination, com communication. I mean, you, you have you have all of those. So that you know, I I, I, I don't I don't really see, hear from what you're saying anything that would disqualify you from participating absolutely fully in philosophy. I mean, you might not want to, but but I don't I don't th I don't think that, n n you've not convinced me that anything has happened to you that that would that would. Uh, disqualify you f from just being, a, you know, a regular participant. Uh, I mean, we're all different from each other. <laughs> but we have over time, actually. Maybe we can do it later. Okay. Okay. Rin, you have a question? Yeah. So, I'm wondering, is the view you're presenting here rather a description of what the philosophers actually are doing or what they should be doing? And assuming that it's the first, then let's suppose that a group of a significantly big group of philosophers comes to you and says, look, that's not what you're doing, how would you respond to them? Would you say that, no, actually, they're not really clear about what you're actually doing, which seems to have been your reply to this person? Or would you say that you're not doing philosophy, or are you just assuming that no such group of philosophers really exists, which seems to imply that you take your view to be 
sort of self-evident or common sense? No, I, 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 I mean, I do, you know, I don't, I don't think that the view that I'm defending is, is self-evident and, you know, and I don't, I don't really think that, that there's a, a common sense view of what philosophy is because, after, you know, philosophy is th this rather recherche thing in our society where, you know, most people have very little idea what philosophy uh, I mean, is yeah no but I but I I mean I understand that, that, that I mean part of the, your question is to what extent is this meant to be descriptive and to what extent is it meant to be normative and so I think the answer is it's a bit of both because um, you know I, I I was for example I was saying that I you know I didn't I didn't think that um, the inquiry into meanings of words or concepts was was central to philosophy but of course it, it's true that in the 20th century um, a, a lot of people um, took themselves to be doing that and to some extent they were doing that I mean you know I mean the, 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 so that uh, I mean that that wasn't just you know some kind of metaphilosophical belief which had no relation to their practice it definitely did inform their practice in some way and and so I'm um, you know, I am to some extent making um, making claims about um, what what philosophy should be. Although I think they they're, they're also ones which uh, which correspond not badly with with the way with an awful lot of philosophical practice, but. Um, and um, you know, and I. So you know, I think it's. I mean, it's 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 impossible for people to do philosophy without using normal human cognitive capacities because those are basically those are the only ones we've got. Um, but it's certainly possible for people to do it in a way which is um, a lot less. Uh, Constrained by common sense knowledge than um, than some practices of doing philosophy, um, and and so there's there's an implicit criticism of uh, of that of such ways of doing philosophy. And what I'm saying, which is is that um, the people are basically uh, ignoring a lot of the evidence that they have available to them. So I was thinking if we take common sense as a source of uh, producing knowledge and also uh, furthermore uh, uh, attribute that, that kind of knowledge to other creatures such as animals and so on. So does it, uh, are, aren't we justified to, to take seriously different kind of possible uh, forms of uh, common sense and cognitive system that might be, might be in, in contradiction to ours, and then, then if if um, if we are taking common sense as a source of knowledge, and knowledge is a factive thing, it's going to be like a contradictory result and kind of self-refuting for for the idea that common sense uh, is knowledge producing. Well, I mean, there won't be any inconsistency because you know, I, I've I've got a category of common sense belief as well as a so that I, I mean, obviously. If, if it were the case that the common sense beliefs of one species were inconsistent with the common sense beliefs of another species, then it would follow that, that uh, some, of, some of those beliefs on the part of one species or both did not constitute knowledge. Um, but, uh, you know, I don't, I, I don't see um, that, this, that this is such a, a worrying issue. I mean, because... I mean, you know, we, we know that um, that many species use forms of cognition which are different from from ours. I mean, you know, the bats using you know, sonar or whatever. Um, but um, but but the fact that they're using different methods for, for example, finding out where things are in their environment. That, do, that doesn't suggest that there's any inconsistency between their beliefs and ours. Yeah, right. yeah but, but uh, then, then the question is, uh, how do we know that wh whose, belief is, whose belief corresponds to reality as it is? I mean, yeah, but, if, but I mean, if, if, if the bat... 
I mean, why shouldn't they both correspond? I mean, you know, if, if bats have beliefs about where things are in their environment and we have beliefs about where those things are, I mean, why shouldn't we both be right? I mean, uh, yeah, it can be, but, but, but it, 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 it does have some, some uh, consequences. For example, in, in uh, like in, uh, the problem of composition, like material composition. So we, if, if, we, if we take commonsensical um, view uh, that, that uh, what we select, the chairs exist, the, the laptop exists, but the, like, the fusion of chair and laptop doesn't exist. But let's say some, uh, some possible form of cognition uh, uh, posits this, this fusion that exists and they, they perceive it in a way that we don't, then, then it's like a matter of different ontology. And uh, if we take that seriously too, then it's going to be like, I'm not saying that it's the bad yes. thing, but it's going to be like uh, some, some significant result which co contradicts the commonsensical view because some form of universalism would be entailed. <coughs> right? Yeah, so there's a difference between common sense not thinking that there is such a, a fusion and common sense thinking that there is not such a fusion. And um, it's, it, it's not so obvious that it's, uh, it's part of common sense to, to think that there, that there isn't such a conglomerate, you know. And, um, and, it, you know, and, and think it, it becomes a bit difficult actually to, uh, you know, to determine exactly what is part of common sense in those cases because, um, you know, even if you ask people, well, is there such a thing as, you know, the, the the desk plus the the table or, or whatever it whatever it or some more extravagant um, combination th than that. I mean, of course, the the ordinary word thing is is not you know a com just a completely um, trivial placeholder. It you know it, it it has. I mean, there is a conception of what a thing is, which is quite full bloodied and uh, and so if people deny that there's such a thing, that doesn't mean. That, that, that they think that in you know, quantifying over everything whatso whatsoever that there's no such uh, uh, fusion. And um, you know, so, so I think one's actually there with those kind of examples. I mean, that you're, you're, one's getting, I mean, it's, one's getting to the edge of, um, of what's uh, of common sense. In fact, it, you know, it's, it's hardly a piece of human common sense. That, well, so I guess you were thinking of the, some other species which kind of lumps the, these, these things uh, t together. And, um, you know, and uh, we might well, you know, e even if it could be argued that, 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 that our common sense didn't recognize that there was such a thing, and, but then we, we saw that, the, that uh, some other species was uh, re reacting to it in some somewhat similar ways to the ways that we re re react. I mean, th th then it, it, that seems like a good case for just thinking. Well, there's, there's, there is more stuff than we, we recognize. You know, and in the same way that um, you know, I mean, if 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 none of us, you know, were sighted, and then we came, you know, we came across somebody who was sighted and who could, and who could, can, you know, show us, demonstrate to us that that the sight really was a, a, a faculty of perception and not just some scam that they were inventing. Th then I think at that stage we would just take their word for it and think, well, there's a whole lot of stuff that we didn't know about, and you know, I mean, I mean, and. It, it might it might just be that some of that would be you know a kind of revision of common sense you know if if, the, if our negative views were you know if we were were widely enough um, spread about but but I mean that that doesn't seem like you know as it were a, a very central threat to, to common sense I mean because the, it seems like the you know our commitments to things what what there is are. Um, you know, are, are, are stronger than than those kind of you know commitments to the, the not being these sort of oddball uh, entities. Well, thanks for the discussion. <laughs> okay. Um, thanks. So uh, this afternoon, I'm going to be. To be talking about the the idea that uh, philosophy has something specially to do with concepts, uh, that it's 
role is something like that of uh, clarifying concepts or perhaps uh, in a more ambitious and constructive way, uh, conceptual engineering, to use a, a phrase that's uh, become fashionable in the last few years. Um, and uh, as I indicated this morning, I'm generally completely skeptical uh, about uh, this this view, but I think it's it's sufficiently prevalent and interesting that it, it deserves a fair bit of discussion uh, in its own right. And I, I mean, one very broad thing to uh, to say uh, is that I think this it, it, kind of view of philosophy and and a whole bunch of related views which in, in the 20th century got uh, called you know, the linguistic turn, but which you know, go, goes back to um, figures like, for example, David Hume and so on. Is, uh, a, a lot of it has to do with a, a kind of um, reaction to the, uh, the scientific uh, revolution and uh, an attempt to find uh, something that philosophy uh, could do uh, by it, its characteristic uh, methods, as it were, some kind of something, anything that philosophy was uh, good for. Um, in my view, it's a massive overreaction to the, the methodological challenge uh, posed by the development of modern science. But anyway, let's, let's discuss it uh, in its own uh, right. Um, one thing that I'm going to do, at least to, to begin with, um, is, is to substitute uh, talking about um, words r rather than concepts. Uh, because I, I think it's a lot clearer what words are than what uh, concepts are. Um, and in, in particular, there's an enormous problem about uh, how concepts are supposed to be uh, individuated. Uh, in other words, um, about uh, w what it takes for two words to express the same concept, or perhaps uh, a word as used by one person at a, at, in one context to express the same concept as a word used by a possibly different person in a possibly different uh, context. Uh, and uh, it's, it's very, very unclear w exactly what is required for that. And so, in fact, if ever there were a concept in need of clarification, it's the concept of a concept. Um, but, but I think oh, I, I'll return to the, that, that issue later. But I, I, quite a lot of the, um, the th activities associated with conceptual clarification and uh, conceptual engineering can be understood simply as issues ab about words rather than issues about con concepts. And, uh, and then we have a better idea of w what we're uh, talking about. So I mean, th the first thing to concede and, and in fact, you know, to enthusiastically adore, endorse is that uh, th there is a perfectly genuine role for clarification uh, of of terms, uh, for for removing ambiguities, uh, for for ma making terms more precise, and uh, for uh, introducing new terms to make new distinctions. Um, 
So, for example, you know, if we uh, if we started off doing logic and uh, and the the, uh, the only uh, terminology we had for evaluating arguments was uh, that we could uh, distinguish between sometimes between crap arguments and non-crap arguments. Um, that would that would not really be a, an adequate basis for doing logic on. So it, it, we, we would, we'd need to get more precise about uh, what we thought was, what the different ways in which arguments can be bad. I mean, for example, false premises versus invalidity and, and so on. Um, and um, you know, just to give another example in, in, in philosophy of science, uh, we, you know, at some stage uh, it, it became, I mean, maybe some people were talking about this before, but at least with, with Lakatos, you know, he uh, started talking about research programs and the idea of a research program seemed like, you know, that's a, 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 a step forward in kind of understanding how, how science uh, develops a, a, a new way of organizing the uh, the material. So, um, so the I idea that that we that sometimes uh, we need to clarify our, our terms in some way um, or to introduce uh, new terms. Um, it, I mean that I, that is, is uh, beyond uh, question. Um, and you know, uh, uh, many branches of, of philosophy, like elsewhere, um, would would be impossible in practice without the development of new and clearer terminology. So, so th th that's there is. A, some such activity is, you know, is, is not, that's not really uh, in, in question. But, of course, that kind of activity of disambiguation and clarification and introduction of new terms, that's something that goes on uh, in, in pretty much all serious forms of uh, inquiry. Uh, and you know, e e even in much more practical uh, spheres, so that you know, it, it, if we're talking about the law, for example, the, um, I mean, laws need to be formulated in relatively uh, clear terms, and sometimes they, laws need to make new disti <laughs> distinctions and and so on. And and so that's I mean, that some kind of related activity uh, is you know, familiar from. Uh, Lawmakers and um, in you know in science we may need to distinguish between different senses of the term mass or uh, you know if, if when historians are are discussing feudalism uh, they're probably going to need to distinguish uh, different senses of feudalism uh, and give a m more uh, precise definition of the. Uh, of the term, so that the mere fact that philosophers sometimes go in for the uh, clarification, disambiguation of terms, introduction of new terms for new distinctions. I mean, that's that's not, nothing very special about philosophy. I mean, it might be that that we do a bit more of that in philosophy uh, than elsewhere, but so far we haven't got a distinction uh, of kind between philosophy and anything else. I think w what's really uh, distinctive is is the idea that uh, philosophy is, roughly speaking, solely concerned with concepts. That, uh, and in, in particular, that, that that these activities of clarification and um, introduction of new concepts or new terms, as I mean, that that these are as it were central to what we do, as opposed to being just some kind of prelim preliminary to getting on with our uh, main task. I mean, that, if that were the case, uh, then, then that, would, um, that would really make uh, philosophy uh, different 
uh, from, from other disciplines for, for which these kinds of clarifications are always preliminaries to, as we're doing something with the terms once they've been clarified. And, and some people have sometimes thought that, that the, the, jo as we're, the job of philosophy was to go around clarifying our terms or, or maybe building uh, new, new ones. Um, so I want to say something ab about that idea. And in particular, um, one question to be clear about is whose terms are we clarifying? Or for whom are we introducing these new terms? Um, and I mean, roughly speaking, we, we could say, well, I, either that's uh, we're, we're what we're concerned with is uh, terms uh, as used in philosophy or, or terms as used outside uh, philosophy. Um, and if, if we're concerned with terms as used outside philosophy, then uh, th that could be either terms as used in um, other branches of uh, inquiry, for example, you know, the idea that, that our job is to, to polish up the, uh, the terms and, uh, to the point where they can be handed over to the scientists to, to use. Like, you know, if we... Are, or, or, our job was, you know, just clean, cleaning the surgical instruments, and then we give them to the doctor or something like that. Uh, or, or, but it could also be that uh, that that we're supposed to be doing this uh, for um, the purposes of public life, as it were, the, the kind of terms that um, you know might be might be used in political debate or something like uh, that. Um, so, if we if we think of it that way, um, it, it actually seems rather sad because it, it's not clear how much notice is being taken of all this clarification that, that philosophers are supposed to be busily uh, doing. I mean, and you know, it, as it were, it's not as though that you know the f physicists are impatiently waiting for us to get concepts or terms you know into full working order and then we'll hand them over to them and then they can use them i mean they, they you know they they're getting on with it themselves and um in fact this is what we would uh, expect because i mean after all it's the uh, the practitioners of you know, any in intellectual discipline who are going to be the ones who are uh, who understand most about um, which which terms are problematic and what the problems are? Because you know, it, it, I think it's fairly generally a, a agreed that we can't expect you know to achieve some ideal of perfect uh, precision w in almost any uh, area. So that as a way, you can't just uh, work away on clarifying with without. Um, some particular problems that you're you're aiming to uh, to solve. Uh, I, I mean, it's, it, what, what what we want are terms that, are, as it were, are clear enough so that they can be used for the purposes of you know whichever community is uh, these terms uh, belong to. And um, you know, if if we were talking about a term in physics, I mean, it's the physicists who are going to be the ones who know what, what needs to be done. Uh, and if it's a term in history, it will be the historians who know that what needs to be done. So that, as we're, we're, we're the danger is that we're just going to be uh, kind of uh, officiously uh, working away on clarification, but but without this, the required sense of what these terms are supposed to uh, to do. I mean, of course, it, you know, it's sometimes held that 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 some areas of inquiry are, are you know are just uh, are basically wrecked by. Uh, confusion in the use of terms. You know, some people think that well, that, uh, that neuropsychology or something is is completely destroyed by the fact that they talk about br brains thinking things. When, of course, strictly speaking, it's not the brain but the person who thinks things. And so, on. but um, you, even in those cases, it's not really it's not really clear that. Uh, those, if you like, abuses of terminology are are doing uh, great harm to those disciplines. In fact, you know, a, a certain um, willingness to 
to use terms in extended senses, might uh, be required for certain kinds of creativity and uh, the development of new ways of uh, thinking. And so that, as it were, if, if, if we philosophers were acted as kind of self-appointed um, thought police, you know, going into other subjects to, to tell people that they had to clean up their act. I mean, we, the effect might just be you know, a, a mindlessly uh, conservative uh, one. So, so th that doesn't seem like a terribly promising task for uh, philosophy. And you know, if we think of the task of, as we're clearing up the, the terms uh, of, um, of, let's say, public debate, again, it, I mean, maybe there is some role for, for philosophy uh, in, in that. But, you know, but if, um, if, if, if we point out uh, some um, semantic confusion in one of Donald Trump's tweets or something. I mean, it's it's not as though that's going to be you know a particularly effective uh, political uh, I intervention. So, it, I, I mean, I don't want to suggest that there's absolutely no, no way in which we can help anybody else with these things because I think it is true that that philosophers uh, are. I mean, are quite well practiced in thinking about how terms can be ambiguous and how they can, um, different types of ambiguity and how they can be uh, resolved and, and so on. So we may have something to offer, but it, but it seems like a relatively marginal uh, act activity. So the, the alternative, um, if, we're, if we're supposed to be going in for this kind of uh, terminological clarification or engineering is that we're doing it for our own terms, as, as well, our, uh, the terms that belong to the philosophical uh, community. But of course, if you, com if you combine uh, that with the idea that this is the central task of philosophy, then um, we're, what are we polishing these terms up for? Well, we're we're polishing them up to make them better at polishing up terms or something. And so it, it seems like a, a, a rather kind of self-regarding activity. Um, it's a bit as though you went to, to, to some uh, shop where they, where they sold various kinds of uh, mechanical gadgets and, and, uh, and and you know the, the person was showing you all the, the stuff they had in the shop, and they said, "Well, look, here's this is a great new uh, device. It's a self-cleaning device." And you said, "Okay, great. Well, so what does it do?" And they said, well, it cleans itself. <laughs> and um, and um, yes, <laughs> but that's it. It cleans itself. Um, well. I'm, I'm, you know, and it, and it costs only two thousand euros. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's not very clear what the point is. And uh, I mean, so you might think, well, that's, but yeah, sure, with 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 you know conceptual or terminological engineering, it would be better than that because it's that's not just uh, you know it's a bit more constructive. But you know, supposing they said, well, here's another device which which only costs five thousand euros, and uh, and this is a self-improving device, so it it improves itself, and. But you know, and yes, and well, and well, it makes it. You know, and then in, when it's improved itself, it's even better at improving itself. And, but you know, w why should I spend money on that? And um, you know, and so if if philosophy was only doing this for you know for its um, its own purposes, it seems like why would we really need philosophy? Um, I mean, why if if that was all philosophy was, why should Taxpayers' hard-earned money be spent on philosophy. I mean, of course, you know there might be people who would still um, feel sort of proto-philosophical urges, you know, which they might express in in talking more or less nonsense. But um, but if the, you know if 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 they weren't being employed by the state or anything like that, I mean that might be fairly harmless. So, you know, on this picture, if if it's our own 
terminology that we're supposed to be clarifying or improving or whatever. It seems like, uh, and that that's our central uh, task. Uh, then it, wouldn't it be just e easier and cheaper to abolish philosophy? Um, and on the other hand, as I say, if, if, if we're doing, we're supposed to be doing it for other people. Um, it's the problem is that they don't actually seem terribly interested in our services, and and indeed they're probably better placed uh, to. I mean, you know, it's like we, we we go around offering to to wash people's houses, but the but the these people actually have a much better idea of where the dirt is than we than we do. So they they could probably do a better job of washing their house than than we can. Um, so there's a kind of problem in, in uh, you know, if we think that this is the main uh, task uh, for philosophy. Um, a, I mean, a, f a further general point that I might make is that w one thing, I mean, that people often hope for in Presenting philosophy as um, you know this kind of conceptual activity, uh, as clarification or engineering or whatever it is, is that I think the the, the hope is that somehow this will rem remove the apparently irresolvable disagreements from philosophy. Um, but one thing is worth saying, which is that the the tradition of doing philosophy you know, as conceptual um, clarification or, or, or whatever is it, just as mired in disagreement as any other bit of philosophy. So, it, it, I mean, this is not in any way a recipe uh, for uh, avoiding uh, disagreement. Okay, so I, th I thought what I would do is is talk a little bit um, about uh, Rudolf Carnap's uh, views uh, because, of course, he, he, I mean, he's, he stands behind quite a lot of uh, contemporary uh, work um, in metaphilosophy and work or, or particularly of, of this uh, kind, and, and it will also lead me uh, on to uh, to uh, further uh, issues, both about the individuation of uh, concepts and uh, about the relation between um, con supposedly conceptual work and uh, more general uh, theorizing. So, so the kind of picture that Carnap uh, had was um, that what what seem like metaphysical uh, disputes, for example, about whether there are such things as as numbers, um, are really uh, some kind of um, confused. Uh, manifestation of w what is fundamentally uh, a choice between uh, two languages. Um, for example, uh, you know, a, a language in which it's uh, a, a an analytic truth that there are numbers, in which that's just completely trivial. Um, and a language, you know, which might be an analytic truth that uh, everything is concrete or something like uh, like that, and which that also is trivial. It's, it's just as it were, that's just part of the stipulation of the uh, the semantics uh, for the language. And then the idea was that the, 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 there's no there's no factual dispute uh, here. The all there is. Is a a choice about uh, which language it would be most useful for us to speak for a given uh, purpose, and 
And so the, the relevant considerations are uh, pragmatic ones um, and ab you know, about how useful these languages uh, would be. They're not metaphysical ones about whether there really are numbers or anything like, like that. Um, so one, one thing to emphasize with about the way that, that Carnap sets this up is that it, it, this framework it involves a, a commitment to a distinction between analytic and synthetic truth. Uh, where Carnap is using analytic in a fairly broad sense, so it might correspond to better to what some people would uh, call conceptual uh, truth. Uh, and so that, for example, um, there are numbers is, you know, is, is a, a, an analytic or conceptual truth in, in one language but, but not in the other. And, uh, and so it, 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 this is just, it's just a matter of this, as it were, when you sign on to the language, you, you sign on to uh, these analytic uh, truths. And, and so uh, there's, there's no further commitment that you're undertaking about you know, how things are. It's just a matter of your d decision to, uh, to speak that, that language. And so, of course, if you think that the analytic synthetic uh, distinction is problematic, then you should regard Carnap's framework as uh, problematic uh, too. Um, and, uh, well, I mean, obviously the most famous uh, critique of the analytic synthetic uh, distinction is Quine's in Two Dogmas of Empiricism, and um, I, and I think it, it's it's fair to say that that it's generally accepted these days that that Quine's arguments are not decisive. So let's, uh, let's admit that that um, because he, I mean he shows that the analytic synthetic distinction is bound up with other distinctions, but he he doesn't show that this is a, a, as people say a a vicious circle rather than a virtuous. Uh, circle, um, but I mean, if we if we probe a bit more as to what an analytic truth really is meant to be, what what makes something count as an analytic uh, truth, um, I think it's ve it is very hard to get a, a remotely satisfactory answer. Um, and I mean, the, the problem is that on this kind of picture, there are, there are these sentences, like there are numbers, which are supposed to be analytic in a certain language, where um, that is um, just a matter of the meaning of of the language, and so you know, you've, that's where to speak this language, you've got to say those or be willing to say those things, roughly speaking. But that doesn't seem to be how meaningful interpreted languages work, um, because you know, if if we think about uh, natural languages, there don't seem to be any of these sentences such that you, you've, you've just got to assent to them in order uh, to, um, to be a competent speaker of the, uh, of the language. So you know, if, if somebody sees this mathematical la language, I mean, you know, maybe somebody like Hartree Field and, um, uh, you know, and then just objects, well, but, I, but there, are no, there are no numbers. Um, it, 
it's completely against that no, any normal standards for uh, distinguishing between competent and incompetent speakers to say, uh-uh, Hartree Field. You, in saying that, you've just shown that you don't understand mathematical language. You know, just g go back to school and, and learn it properly, and then you know, when you've learned it, you can come back and rejoin the class or something. I mean, the, it's clear that Hartree Field un understands his languages as well as we do, and uh, he just has a, uh, you know, a, a nominalist view of the uh, ontology. Uh, that he just disagrees with us about whether there are numbers. And, I mean, so, of course, we could say, oh, well, that's because it, it, with natural languages, is they're all a bit confused, and, um, and so let's, let's have an artificial language, and, and we're just going to stipulate right, that um, if, if you don't... If you don't understand, if you don't assent to this sentence that there are numbers, then you don't count as understanding this artificial language. Um, but I mean that you know that seems like you know just sneaking in uh, theoretical assumptions, which may be true or false, you know, under the guise of conditions of uh, understanding, right? you know, as, as if you know, we were to, just to announce that f we're, we're going to, um, we're, from now on, we're going to uh, clean up the English language, and you know, uh, and uh, you know, as a con precondition of counting as a competent speaker of English, you have to assent to the sentence "Brexit is good" or something. You know, <laughs> but, uh, I mean, and I mean, what one. One argument uh, for for that uh, is, you know, if you can if you consider a um, a speaker who's by all these standards is is competent with let's say with this artificial uh, language of um, of mathematics in which you, which you have to assent to. Uh, to, there are numbers to count as as competent. I mean, su suppose suppose that this guy, rightly or wrongly, uh, later develops doubts about this, um, and and starts uh, refusing to assent to there are numbers. Then it's it's utterly implausible to say. I mean, you know, assuming that what he's gone through is just, uh, let's say, a process of philosophical reflection, that to say, oh, look, he's obviously just forgotten what this language means, and you know, he doesn't understand this language anymore. He's, he's, th th that is a completely implausible uh, account of what's going on in such a case. It seems like he uh, does understand the language as, as well as uh, he, he ever did. Um, but, but he's now refusing to uh, assent to this supposedly analytic sentence. Uh, I mean, I don't want to labor this point too much because, I, I, I mean, you can ask me about it more in, in uh, discussion, but, I, I mean, I, I went on it at uh, um, enormous length in, uh, in, in uh, philosophy of uh, philosophy. Um, so that... It, as were the, the kind of model of analyticity that we're being presented with seems like uh, one which just doesn't fit uh, with uh, the conditions of uh, linguistic uh, understanding in in uh, in any reasonable sense. And I, I think that this this isn't just a matter of uh, some isolated. Uh, you know, particular sentences. Um, I, th I think it's, it, there's something more general going on in, in this Carnapian uh, framework, which is a, a, a fundamental uh, confusion between choice of language and choice of theory. Because... Uh, on this Carnapian view, w when you choose a language, you're you're choosing with it what basically what Carnap would call a logic, the logic of the logic of the language, 
and and the um, as we there's there's no kind of gap between the choice of the of the the language and your choice as to which logical principles hold in that language, uh, because the, the logical principles are just built into the language it's, itself. But the I mean the logic is a, a theoretical device which, which produces theorems. Uh, you know. Can in principle even be inconsistent and 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 so on and um, and it's epistemologic. It's not clear that there's any uh, significant difference between um, the, the 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 logical part and the non non logical part in in general and and so it seems that there's as it were a certain body of theory which is being given a, a privileged place by, by being labeled uh, analytic or lo log uh, the, the logic of the, uh, the language. Um, I, you know, such that you're not supposed to, to question it and, and so on. And, um, but without any, any r real explanation of, uh, it, you know, what the what this distinction uh, amounts to? I mean, other other than a, an implausible stipulation about how it's supposed to correspond to uh, linguistic uh, competence. So, so that the this Carnapian framework is it, kind of lumping certain types of theory together with certain types of. Uh, of language, and it's it's something that it has gone quite deep into the way that we think about uh, things, so that people assume that there's a, a an absolutely intimate connection between the the language and the logic, whereas it, they don't they don't I mean assume. A co any corresponding connection, let's say, between the language of, uh, you know, the, let's say, the English language or some uh, uh, formal language, uh, and the, and the uh, physical theory. I mean, the, you know, we, we t if you talk about the, the, the people talk about the logic of English or the logic of some uh, formal language or whatever, and roughly speaking, they mean the logical principles that are uh, true or truth-preserving in that that language. Um, but you could equally well talk about the physics of English or the physics of some mathematical language, just meaning the, the physical principles which are true or truth-preserving in that language. And I mean, we wouldn't think that that meant that, as we're adopting the language in, involved uh, adopting a certain physical theory. I mean, it was one thing to speak the language. It's another thing to decide what the, the right physical principles are as expressed in that language. And uh, I mean, my own view, I mean, I'll say more about this in another... Uh, uh, lecture, but it, I guess to, maybe tomorrow afternoon um, is that, or maybe Friday, is that Thursday morning, um, that really the two cases are, are, are fundamentally uh, parallel, and that that there's there's no better reason for sneaking in commitment to a certain logical theory as a precondition for understanding the language uh, than there is uh, for sneaking in uh, commitment to a certain physical theory as a precondition for understanding uh, the language. And, and so if these kind of notions of uh, analyticity and so on uh, and this are problematic in these ways. I think that that makes it much, uh, well, it brings out how uh, unclear the standards of um, individuation for concepts are supposed to be. Because you know, it is the person who, I mean, who says there are numbers, do they have the same concept of number as the one who says that there are no numbers? I mean, you know, and, um, when is that supposed to be a, a theoretical disagreement? And when, when is it supposed to be a semantic uh, disagreement? Um, and you know, I think something that you can see, if you, if you look at 
um, the, the way that, that concepts are uh, often individuated by theorists of concept, is, is concepts is that the bits of theory are built into uh, possession conditions for uh, certain uh, concepts. So you only count as having the, the concept if, if you're willing to sign on to, to certain theoretical claims or inferential moves or whatever. But, but it's never really explained you know, what independent reason there is for treating this as a, a matter of p which concepts you possess as, as opposed to a matter of what theoretical uh, commitments uh, you have. Um, so, so that it does not seem to, to me that th this kind of uh, approach uh, really uh, solves the the kind of problems that it was meant to solve. And in fact, uh, what it does do is it introduce uh, utterly uh, problematic notions of uh, the analyticity and the individuation of concepts that we might be um, better off uh, w without. Um, so, yeah. w one thing I, that I might mention here is that there are, cer there are certain kinds of um, criteria that you could use for individuating concepts which, which don't involve commitment to any notions of analyticity or whatever. So, um, for example, you know, suppose, supposing we've, 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 got, we've got some term uh, X here, and what what we want to know is well, we want to give some kind of explanation of what the concept associated with X is. I mean, a, a I mean, a first a first attempt to do that would be just to say that the the the, um, the concept would be, let's say, the extension of X. I mean, the set of things that that X uh, applies to, um, but. I mean, of course, th that's not going to be uh, at all what we, we want because, you know, there will be the, all the famous examples like, you know, a, a creature with a heart and creature with a kidney. They have the same extension, but, we, but people don't want to say that the concept of a creature with a heart is the same as the concept of a creature with a, a kidney. Um, th then we... So we might go from the extension to the... Uh, intention, um, where roughly speaking, the the intention of a of a term is a function from um, a, each possible world to the extension of the uh, the term uh, in that uh, world, um, and. I mean, and you, you might make it not just the, the, the world, but also the, the world and a time or something like that, but we, we don't need to go into those uh, details. And I mean, a, a further, I mean, you might even want to go from, um, the, from intention to, to character, which would be, uh, where that would be a, a function from a context of utterance to an intention. That's a kind of Kaplan uh, sort of notion. Um, so that, um, I mean, you know, if you take uh, I and TW, I mean, maybe um, they, as uttered by me now, they have the, uh, the same intention, but because, you know, the, the word I is a rigid designator for me, and, and so is my, my name. But, of course, as used in the context of some other speaker, then, then they... they, they Different intention, and so they would have a different character. So, you know, using these kind of notions, which do not depend in the same way um, on um, on notions of analyticity, you can you can build up um, some kind uh, of uh, uh, kind of ersatz uh, concepts. But, but I mean, th these would not. 
give you what you, you really wanted. Because with something like, I mean, if you take, um, let's just suppose that water it simply is the same thing as H, H2O. Let's, j j just for the sake of argument, let's forget about issues about dirty water and, and uh, you know, and so on. Then, you know, water and H2O, they might, they might b b both uh, have the, s the same intention and, or, you know, on one view that, you know, in any context that they, um, they, they ref have that, that's their intention, so that, I mean, that, that they're both rigid. And so, the, so these would end up, and the terms water and H2O uh, would end up expressing the same uh, concept. Uh, on on that sort of view, I mean, we, there are further twiddles you could do, but 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 I, you know, it, we're not going to get the notion of concept that people have wanted it, in this route. I mean, we can get some notions which are of interest in their own right, but then but they're not the kind of thing that people have been hoping for, and then and they they would not be able to play the same kind of uh, role uh, in uh, some. Um, um, Metaphilosophical uh, account, uh, an account of what philosophy is supposed to be doing. I mean, in in part because the it's, it's clear that our access to things like these is it, it, access to the external world, um, and um, and so the, I mean, you see the the idea is if we make if we make philosophy a conceptual uh, enterprise then that will justify us in using our armchair methods because when we sit in our armchair, we're still master of our own concepts and, and so on. And, and so we don't need to stand up to, um, to deploy them and, you know, and recognize analytic truths involving them and, and so on. Whereas you know, on such an ex externalist kind of substitute uh, for, for concepts, uh, the investigation of concepts would be absolutely up, up to the neck in investigation of the uh, external world. Um, so that that doesn't seem like a a good way uh, of. Well, it, it's not going to it's not going to give the people who, who want to use concepts uh, to, to to give this a kind of deflation review of philosophical method. It's not going to give them. Uh, what they want. Um, so the, the final thing I want to to say something about it is the the relation between clarification and theory building, because I mean part of the idea has been that activities like clarification of terms or concepts are an alternative to, for philosophy to the building of substantive theories which tell us something about uh, how reality is. And I think it, it's quite salutary in this connection to, to look at the, the discipline which I think is fairly clearly the clearest discipline that we have, the, the most precise discipline that, that human beings have uh, brought about. And that is mathematics. Uh, you know, I think there's, there's, I mean, we're more precise in mathematics than uh, in, in any of our other uh, forms of uh, inquiry. And, and so you might think, well, Actually, mathematics is quite a good case for uh, this sort of view that, that uh, of conceptual clarification, because after all, mathematics is absolutely chock full of explicit definitions. So, isn't it the case that in mathematics we've uh, we, we've managed to create this clarity by insisting on the you know the, the most explicit kind of clarification, which is actually providing non-circular definitions for our terms. That's okay uh, until you start thinking about the fundamental framework of mathematics, which in contemporary mathematics is mainly it's set theory. I mean, 
And so I'm going to, I'm going to assume that we're, that we're doing mathematics in a conventional uh, set theoretic framework. But, I mean, there are other possible frameworks for doing mathematics in, but I think the, the points that I'm making would fundamentally apply uh, to them as well. So it's, it's, let's just take the case of set theory because it's fairly uh, familiar. So in, in set theory, the, there, are, there are two basically fundamental terms. One, one is, the, if you like, the word set itself, and the other is the, the membership relation, when you, which you write with an epsilon. X is a member of the set Y. Um, these are not defined terms in mathematics. These are things, when, when you study set theory, you, you're given a very rough idea, and you just have to get the hang of what these mean initially. And you, you know, you're told, well, sets are things, they're a bit like collections, but of course, but they're not, not the type of collection that actually has to be collected or anything like, like that. They're just collections, or they're a bit like um, groups of things, but you don't, they don't really have to have anything in common. And, you know, and, uh, and you, you're just given an utterly hand-wavy kind of explanation of what a set is. And, um, and then, you know, with, with membership, you're, you might be given a few examples, like seven is a member of a set of prime numbers or something like that. And then and you're, you're supposed to get the hang of it. Um, so when it comes to the absolutely fundamental vocabulary of mathematics, on which everything else depends, you, you're just given these utterly sort of hand-wavy explanations. And so you might think, well, how on earth does math mathematics achieve its clarity if it's based on, on this uh, kind of utterly vague introduction of its fundamental terms? And the answer is because we have a, ex an explicit theory of sets with axioms about how sets behave. Right? And th th this... There's no serious attempt made to, to say that, th that these axioms are analytic or anything like that. I mean, they're just, uh, I mean, you're just told, you're told what the axioms are. You're given a, a few really toy examples to kind of suggest that, that they're sort of okay. Um, and, and you're also somewhat threateningly told, well, you know, if you want to do set theory, you better accept these. But, but, you know, but only in the way that you might be told, look, if you want to do you know, quantum mechanics, you better <laughs> accept these things too. I mean, it, it, um, and, but the point is that this axiomatic theory gives you what you need to do mathematics because and to do mathematics in an incredibly rigorous way because it's clear what is an instance of these axioms and the the background logic is is uh, quite is clear for for all normal mathematical uh, purposes and um, and and so the the clarification is, is fundam at the fundamental level, it is not being a uh, achieved by an activity of you know, disambiguation or stipulation or anything like that. It's being achieved by being very, very explicit and precise about what the theory is that we're going to be using. So that it's, it's really clear what follows from this theory and what doesn't, at least, or at least what's been shown to fo follow and, and what, what hasn't. And, you know, I think that's a, a much better model for clarification in philosophy than, than just the picture of uh, disambiguation. And it's much more appropriate for philosophy because this is, this is how it works at the most fundamental level in, in mathematics. And, you know, and I think he, w w when, you, when you think about the cases of uh, clarification um, you know, at a less fundamental uh, level in uh, other areas. I think it's pretty clear that, that, that where clarification is needed, it's needed uh, as an integral part of theory building. And, 
that, that, that it's, it's pretty idle unless we're actually using these terms to do some theoretical uh, work. Um, and, and so, I mean, the, the idea that there's this alternative to theory building in philosophy, which is just clarification or maybe conceptual engineering or something, seems to be based on a, a complete m misconception of, of how clarification fundamentally works. Uh, it's, it, it isn't, I mean, the, at the most fundamental level, it is not a matter of definition or disambiguation or stipulation. It's a matter of, as we're putting our theoretical cards on the table to, to make it clear w w just what, w what theory it is that we're proposing so that people can see what, you know, work out what for themselves, what follows from it and what doesn't. So that as we, we can't just weasel out of um, our commitments by saying that the theory doesn't imply that because the theory has been presented um, in a sufficiently explicit way that, that as well, you don't need the theorists standing over you telling you what follows and what doesn't. You can, you can work it out for yourself. And, um, and that's, that's what uh, enables the theoretical development to proceed in a constructive uh, way. And I, I think this, this isn't just a point about clarification. I think this would also apply to uh, you know, notions like terminological or conceptual uh, engineering uh, too, that, that w where there is a role for them, that it's a role that is absolutely embedded in theorizing, in the construction and development and testing of theories, so that uh, f far from far from being an alternative to uh, to clarification or en uh, sorry, I mean clarification and engineering, far from being an alternative to a kind of theory building conception uh, of philosophy, really only work um, within such a uh, a theory building conception. And I'll stop there. <laughs> General idea of philosophy doing this clarification work. Um, there's another form of clarification. There's something else that people sometimes have in mind by this, and that's what Russell did for instance with depth and description. They work out what the proper logical form of something is, and then you see, ah, so certain things don't follow or do follow. Do you say something about that? Yeah, so of course, I I in Russell's case, uh, the, th the theory of descriptions um, emerged as part of his whole logicist program, you know, wh which resulted in Principia Mathematica. Uh, we, and which, and Principia, Principia Mathematica um, is a highly theoretical enterprise. I mean, it's a, it's an a, it's an attempt, you know, to 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 put forward a certain. Uh, logical theory, and then show that you can derive the whole of mathematics uh, from that uh, that theory, um, and uh, and and Russell was was quite open about the, the fact that um, that he that he had to uh, re in o in order to achieve what he was doing, at least the way he wanted to do it, he had to put in some axioms into the theory that were quite speculative. I mean, the, you know, the, like the axiom of choice and the axiom of reducibility, um, and and so uh, all. So in that in that respect, um, you know, if, if one thinks of it in the context of Principia Mathematica, then it was a. Um, you know, as I say, a part of a, a, this big theory building enterprise. I mean, you can also th you can also think about it as a uh, a contribution to the semantics of natural language. And in, in, if you think about it that way, it, it, it's a um, a hypothesis about the semantics of the 
uh, definite descriptions in, in natural languages, and a, a hypothesis which may have, put, I mean, probably pointed in the right direction, but probably wasn't, in fact, uh, fully correct. Um, and, I mean, you can, also, you can also think about it in, uh, you know, in relation to the, the kind of philosophical applications of it uh, you know, in uh, arguing against Meinongians, where, you know, he, and, uh, and so there, um, he's, he's using the theory of descriptions to, uh, you know, to argue that, that um, Meinongian arguments for the existence of, you know, the round square and, and so on, or the, not, I mean, not the existence, but the being of, in some sense of the round square, um, are, uh, are fallacious, and and so it's in in that context, it's it's part of a, a um, an enterprise of metaphysical theorizing about you know determining uh, w what the right <laughs> ontology is. So that you know in all, I mean, so, you know, it's playing several different roles in Russell's philosophy, but all of them are tied up with uh, theoretical act activity of you know a, a um, a more or less speculative uh, kind. I mean, it's in, 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 and in fact, it's it's the connections between the theory of descriptions and these theoretical activities which which gives the the, the theory of descriptions so much interest. Naming the list, it's me. <laughs> Just a simple question. I mean, the last lecture you said that when we do philosophy, we're not interested in words but the things. Words stand for things. But what, in, what about the cases where we are actually the things that the word signify or refer to are not actually things? They are more something more abstract than more like ideas, like justice or, or mind. What about that case? Well, uh, I, I, I don't think that. <sighs> I mean, they're obviously not physical. I mean, they're not just physical things that we can find somewhere. I mean, I, I don't think that we should identify justice with the idea of justice any more than we should identify, um, you know, stone with with the idea of of stone. And um, be well, no, but because the. I think, I mean, so roughly speaking, what, I mean, what justice refers to um, is something like the, the intention of the term just, right? It, so in other words, what, what we've got is a, a distinction uh, between, let's say, just and unjust acts. Um, and a, a distinction which which applies in a, you know with respect to any possible world, um, and uh, and that 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 intention is not in any way a mental item, um, and uh, and fun that's fundamentally what we're interested in because what we're concerned about is is you know w which acts are just and which aren't which are not just, and whereas our our idea of justice is, um, well, I mean, if you, you know, if you, if you think of it, you know, with the comparison between water and H2O, I mean, uh, you know, uh, uh, the idea associated with water is, you know, presumably is meant to be different from the idea associated with H2O. But, um, but it's, this identity tells us about the, the nature of uh, of water, and um, you know, and similarly, you know, w when somebody like, for example, Rawls puts forward a, a, a theory of justice, uh, w what they're trying to do is to uh, to give you know a true and informative account of, roughly speaking, of this of this intention of the of which things are just and which are not, and um, you know, and. Uh, and that, that may be a, 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 a very explicit and theoretically developed account of the distinction, whereas what, what we have when, when we just have our pre-theoretic understanding of justice is, is just maybe some... It's not, it's not some kind of definition in the back of our heads, probably. It's more, it's more like um, 
you know, we, we, we have some very rough and ready uh, ability to, to recognize just acts from unjust acts, at least in, in easy cases. Uh, but of course, the, the, reason, the reason we want a theory of justice is in part to guide us when it gets to less e easy cases. And, you know, and so, you know, if a philosopher has the, the, the choice between um, a theory of the, dis the fundamental difference between just and unjust acts or a theory of our pre-theoretic thinking about that distinction. I mean, it seems like the, the first is the important one because, because the first is the one that's most co closely connected with actually applying the distinction correctly in difficult cases. So that, you know, I think, I think the, the distinction between, you know, intent, intention and maybe character but perhaps also, um, on the one hand, and, and these more mentalistic uh, things like idea and, and, and concept uh, or, uh, um, is, is actually just, just as strong with notions like justice and knowledge as, as with the more familiar examples. It's, it's just because we're dealing with something quite abstract, it's a, little, it's, a, it's a little bit harder initially to put one's finger on it, but I think it's there just as much just as much, and, and that the reasons for being interested in, as it were, the, the worldly aspect of it and not in the, uh, the, the w just the thought aspect of it are exactly the same. So uh, you say that uh, conceptual engineering is embedded in uh, theory building, then don't you need to say something about uh, like where conceptual engineering ends and like, the rest of theory building begins? Because I, I thought that you would find this hard to say because you said that it's hard to tell apart like, semantic disagreements from uh, theoretical disagreements, to draw this line between like, when we're talking about concepts and when we're talking about reality or something like that. Yeah, but, so, but I mean, conceptual engineering isn't my term. You know, it's, been, it's a term that's been introduced by people like Herman Capellan and so on. And so if, you know, it, it, it doesn't play some special role in, in my account, but I think I'm just saying that where, it, where that kind of thing fits in would be uh, in, uh, within theory building, not as an alternative to it. But I mean, you know, if, if you want a clarification of what, what conceptual engineering is, then, then uh, you, should, you should ask some enthusiast for that way of talking to, to give it to you, because I'm, I'm, you know, it's not my job to, to, to clarify uh, these other people's terms, unless, unless I'm going to make, um, as it were, special use of them myself. I mean, you know, I think, I think there are some things that you can quite easily put your finger on, which I guess count as conceptual engineering. Like, you know, when, when, people, when people introduce new terminology that to mark a distinction that previously we didn't have a proper way of talking about, then, then I, th I guess that counts as conceptual engineering. So, you know, when... When Cantor uh, introduced, you know, talk of sets and membership, you know, in a really systematic way, I mean, it was it was probably an an element of uh, conceptual engineering, if one was going to use the term in in that in that case. But uh, but of course, it it was thoroughly embedded in his development of set theory as a mathematical theory, um, and. Um, you know, I mean, of course, you could, you, can, you could talk about when people first started using a, a term or first started using it in, in you know, w w with some new sense and so on. But, um, you, but that, will, that will just be, you know, one kind of a aspect of this much more general theoretical enterprise. No, I, well, I, I mean, I don't even. I mean, it's not even clear what what the uh, what that claim would would mean. But um, I mean, I take when when people you can have two mutually inconsistent theories in in a single language, right? I mean, so that um, you know, it, it, and and the. Where, where people just put forward, I mean, they, you know, there's some generally understood language uh, of, 
you know, mathematics or physics or whatever it is, and, and people simply put forward um, you know, a, opposed postulates w within that language. And, then, and, and, they're, and, they, and they're clear that, that they're disagreeing with each other. Um, and uh, that's, you know, that's, if you want to understand them as they intend to be understood, you have to uh, understand that that's, that's going, going on. And so in that case, th there would be an element of theory building that, that didn't involve anything that I take it would count as conceptual engineering at all. John, uh, I'm sure you wrote about this issue extensively, so but in connection to your lecture today, take knowledge. Suppose I do some conceptual analysis and I come to the conclusion that uh, to justify belief are uh, necessary, maybe not sufficient condition for knowledge. And then I do some theory building, and I give you a theory of truth, <coughs> I give you a theory of what is to be justified, I give you a theory of what beliefs are. Will you be okay with this? So, I mean, the, the part there that is being treated as analysis is, is the part where you say, as we're roughly... You know, it's knowledge if and only if it's justified true belief. Right. Right. And, and but that's that. I mean, it's not clear what what in that is uh, is supposed to count as uh, analysis, really, because um, you know, I mean, one can. Uh, and, he, and that's so even if you, you know, let's say you make this as a claim of necessity. Um, because, so, I mean, some, you know, in fact, uh, my own view is that this is probably um, correct as a strict by conditional, but it's correct because... The, the notion of justification itself has to be understood in terms of knowledge, and so it, it, this in, in the end comes out as trivial. So that you know, just assigning on to the um, the truth of this biconditional, that's even the necessitated one, it doesn't doesn't commit you to a, a, anything that that really counts as analysis in the in some sense, like the the breaking down of the concept of knowledge into more fundamental components. Um, and um, and so, you, I mean, you have to make some kind of further claim, such as that the that the concepts of justification, truth, and belief are all uh, constituents of the concept of knowledge, and that you can you can. Roughly speaking, somebody can grasp each of these without grasping the concept of knowledge. And, and you're not happy with these claims. Well, I think they're false. Uh, I mean, uh, you know, uh, I mean, of course, uh, you know, if somebody, I mean, you know, we, we can, we can have, we can, we can define complex terms as we do. We, oh, sorry, we can, we can define terms in, you know, with, with a complex definiens, you know, as, you know, as we're doing all the time in mathematics. And, and then we can use, you know, so that, for example, the ma mathematical term group, you know, has an explicit definition, or, well, actually, it's various different ways of doing it, but let's just fix on one. Um, and, um, you know, and so we can certainly, we can certainly use the term group um, in a way such that, uh, you know, it is... Um, it will be equivalent to to this set theoretic uh, definition, um, and you know. But I, I, I just I, I I think that that kind of that model of definition, my view, it it it's really turned out to have hardly any application to natural language at all. That that hardly any of our uh, philosophically interesting terms in natural language uh, are understood in that way, um, you know, and, and a, a much a much better model for our understanding of them, it, you know, is, has to do with you know our understanding them because 
uh, we, you know, we're able to uh, r recognize, uh, you know, some simple cases for them, and you know, and uh, the simple cases of knowledge and of knowing, and simple cases of not knowing, and and so on. And uh, and that, that's what how how we understand them, and n not via any of these complex uh, definitions. Um, and you know, the, the, the rem remarkably little has been done, even by people in the tradition where you're looking for you know so-called analyses of knowledge. Re remarkably little has been done by the, by, by people to to. Um, Substantiate the claim that that this this actually would be an analysis of concept of a concept. I mean, of course, you know, some sometimes um, you, these days, what you get are people who say, "Look, I'm not interested in analysing the concept of knowledge. I'm interested in analysing knowledge itself." And then they present this as an analysis of knowledge itself. Although even there, it's not it's not very clear in what sense. Knowledge, the, the state of knowing, as opposed to the concept of knowing, uh, is being broken down into more fundamental constituents. It's not not, not clear what the metaphysics of, the, the, as it were, the constituent structure of states would, would have to be for, to make sense of that. I'd like to understand whether it follows from what you said that uh, uh, you know often philosophers accuse other philosophers of making conception mistakes. So in Menetics, for example, many people say that naturalists, that is, those who think that ethical properties are natural properties of some kind, um, are often accused of saying, well, you don't know what you, you don't know what the concept of rightness or wrongness or yes. goodness or bad is. You're making a conceptual mistake, and that's that's then why you make the, the physical mistake of identifying uh, normative properties with. So I don't think there's anything much to that kind of talk. I mean, because the, um, I mean, I mean, the charge is is had better not be that they don't understand the word right or something like that, because the people who are being accused of these mistakes, you know, are obviously in general they're completely competent, you know, speakers of of English. So it's it's not it's not some kind of failure of uh, linguistic uh, competence. Um, it's it's just something more like um, well I, I I think it's supposed to be you know as it were a kind of error that you know if only they were clear headed they they should be able to avoid or something like that you know that that that, that it's a product of uh, confusion but but I think that that's that's um, Charges of confusion of that kind are—I I, mean—they're they're mostly just empty rhetoric, really. That, that because um, the you know, I mean, the, the person may, who's making these claims may be—they may be wrong, but there's but it's the, there's no there's no reasonable sense in which they're more con con confused than, as it were, just being wrong about so something. Um, and, you know, and I think that, I mean, th th I mean that, those ways of talking are, they're, they're a kind of hangover from a time wh when this sort of conceptual model of philosophy was much more dominant th than it is uh, now. And um, it's... Where it was supposed to, you know, supposed to be that that just by being just by, you know just by being clear, we you know if we I mean this was as well like the old ideology of analytic philosophy when it was a much more distinctive form of, of philosophical activity than it is uh, these days. Um, that, you know that, that we we didn't we didn't need to engage in um, risky theorizing of a quasi scientific. Kind and you know that we just need needed to be to avoid muddle, uh, you know, in, in order to get things right. And I think, uh, you know, all, all the evidence of our experience with with those kinds of theorizing is uh, that philosophical issues cannot be resolved in that way. That, um, all, of course, philosophers may may be 
confused in various ways, just you know, in, in the way that anybody can be confused in various ways. But that, that theoretical, the major theoretical disagreements in philosophy are not the result of one side or the other just being muddled. They're, they're, they're simply deep theoretical disagreements which are not easy to resolve. Thank you very much. I have a, uh, have a question about, uh, about the, that covers a bit this lecture and the previous lecture. I, I noticed that in, in, um, in both of them you were not um, making any uh, really strict conceptual distinction between philosophy of science and in many cases all the things you were, you were talking about in, about in the case of philosophy you were saying that it's not special to philosophy and you can also find, yes. them, find them elsewhere. But when you were asked about the, the distinction, distinction or what separates them, you refer to more uh, institutional issues, historical yes. issues, etc. So, uh, and I'm, I'm perfectly fine with that, but, and, but uh, isn't it then possible to have uh, a different um, workable uh, storytelling, uh, not just presenting philosophy as a science, but also going the other way and saying that scientific activity is also philosophical activity and there, is, there isn't a difference between them. I mean, I think, that, I think that's, that's true of some scientific activity, but basically, of the, as it were, the, the, of the most theoretical end of, of, of science. So that, you know, I think that um, it, it's, um, you know, it's quite, you know, as, as I was saying, that, that there, are, that there are areas where highly theoretical biology just overlaps with philosophy of biology, and high, highly theoretical physics overlaps with philosophy of physics. And, and I'm quite, I, I'm entirely happy to say that um, the, that the, uh, what some of the biologists are doing is philosophy, and, and what some of the, the physicists are doing is philosophy as well. Um, uh, but, you know, I, I think that if we're doing, if we're thinking, I mean, if we're thinking of things in terms of um, the kind of institutional divisions, then, um, you know, it, it does to some extent we depend on, as well, what, what sorts of intellectual communities people are, are part of, you know, even things like which, you know, which journals they publish in, which conferences they, they go to. Um, and, um, you know, and I think what one, what one thing that, that you get in, in some of those areas is that there, there is exactly that kind of, of um, institutional and, uh, overlap in that, you know, that, that you get highly theoretical physicists of certain kinds and philosophers of physics, they, they, they go to the same conferences, they publish in some of the same journals, some of them are you know, moving from, you know, from the physics side to the philosophy side or in the opposite direction. And you know, in, those, in those cases, it's, you know, it's, it's clear that um, you know, even by, by these you know, kind of, if you like, rather crass institutional criteria that people, people are working in an area of overlap. So let us begin with the second day, and it's on doing both experiments. Right. Well, thank you. Um, so, in the discussion uh, yesterday, one issue was raised. Well, given the sort of anti-exceptionalist uh, line that I've been taking uh, about uh, philosophy, that it's really not uh, so special or different from uh, other uh, sciences. Um, is there anything that differentiates it specifically? And, uh, and one feature of uh, philosophy, which does seem uh, rather different from uh, other disciplines, uh, um, certainly of contemporary philosophy, uh, is the, the, the key role uh, played by uh, thought experiments. Uh, by which I mean very roughly imaginary uh, examples, but which are used to um, to play some kind of strategic uh, role in uh, philosophical uh, arguments. I mean, they're they're not simply there for purposes of 
illustration. Of course, uh, it's not the, the case that uh, philosophy is the, the only uh, discipline that uses thought experiments. I mean, the, the very famous uh, thought experiments uh, by, by Galileo and uh, Einstein and uh, other scientists. But I th it's certainly true that, uh, that thought experiments play um, a, a more central role in a, a lot of contemporary uh, philosophy, for example, in epistemology and in moral philosophy uh, than, than they, they, they do in physics or, uh, or elsewhere. Um, so, uh, you know, if we were looking for something distinctive of philosophy, we, we, we might uh, think of uh, thought experiments. Um, and so, I'm, what I'm going to be doing today is to discuss uh, how thought experiments uh, work um, and uh, argue that um, they, they, they really work in, in a way that uh, does not involve anything very surprising or unusual, any special faculties or, or, or anything uh, mysterious uh, like, like that. Um, of course, there's, there's a question about whether thought uh, experiments are uh, just a special feature of something like contemporary analytic philosophy, or whether they're distinctive of uh, philosophy uh, much more uh, generally. And I, mean, I think it's probably true to, to say that they, they play a larger role in uh, contemporary analytic philosophy than, than they've uh, historically uh, done. But there, there have always been uh, thought uh, experiments in philosophy. For example, in, in Plato, there's the, the ring of, of Gyges, which makes you invisible, and that's used as uh, a way of, of thinking about as well, what makes people act rightly if, if, they, if they had a, a ring of invisibility which enabled them to get away with, with crimes, uh, would, would, they, would they use it and so on. Um, and, uh, and in fact, um, there are, there's a much longer and, and uh, more cross-cultural uh, history uh, to thought experiments, even in quite specific cases. So uh, one of, one of the, the test cases that the debate on thought experiments uh, has been about um, are, are Gettier uh, thought experiments, which are uh, used to uh, refute the, the claim that uh, knowledge is simply uh, justified uh, true belief. Uh, these, these Gettier um, thought experiments involve examples where, in in the relevant sense of justification, you you, you have justified uh, true belief, uh, but not uh, knowledge. And and there's been a lot of debate, in fact, ab about uh, whether this this is some kind of um, odd feature of uh, white. Western males uh, in the 20th and 21st centuries, or whether this is something uh, more, uh, more, more general. Um, and uh, because the, the, I mean, whether we find these examples compelling, but they cert I mean, it's certainly true that, that, that they, they did play a key role in the, um, the Collapse of the justified true belief account of knowledge, which I mean, it, I mean, sometimes it's wrongly described as having been dominant, you know, for, for two thousand years, but it was definitely dominant. Uh, I mean, that's that's not really true, but but it was it was dominant, for, you know, in, in the the forties and nineteen uh, fifties and uh, and early sixties, and then then Gettier's uh, thought experiments. Uh, in 1963, almost were almost immediately agreed to have uh, uh, refuted this at the time uh, standard uh, theory of knowledge. Uh, something which that, which Jennifer Nagel actually has has introduced into the discussion is the fact that 
um, examples of a, a similar type and probably used, although this is a, a bit controversial, probably used for a similar purpose. In fact, go back um, probably more than 1,200 years before Gettier. Um, and that um, Buddhist philosophers uh, in India in the 8th century seem to have had uh, Gettier uh, cases. And I'll, I'll, t I'll tell you one of them, because, just so we have an example of a, of a thought experiment uh, on the table. Um, and also because I think, in, in a way, they're, they're actually more elegant and natural uh, examples than the ones that Gettier gives in, in his uh, paper. Um, so this one involves someone who, um, who sees what looks um, exactly like a, uh, a cloud of smoke in the, in the distance. And, um, and who, who then uh, infers that um, no, no smoke without fire, and therefore there's a fire over there. And, uh, and in fact, he's right, there is a fire over there. But the, the catch is that, that what, what he saw was not a cloud of smoke. It was actually a cloud of flies. Somebody over there was, cook, was cooking some meat. And I guess that they'd only just started cooking it so that the um, that there hadn't been time for a cloud of smoke to develop, um, but the smell of the meat had attracted a whole lot of flies, and so all these flies were buzzing around, and this cloud of flies looked like, in, in the distance, looked like a cloud of smoke. And, and so this person's belie belie true belief that there was a fire over there, um, was, it was justified in the, in the sense in which uh, uh, people have, have been, <laughs> who try to, give this analysis, think of justification. I mean, there was, you know, it was a, a, a reasonable belief based on some evidence. But in fact, it, but his belief that there was a fire over there was derived from, I mean, that which was true, was derived from his false belief that there was smoke uh, uh, over there. So, so the, and, and I think the, the, the natural judgment to, to make about this, this case uh, is that although he had a justified in the relevant sense a uh, uh, true belief uh, about that there was a fire over there. He did not know that there was fire over, th over there. Uh, so that, in fact, these, um, these Gettier thought experiments uh, are, are not, they're not something that, that just uh, is some kind of defamation of uh, recent Western culture or, or anything like that. that I mean, they, they, uh, there's, there's something much, uh, much deeper than, than that. Um, so, so what I want to, to do now is just to say something about how thought experiments uh, work. Some, some things that I'll leave until my the lecture tomorrow afternoon ab about the use of the imagination in philosophy. But, but, but I, it, today, uh, this morning, I'll talk a, a bit about the, the sort of logical structure uh, underlying uh, thought experiments. Because, I mean, there is, uh, there is initially something a, a bit puzzling about thought experiments because, you know, if you just think of it in, in very crude terms, uh, you know, if you just, as it were, start thinking with a com crude comparison with scientists doing real life uh, experiments, um, it's obviously, you know, if you want to test a theory by an a scientific experiment, it's not enough to imagine doing the experiment and then imagine getting the result that you'd like. I mean, that, you couldn't refute a theory like, just, just like that, it seems. And so how, how come uh, philosophers uh, get to, to do things the easy, lazy way by just, by just using their imaginations? So we, we, we have to uh, think a bit about um, what exactly uh, is uh, involved in that, and uh, and I think once we do, we can see that what's going on is not is not very uh, mysterious. Um, 
and, and so I'll, I'll say a bit about the, the, the kind of underlying logical structure. And, and for those of you who are interested in these kind of details, it, this will be a little bit different from, from what I say um, in the philosophy of philosophy, although the, the, uh, the general approach is, is very much the, the same. But um, I've, I've been thinking about conditionals quite a lot recently. And, uh, and since conditionals are going to be involved in, in this, uh, uh, my views on those have, have changed in a way which actually, I think, helps the, uh, the, the kind of approach I was taking in philosophy of philosophy rather than uh, hindering it. But, I'll, I'm just going to do this. I mean, we've, we've, I mean, we had a particular example of a, of a philosophical thesis that are being refuted um, by a thought experiment. But I, I, I now want to do things in a somewhat more uh, schematic way, just, just to give a, some sense of the, the underlying uh, logical uh, structure. And um, let, I'll just take. Uh, as some kind of sample uh, generalization, uh, something like all, all A's are, are C's. Um, so it, if we were just having the, so it doesn't, you know, it could be all cases of uh, of justified true belief are cases of knowledge or something like that. Or, or you can just fill it in however you like. But, but I want to focus on the, the logical uh, structure. So if, if we just had a, uh, a bare generalization like that, which we, uh, over, uh, as it were, just stuff in the actual world, uh, it's, it's, hard, it's hard to see how... Uh, we could refute a generalization like that just by uh, imagining something because uh, what we imagine might not be in the actual world. And so it wouldn't, it wouldn't, wouldn't give us a, a counter example. I mean, that's, it's a little bit more complicated than that. But, but as, um, that's, that's a natural thought. I mean, you can't, you, can't re you can't refute the generalization that all swans are white just by imagining a black swan. You have, to observe, you have to observe one. Um, but um, in philosophy, a lot of the time, the, the generalizations that we're interested in are being put, put forward not simply as true, but as necessary. So we can put a, a box for necessarily there. Um, and, and so it. If uh, the, the, the generalization uh, is being claimed to be, I mean, if the, we've got the claim that a certain universal generalization is necessary, then in order to refute that, all we need to do is uh, to show that uh, a counterexample is uh, to the generalization itself is possible. In other words, uh, we need to show that it's possible that there's an A which is not a C. And, and so uh, if, if, we, if we want to show that that's, that's possible, uh, it's, you know, th that, that already makes it uh, somewhat easier to understand how a, a thought experiment uh, might, be, uh, might be relevant. Um, but of, of course, what's w w w very distinctive about these thought experiments is that they don't involve just a bare claim that you know that, that a, a, a counterexample is possible. They they involve a, a fleshing out that uh, claim with a as it were some some concrete uh, details, um, and. Um, In some, which, in, as it were, in some way, uh, bring cognitive capacities to bear to enable us to see the possibility um, of uh, of a counterexample, and so, I mean, the, the the general approach that I want to to take uh, 
is to is to think of it like like this. We'll 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 use e of x to 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 mean um, x is of the the ex example type. I'm sorry. I mean it's so e is basically the, uh, here a description of the the e example. Like it, it, the e would might pack in all the, the details about. Uh, the um, the fire and the cooking meat and the cloud of flies and the person who to whom it looks like a um, a cloud of smoke and and so on and um, and then what what we're um, doing in the counterexample is that w that we're using cognitive faculties that, that all humans have, just to make a judgment of the form, um, roughly putting it in English, if there were an E, um, it would be A but not C. Um, and and so it, it's as well. We we need that kind of uh, detail to um, to focus on this uh, on this possibility, um, and uh, and the 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 sort of imaginative exercise that we're doing when we think through the counterexample. Uh, a key function of it is to enable us to uh, to to knowledgeably make a, a judgment of this kind. If, um, so, so, you know, if if there were a, a case of you know a, a, a traveller who sees a, a, a cloud of flies, but it looks exactly like you know blah blah blah, that would be the E. Then it would be uh, a case of uh, justified tree, tree belief, but it would not be uh, a case of of knowledge. Um, and. Um, and we also um, we also need uh, something more than this because um, sometimes you can have counterfactuals like uh, conditionals of this kind, which are which are vacuously true just because the uh, the antecedent in this case uh, the the were the were any uh, bit. Um, is is impossible, um, and and so this this is only going to work if uh, if it, we also have something like uh, the could be an e, and um, and from the, it, so the, if if we can if we can get these two. Uh, Judgments, um, then th they will enable us to say that there could be um, an A that was not C. I'll say a little, I'll say a bit more about how the the specific uh, logic uh, goes because I think I've got a, a if one gives a, the right kind of a, analysis of counterfactuals. It makes it go actually more smoothly than than, uh, than I had it going in the philosophy of uh, philosophy, but. I just want briefly to to say something about these these kinds of uh, of judgment. So that, that uh, it's comple completely normal that that we use our imagination to to make counterfactual uh, judgments. So you know if. Um, You know, supposing I, you know, I, we t we take, you know, a judgment like, um, if uh, if Williamson were to try to give uh, this lecture standing for the for the next half hour on one leg, he would fail, 
right? I mean, I, th you know, I think we, I th we all know that that's the case, right? I mean, uh, you know, that it's obvious that, that, I, that I do not have the capacity to, uh, I mean, it's not, uh, no. <laughs> Uh, to, to stand on one leg for for half an hour while while lecturing, um, and um, you know, and you don't need to, you don't need to do some special physiological calculation. I mean, you just know enough about how human beings work that that, that just imagining what that would involve, you you, you see that I would I would fail in, in that, um, and and there's nothing especially philosophical about that. It, it's um, and you know and. If, if 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 you if you have an a very unreasonably high uh, opinion of my abilities to stand on one leg, you can add some further things like you know, um, b b balancing this pen on the tip of my nose <laughs> or something as well. Um, so so that, I mean that's just an example of the you know, the, the kind of uh, the counterfactual judgment that we can that we can make on the basis of a quick imaginative uh, exercise uh, where we roughly speaking we, we just imagine the antecedent you know if I were to try to do this thing and then and then we follow through what would happen and come to the conclusion that, that I would fail and, and we thereby actually come to know a certain kind of factual and this I mean this is a, as I say I'll, I'll talk more about this uh, tomorrow afternoon. But this, this is just a, a normal way in which human beings know all, all sorts of uh, facts about uh, their uh, environment, about how things would go, uh, and which are important in uh, all sorts of practical ways, because we, we, you know, we, we, need, we need to be able to make these judgments about what would happen if we did such and such you know, in, in order to uh, decide what to do and, and all sorts of things. Um, and, uh, and we can also uh, similarly um, get knowledge of certain possibilities. Like, uh, you know, so it, it, it would be possible for me to try to give the whole lecture um, on, um, uh, in, you know, standing on one leg and, and with the pen balanced on the tip of my nose. I mean, the, you know, of, of course, I, I would, you'd, you'd have, you might have to change things a little bit, you know, that because, you know, I would, uh, because, you know, maybe I'm, at the moment, I'm, I'm, I'm too aware of the, uh, the possibility of, of failure and how ridiculous I would look and, and so on to be able to do it. But, I, but I'm definitely, it, it was something that, that I, that, what, you know, maybe if I were just a bit, a bit more deluded or something, I could, um, I, I could do. So that, and uh, there are all sorts of possibilities that we can recognize in, in that kind of very ordinary way um, using our imaginations. And, uh, and so uh, the, the fact that we're invoking that in, in the case of you know, a philosophical thought experiment doesn't, doesn't mean that, that any special philosophical faculties or anything like that are, are being used. This is, this is just normal human counterfactual thinking being applied to uh, an example that happens to be philosophically significant, but significant in relation to a certain philosophical uh, theory. Um, so I'll say a bit more now about on just for and this is you know if you if you're not if you don't like these kind of technical details you know you you, you could switch off for five or ten minutes because uh, because it, the rest of the 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 talk won't it won't these are not crucial for it but this this does have to do with the detailed um, implementation of uh, this approach um, we, because once you start uh, thinking about it. Um, The question of how you um, how you formalize uh, th this kind of claim, if there were any, it would be A but not C, uh, is actually somewhat trickier than you might uh, expect. Um, so I'll, I'll start off by, as we're showing you what 
what the difficulties are if you, tr if you just try to do it uh, in, in the normal way. So uh, the, the, the normal kind of symbol for a kind of factual conditional is, is, is box arrow, or sometimes, people sometimes use other symbols, but this, this one will do. And, um, and so, you know, if you have, no, I'll, I'll use different letters, X. If, if you have X, kind of actually implies Y, where X and Y in sentences, that, that's supposed you know, to mean if X were the case, um, Y would be the case. That, Actually, the, really, it should be if it were the case that x, then it would be the case that y, because they're sentences, not not uh, names. But um, now, uh, and so you might think, okay, we, I mean, this is this kind of notation that well, it goes back to to David David Lewis, and you might think, okay, so we can just f f uh, use that quite straightforwardly to formalize uh, if there were an e, uh, it would be a but not c, and. Uh, that w and so you think, well, the, so the antecedent is uh, if there were an E, so that's, um, there, is, there is an example of, of E, of, which in, in our ex cases, is, that's a description of the scenario we're interested in. Um, and then uh, counterfactually, uh, it would be A, but, uh, but not uh, C. Um, and you know, so you might think, oh well, we can just formalize it like that. That seems to capture what we have in mind. But if if you think about it, this is uh, is no good because um, because we've got if there were you know in the antecedent we've got there there is uh, an example of e, but then we've got this variable x uh, here in the consequent. Uh, it, it, which you know we'd really naturally read as it's a, but it's not c. But the trouble with this is with having the variable here is that it's not actually not it's not bound by this quantifier because the quantifier uh, is in just in the antecedent uh, of the uh, the conditional, um, and um, so its its scope doesn't extend uh, into the consequent. And so this what, what x is here is left just completely unspecified. So that, that act, although that seems like a natural attempt to, uh, to formalize it, it's it actually um, it, no good. Um, and so that, I mean, there are, there are various ways that you might try to do it. So you might think, okay, well, let's, let's, let's take the quantifier outside. Um, and and do it like this, for, so that for all x, if x were an example uh, of, well, if x satisfied e, then it would satisfy a, but uh, not c. Um, but it, in general, um, th that is is not the right way to um, to. Formalize uh, sentences like uh, like that, um, and it, uh, it kind of helps to to think about uh, some different examples. We're not not involving th so much thought experiments now, but if you think of if you think of an example like um, if um, if an animal escaped. From the zoo, it would be a monkey. Right. Um, so I mean, that seems like a pretty sensible claim. I mean, let's assume that monkeys are just a lot more ingenious at you know at, at escaping than than other animals. Um, but if you tr if you try to formalize it like like this, um, you'd get something like for all x. Uh, sorry. See, and this this has exactly the same problem that it, that if you if you put uh, if you tried to formalize it in the original way that we tried, we'd have you know in the antecedent an animal escapes from the there is an x that the x is an animal and, and x escapes from the zoo, and then and then in the consequent we'd have x is a is a monkey, but but the the, the variable wouldn't be bound 
uh, in the consequent by the, qu the quantifier in the antecedent. So we could, try, we could try doing it this way. And then what we'd get is roughly something like if, uh, for all x, if x escaped from the zoo, let me forget about the monkey, uh, the animal part, uh, then x would be a monkey. Um, but that says something completely wrong because it because what it's it, because it says for uh, roughly speaking for any animal if that animal were to escape from the zoo it would be a monkey. So you know I, I mean you think about the elephant in the zoo. It's, this that says that if that thing that is actually an elephant if it were to escape from the zoo it would be um, a monkey. It would somehow have you know <laughs> changed species or something. And so so that uh, that. That kind of formalization doesn't give you what you what you want because it uh, it kind of forces you to look at uh, possibilities which may be kind of w absolutely wacky where the um, where things are totally uh, different or you know it, um, it I mean it, you know it might it might be the, Yeah, I mean, I mean that's, that that is obviously giving us the wrong result here. And although it it takes a little bit more sort of thinking about it, it's not really giving us the right result in the, in these uh, thought experiments uh, either. Because it's it's uh, I mean we're interested in you know uh, something that satisfies this description E, but when but we're not interested in absolutely weird scenarios where something which in the actual world is totally different from uh, from from that somehow you know weirdly gets changed you know, uh, uh, so that it satisfies e so um, so there's there's is a there's a, a bit of a compl complication here and and the, the way I um, I, had, I sort of solved the problem in philosophy of philosophy was a bit kind of clunky, which which was I said you know so the antecedent is if if the worst some, something were e then it would be the case that uh, everything that was e um, was a but not but not c. Um, and that is kind of was sort of good enough for my purposes, but it it, does, it feels like a very unnatural uh, form formulation of the uh, of the original. Um, and I I think that what was really going a bit wrong was actually the uh, the underlying completely standard kind of. Uh, account of uh, uh, counterfactuals uh, that I was uh, using. Um, uh, I mean, for, you know, following David Lewis and and lots and lots of other people. Um, and you know, I, I think that w w what it, what it involved doing was uh, was assuming that there was a a special counterfactual conditional which um, involved both. Um, both a modal aspect that it was taking us to counterfactual possibilities, but also uh, involved uh, the conditional aspect. And uh, you know, it seems to me that now that uh, a really a better approach, which is something that linguists have anyway been um, trying to construct, uh, w would involve uh, separating the 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 conditional part of a counterfactual conditional from the, uh, if you like, the counterfactual or modal uh, part, which um, here is basically expressed by the uh, the word uh, would, um, and uh, and really what we've got is the, the just the the word if, which is just a, a conditional, um, which is providing the conditional part, and and the would. Which is pr providing the, if you like, the subjunctive or modal uh, aspect of this. And in fact, w when you think about it, uh, you realise that um, would 
in this sense. I mean, this, I mean, this is not just a temporal sense of the word, obviously, it's a modal sense. Uh, it has a life of its own uh, where, where it can appear e even in non-conditional uh, um, contexts, as, you know, so that you can, um, you can say about some, somebody, uh, she would not betray a friend. Right? There's no conditional there. You're just saying she would not do it. And, and, but you're saying something modal because you're not just saying that, that she, she, never, she never has and, she, and never will betray a friend. You're, you're saying that, uh, as it were, this is something um, you know, that applies to her in a, a range of possible situations that she could be in. Maybe not all possible situations, but as roughly speaking, there's no nearby world in which she would uh, betray, uh, which she betrays a friend. Um, and, uh, and so, uh, you know, I think if you, if you give an analysis of uh, counterfactual conditionals um, in, in terms of, you know, a, a compositional account where you have one, a separate analysis of if and, uh, a, and, a, and, a, and a semantics for if and a semantics for would, and then you just let them... Uh, it, interact to produce a semantics for the subjunctive conditional. That's the way that it really ought to work uh, compositionally. And you actually get something, in my view, uh, perfectly sensible. Um, but I, I, I mean, this is now within the, the um, The semantics of conditionals. This is super controversial, but my but my view is that the if itself is actually just the ordinary truth functional material conditional. This is not a popular view at the moment, but I think uh, people have uh, not realised the the resources that are available for uh, defending it. Not not the standard resources, but some non-standard ones. But I'm not going to go into that aspect of things unless you start asking me about it. Uh, but uh, but what what you actually get is um, basically that the, um, that the counterfactual conditional is just a, um, a strict conditional um, with a, you know, of the form um, necessarily uh, if, if x, than why, where, but where the necessarily is restricted in, by, by some kind of range of contextually relevant uh, possible uh, worlds. And, and this is just, uh, and so the, so the if is just contributing the, the hook, the, the, uh, the truth functional uh, conditional, and the, um, and the would is contributing the restricted um, necessity operator. Um, and, and then, I if we have that kind of analysis, we can actually give a much more natural account of sentences like, if there were any, it would be A but not C, because we can just say this is, um, we've got the restricted uh, modality, uh, the necessity here, and then, and then a universal quantifier. It, it w in this restricted range of worlds, um, if every, every uh, e is an A, but not a C. I mean, there's actually more going on in the English th than, than that, because there's this kind of apparent existential quantifier. And so really, you need, a, 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 you'd need uh, to give a, a fully faithful account of the English. You, you'd need something that, that, uh, that dealt with, with that kind of uh, anaphora. But, but from the point of view of just getting a formalization that gets the, the right results, I think you can, have, you can have something like this, which says that w within, within this restricted range of uh, worlds, um, every case of E is a case of A, but not uh, C. And so you don't have to give such a clunky kind of formalization as I was giving in uh, the philosophy of uh, philosophy. And I mean, the reason, the reason that, that you can do this once you separate out the, the conditional and the modal aspects of the counterfactual conditional um, is because uh, that once, once you've got the box separated from the if part, uh, th there's room to stick a universal quantifier in between. Whereas what, what the, 
uh, kind of Lewis style uh, formalization does is it sort of glues together the conditional and the modal part. And so there's no room for a quantifier to come in between them. Um, and I think there are, there are various um, kinds of um, flexibility that, uh, that that sort of an analysis uh, gives you, um, which can be used to defend the sort of account that I gave against various uh, criticisms that uh, people made of what I said in Philosophy of Philosophy, where what was concerning them were cases um, where you might just be unlucky and um, the, it might be that you would, as it would, in some kind of uh, weird um, situation where the, the nearest cases, um, the nearest cases in which the um, antecedent was realized were, were, were kind of not abnormal ones which didn't work the way that you'd imagine them working and so on. And, um, and the, with the standard uh, semantics of the of, of Lewis style semantics for the the kind of factual uh, that 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 could you know, I mean there, there really is a danger of that happening. I mean I think you know I, I don't actually re regard these as very powerful objections, but I mean they, 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 there is an issue there. But I, and I think that to, if one works with a restricted necessity operator. Um, then, then things uh, th that gives you more flexibility because it may be that that the some of these abnormal worlds will just count as um, as contextually irrelevant, and that could even include the actual world for for reasons that I'll, I could explain in discussion. And then, and then we, in order for, to get this whole uh, thing to work, we, we, I mean that's basically how what the kind of analysis that you get of the the kind of factual conditional. If there were any, it would be an A but not C. And then uh, we also we we'll also need the restricted poss possibility of uh, there being an uh, an E, um, and um, and then um, in, in order for these two to react to interact properly, so that it's got to be not just not just barely possible that there's an E, but there's an E as it were, roughly speaking, that that in one of these contextually relevant worlds there's an E, and then. Uh, just by completely standard modal logic, you can get from these two, it's restrictedly possible that there's an A which is not a C. And, and then that, if it's restrictedly possible that there's an A but not a C, then it's also going to be unrestrictedly possible that there's an A but not a C. And, and that will refute the original uh, generalization. So, so the, the, on this uh, um, revised way of thinking about counterfactuals, you can you can get the uh, the argument that's kind of underlying these thought experiments uh, to work from a logical point of view. Okay, I've I actually spent a bit more time on on that than uh, than I intended uh, to, but but never mind. Um, so um, so now I'm I'm not I'm not going to be talking about the technical uh, issues uh, so much. I, I, I want to say something about um, the, all this in, in relation to um, what people sometimes call uh, philosophical uh, I intuitions. Um, and I mean, the, uh, this came up in discussion a bit yesterday, but I want, I want to say, uh, give a, a fuller discussion of it now. So the way that some people think that some things called philosophical intuitions come in here is they think that the, um, the judgment that uh, if there were an E, it would be an A but not uh, C. Um, you know, if, if there were a, a, a concrete example instantiating this story about the, the f smoke and so on, um, then it would be a case of justified true belief, but not, not knowledge or whatever. They think that that, is, that, that judgment is, uh, is based on a philosophical intuition. 
Um, and so, and then, and then, I mean, this is something that one one gets in a lot of the experimental philosophy. Uh, literature on thought experiments, that, that supposedly we've got, a, we're using a special method that involves reliance on philosophical intuitions. And then the question is raised, but what reason do we have to trust uh, philosophical uh, intuitions? Um, and it, it's not just the, the experimental philosophers who are thinking of things that, that way. It's, it's also true that many of the people that they're criticizing go, or, themselves go along with that way of thinking, that, that we're dealing with something called a philosophical uh, intuition. Um, and so I want to say a bit more about why I regard that as an utterly misleading way of thinking, of, uh, of thinking about these things. So one kind of um, case to, to um, consideration to take into account is that with these philosophical thought experiments, I mean, of course, some of them are very science fictional, and, you know, and there would, there's no chance of, of actually implementing them. But in, in many cases, including many of the controversial cases, um, these thought experiments are ones that we perfectly well could implement if we wanted to. I mean, it, you know, it, we, I mean, I mean the, 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 the Buddhist um, story with the fire and so on. I mean, you know, who knows? Maybe that really happened. Maybe this, that was inspired by a real life example. I mean, it didn't have to be, but it might have been. And, and even if it wasn't, you know, it would not be so difficult to, um, to set up uh, a case, you know, like that. I mean, if, you know, you'd have to prevent the, the, you'd have to make sure there were enough flies in the vicinity and, you know, have some nice, good smelling meat and, and manage to make the, the fire and not produce uh, any smoke and so on. But, you know, I mean, these don't seem like, you know, uh, unconquerable challenges. And, and, you know, make sure that there were people at a suitable distance and then you could question them about whether there was a fire over there, you know, and you could, you could, do, all, you could do all that. So that, the, that the, the fictional aspect of it um, is, is not uh, in principle essential. And you know anybody who's you know somebody who's a, who's a bit skeptical about the um, about the thought experiment. I mean, somebody who's thinking, yeah, but how do you you know people judge, or the people that we've we've tried it on, they judge that it's not a case of knowledge, but maybe they're getting that wrong. I mean, maybe you know um, maybe their their philosophical intuition is 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 screwing up in some way. Um, but remember, so we, we could, in principle, we could do this with a real life case. And it seems, and then we could ask people, look, does that, you know, who, people who've actually seen what was really going on, including that it was a you know, cloud of flies and so on. And we could ask them, well, look, does that guy who thinks that there's a fire over there on the basis of thinking that there's, um, there's a, a cloud of smoke, does he know that there's a fire over there? And uh, and then you know, it, uh, so we could we could we could do it as a real life case. And I think as somebody who's skeptical about the uh, about our judgments about the the kind of factual case, uh, presumably is going to be. And in practice, uh, this is the reaction I've got. Uh, um, have, uh, they're also skeptical about the judgment in the real life case. But the judgment in the real life case, it's just. Um, it's just a judgment of, of a completely ordinary empirical kind. It's just that guy doesn't know that there's a fire over there. Right? And you know, I mean, the fact that, that the judgment involves the term knowledge doesn't make it philosophical. I mean, people talk about knowledge all the time. It's one of the 10 most commonly used verbs in the English language. Um, and you know, and it, it's used in ordinary life all the time. And it's also used, but you know, by scientists a lot of the time, because, you know, because they say, well, you know, look, we, 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 we um, you know, we can't rely on that because we don't know that that experiment was done properly or whatever, whatever it happens uh, to be. So, um, the and so, you know, if if you uh, if you try to. Um, 
if, if you're skeptical about the thought, philosophical thought experiment, uh, and, and, and you, you think that they're based on some dodgy thing called philosophical intuitions, I think you're really forced to be, well, the reasonable thing to, to do is, you know, way of upholding that position is also to be skeptical about judgments about the real life cases. Uh, you know, because it would, I mean, somebody who was skeptical about the thought experiments and they said, all right, we'll do, we'll do a real life case. Um, you know, when we, when we, you know, we applied for some grant money to set up this, this fire and so on. And then we got some people, you know, some suckers to, to get, to, to, uh, to be uh, misled in this, this way. Uh, you know, it, it, that just seems like a complete waste of money, right? I mean, the the the, the, re, the, the, the real life case is no is no better than the than the than the thought experiment. So the the fictional aspect of it is not really relevant, and and so it would have to be that a whole lot of um, just very ordinary judgments about you know what's going on in our environment of you know of a, of a completely contingent. Um, a posteriori kind would also count as uh, philosophical uh, intuitions, and uh, actually, likewise with uh, thought experiments in moral philosophy. M many, many of which you know you could, in principle, uh, do. It's just, of course, you know, setting up trolleys so that you know either one person or five people get killed. Is you know, the, I mean, the, you know, there's a point on, on when you're applying for uh, you know for. A, a grant where you have to say whether there are ethical implications, and you might have to <laughs> tick the yes box for ethical implications. Um, but um, so so that's that's one kind of reason for for, for thinking that the idea that that there's a, there's something there's some special method that involves reliance on philosophical intuitions uh, is uh, is wrong. Um, I mean, there are there are various. Uh, we could also approach this from the the perspective of you know some attempt to say what counts as um, an intuition and what what makes an intuition uh, philosophical. So so I mean one one kind of uh, attempt that people might make to to say to characterize what they they mean by uh, an intuition is that it's something like a um, well. If, if we think of the the judgment itself, it would be a non-inferential judgment. I mean, people. I mean, people claim that these judgments are themselves uh, based on some intellectual seeming that things are so and so, and they think the intuition is the seeming rather than the judgment. But uh, for our purposes, that doesn't make, make very much difference, and I think I think it's actually a very very confused way of thinking about what's what's going uh, on. But um, but a anyway, um, the idea that 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 these involve something completely non uh, inferential is is actually a, a mistake. Uh, because, in fact, these judgments uh, do involve a certain amount of uh, inference. I mean, in fact, th th there are two kinds of step of uh, inference which are in, in involved in them. One, one is when, when you're thinking about these cases, roughly speaking, you, th you, know, you, you make the supposition that X is a case of E, and, and then on the basis of that, you, you, you judge that it is a case of A, for example, it is a case of justified true belief, and that it's not a case of C, it's not a case of knowledge. And in a, in a broad sense, uh, so, so E, remember, that could be the description of the particular example. In a broad sense, your judgments about it, that it's a case of uh, um, justified true belief but not a case of knowledge, they're, they're inferred from the, the original description. I mean, they may not be inferred by some purely logical process, but but uh, they, they are in a, in a. I mean, inference is meant to be a, a broader thing than just something that uh, involves purely logical uh, connections. So they so they're they're inferred in that sense from the original description of the uh, example, and uh, and then there's a further step of inference involved in 
in getting from uh, judgments. That we can even, uh, well, of course, there's an, uh, here there's another step of uh, conjunction introduction, which is, of course, is another rule of logic. And, and then there's a step of, of um, conditional proof, or if, if introduction or whatever, where you go from, from thinking it's a case of A but not a case of C, based on the supposition that it's a case of E, to the conditional. If it's a case of E, then it's a case of A and not a case of C. So that's another inferential step. So in fact, these are not non-inferential. So you know, if, if you were, uh, and the same, I mean, the, the, these, uh, there would be inference involved in the, you know, the intellectual seemings as well, however that they're, they're supposed to work. Uh, so the idea that these are something uh, non-inferential uh, um, is, is, is actually just a mistake. It's, it's missing some of the uh, logical uh, structure that's, uh, that's involved in these cases. I, there's another way of uh, thinking of intuitions, which I, I think is a bit closer to uh, the way that psychologists tend to you know, talk about some uh, judgments as being uh, intuitive, which is simply that uh, that they don't involve some kind of uh, conscious reasoning, um, and you know, and I think it, it's it's true that we kind of uh, jump to the conclusion, okay, you know, the, it, well, w without we're not re we're not really conscious of making these inferential steps that I described. I mean, uh, I mean, if we were conscious of them, people would be less inclined to make the mistake of thinking that there are, uh, that there are none of these intellectual steps uh, uh, involved. Um, and so it, it might be that some key judgment uh, here is being uh, made typically, you know, when we judge, it's not a case of knowledge, that we're not doing that on the basis of any conscious reasoning. I mean, we're kind of aware of the description of the case, and, and then we make the judgment, uh, it's not a case of knowledge. But, but the, uh, the, the the reason, we, we may often not be uh, consciously doing any uh, reasoning. Um, and, and so then you could, then you could say, uh, well, uh, it's, it's, uh, you know, it's an, intu it, it, an in the intuitive judgments are the ones that don't involve uh, conscious reasoning. And, and then you could, be, you could worry, oh, well, in philosophy, we're, ju we're basing um, you know, our arguments on intuitive uh, judgments and how, how do we know that we can rely on? I mean, the, whether they're philosophical or not, as I've said, it has, uh, does not really have to do with their content in, in most of these cases. It has to do with their connection with a specific philosophical theory. That, that's what makes them relevant. But in any case, I mean, the, if we think of the intuitive judgments as the, the ones that are not based on conscious reasoning, then the There is no scope for any sensible skepticism about reliance on uh, intuitive uh, judgments that doesn't lead to total skepticism, which is the last thing that people who the, the critics of uh, the use of thought experiments in philosophy have wanted, um, because all non-intuitive judgments are based on intuitive judgments because the, the, the non-intuitive judgments are the ones that are, um, are, are based on conscious reasoning. That's what makes them non-intuitive. And, and so, as it were, you know, when, when we do, you know, for example, a mathematical calculation, uh, the, the final result, it, that's a non-intuitive uh, judgment because it, it's based on conscious reasoning. But if you go back and look at the individual steps, the, um, the, they were there were judgments. The judgments that they were based. I mean, the component judgments um, are um, are not based on um, intuitive. Um, sorry, they're, they're not based on conscious uh, reasoning. Um, and, you know, e even 
2 plus 2 equals 4 isn't, I mean, it's not based on conscious uh, reason. So, so that, con I mean, conscious, anything that you get to by conscious reasoning also depends on things that you didn't get to by conscious reasoning. And, and so that, you know, the idea, we, well, we should only rely on stuff that we got to by conscious reasoning um, it, it, will, I mean, it, it, the, the problem is that, that everything also involves some uh, stuff that, that doesn't uh, involve conscious uh, reasoning because of the, the steps out of which the, uh, the conscious uh, reasoning is, is built. And, and, and so, there is, so the idea that we should be skeptical about everything that, that isn't um, based on uh, conscious reasoning uh, will just lead us into uh, a general skepticism. So that you know, if, if, we, uh, if we characterize uh, intuitions in that kind of way, then um, we're relying on intuitions all the time, uh, not just in philosophy, but in any kind of um, serious uh, thought at all, um, and and so we ha we have no uh, alternative but to do that. Right. So so that the the problem with the the critique of this method of supposedly of uh, reliance on philosophical intuitions is that it, that it hasn't actually def got a defined target um, th that corresponds to any kind of cognitive kind or anything like that, except one which is so broad that it, that it involves uh, general skepticism. Okay, I've slightly um, gone beyond the hour, so I'll stop now. Yeah, Bruno, would you mind chairing the, the, the discussion? Yeah. <laughs> okay. But these are experiments. They cannot all be implemented. Yep. Take zombies. Take twin earth. Then take the brain in a bath. It seems to me that there is no way you can implement them. Well, no, I mean, you could, I mean, present technology doesn't enable us to uh, implement the brain and the vat thing, but, you know, may, you know it's, it's not, who knows what would be possible, you know, 10,000 years from now. But, yeah, I mean, uh, but certainly with, with, the, uh, with the zombies, um, w whether we could I I implement, implement, the Twitter, certainly we have no present way of, of implementing them, um, yeah, of, of making real life cases of them. Yeah, so, so sorry, w w w was there a follow up to that? Uh, the follow up is that you, your claim is that they can be implemented in some kind of. Uh... Yeah, I wasn't saying that all thought experiments can be implemented, but the, but the, the I mean, the, the point I was making was this was in response. To, um, to critics of the method of thought experiments, um, who, and, and the, who are critic, I mean, they're not just critics about the, those kind of non-implementable uh, thought experiments. They're critics about the, uh, or they have been in the past, critics about all sorts of thought experiments which are which quite easy to implement. Yeah, but they, they lead me to believe that there might be some kind of intuition, philosophical intuition, that we have the ability to create these kind of experiments. They cannot be realized in any way. Yeah, but the, but the, point, the point I was making is that their, their skepticism does not depend on the fact that these are imaginary thought experiments. Because, there's, because in, the, in the cases where they could be implemented, they would be equally skeptical about the real life cases. And so that shows that, 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 that their skepticism um, is, is, not, is not really rooted in the 
uh, the fictional or imaginary aspect of these thought experiments because they're, they're committed and they're, and, they're, and you know people like I'm mean, talking about people like Stephen Stitch I mean they've been I've, you know when I've asked them about this they've been quite explicit that they would be skeptical about the uh, the results of uh, making these judgments ab you know about an implemented uh, real life thought experiment uh, so so I, I you know it, it, the this, this is just a, a matter of w w what the basis of their scepticism is. It's not really rooted in the fictional aspect of these thought experiments. I see. Um, so, I mean, it's true that there's an inference there, but I guess the, the philosopher who supports the, the idea that the intuitions are non-inferential judgments would say that the very first premise of that, of that inference is the non-inferential judgment, namely that that it's necessary in this restricted sense of necessity that for every um, exit so, and so on. That would be the only differential thing. Sorry, so which it's necessary that... No, the, the restricted necessity claim. Yeah, but, the, but there, this restricted necessity claim, what I'm saying is it's, it's actually based on um, a, a, a series... Of, uh, this, this is not... This isn't what you start with, right? Because, because uh, until the thought experiment is done, you haven't even, you never even thought about this case. So, so what, what you do is um, you, you, you suppose that there's a case of E. Um, you derive that it's A but not C, and then, then you use conjunction introduction to get this. Then you, then you use um, conditional proof to get if it's, E, then it's A, and uh, it's not C. Um, then, then you use um, universal uh, introduction to, to universally quantify it, and, and then you use um, a, I mean, I mean what, more would have to be said about what all these steps involve, but, but, but all these steps are required. And then you, um, you use uh, a, a step of uh, some kind of local necessitation uh, reasoning to, to get that. So, so that in order to, in order to get this, you've you've actually had to go through quite a, a complex uh, inferential process. But but it, but it may all have been done unconsciously. <laughs> I guess I didn't get this, the first part of this. You mean, sorry, is that saying that, that, you, that you don't follow what I, yeah. the, the, the claim that I meant now make? So you don't, I mean, the, the, the claim that I'm making is that, that I mean, this is, all I'm talking, I mean, what I'm doing is describing how, how, would, how would one reason to, you know, a complex conclusion of this form. And, um, you know, it just it, it, in some st standard logical system, it, um, You've, you suppose that um, you know, a given x, or, or may, you might do it with arbitrary names, is, is E. And, uh, and then you draw these conclusions by, ab about the properties of x, that you know, it's justified true belief, it's not knowledge, or whatever. I mean, that, that's, that's how you argue for, um, for universal generalizations, is by uh, working through an instance, and then, and then um, universally generalizing and um, and I mean this uh, and this isn't just a kind of projection of what we do in natural deduction onto human reasoning it's, it's also the case that I mean this is something I, I haven't said much about but but the, but the normal human way of assessing a, an, a conditional you know if x then then y is by supposing x and then making a judgment on the basis of that supposition of y and um, and so th so that um, th this the way the way in which we got to the um, the conditional from you know starting with a supposition and making judgments on the uh, uh, under that supposition uh, is exactly the, the standard human way of assessing conditionals. So that. Um, so all, all, so all of that, that process has to go on in order that we finally end up with uh, the, the, the 
restricted, strict con conditional. And I mean, and I, I, you know, I don't see w what the what an alternative proposal would be as to how we get there. I mean, you you can't. I mean. I mean, it might be that, that you, you kind of, that at the conscious level, it just feels like you're eyeball, eyeballing it and so on. But, you know, if, if we actually break that down into the steps that are required to, you know, what you have to recognize in order to assent to this, it, it, it's going to look something like this. Okay, yeah, um, I think we've probably discussed this before at some point, but there was, a, um, there was something about the your reconstruction of Gettier and uh, other similar thought experiments in, in the philosophy of philosophy that I didn't find that all that plausible, and I think the the new and improved version doesn't clearly do much better. So the original thing was uh, well, what you wrote down it was that you know if, if there were a, a Gettier case, then um, it would be that anything that is a Gettier case would it, it is a yes. case of blah, blah, blah. Okay. And now you've got this restricted uh, kind of, uh, you, you've got your restricted strict conditionals and you throw a universal quantifier in there. I think yeah. that has the same problem. I think it's too strong. Here's, can, can you yeah, but remember that I, this, this universal quantifier can also be restricted. Oh, no, I understand that. Yes. But, but, but can you just tell me what's wrong with the following? So here, here's Oh, I see. With it, yes. Then, if if there were a Getty case, there would be a case of just. You know, Yes. So that's it's not exactly the same, but it's that's a, that's it's sort of a, a little bit like uh, the pr proposal that Anna Sarah M Malmgren has has made. Where, um, it, but I, I think the it's it, it's weaker, but um, it doesn't. It doesn't correspond to the the natural way of thinking about thought experiments. I mean, what one I mean, one way of um, of putting it is like this: that that when when we have a thought exp experiment, um, we you know we, we describe the scenario and then we say so would 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 that be a case of knowledge? And, um, and if one person says yes and the, another person says no, it seems that it would be, a, let's, say, let's say the other person says it would be a case of, no, of, uh, of knowledge and the other person says it would be a case of non-knowledge. Then, um, then on your, I mean, it seems that, that those people are disagreeing with each other about the scenario. One of them... But on your reconstruction, there would be no dis uh, disagreement because because one of them would be saying if the if there were a Gettier case, there would be a, a case of justified true belief no, without knowledge. That's right because I mean you can also reconstruct this kind of uh, discussion as taking place in the context of counterfactual suppositional reasoning, where you suppose oh there's such and such a scenario, and then you develop that scenario uh, you know, uh, in your imagination. See if it leads to you to conclude that it is a case of JTP without K, right? And people might, and, and several people can take part in this activity, and they can disagree about what, what the outcome is. But the the thing is, if if you're if you're doing it by this in this suppositional way, then you you're doing it in a way. Which um, does, in fact, lead to the the stronger version that I'm saying with the the universal um, 
quantifier, and so on. I mean, you, 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 could, you could, in principle, as it were, have an attack uh, halfway through of cold feet and, and just um, water, you could water down the conclusion. You know, not, not based on uh, what, as it were, rough, what, roughly what you're entitled to, to claim on the basis of the, the thought experiment, but, but just based on, on kind of, you know, I'll, I'll, all right, I'll water it down, you know, because I'm, then I'm less likely to be making a mistake. Um, I mean, you, you could do that, but, um, but it, wouldn't, it wouldn't be uh, a case of, I mean, it wouldn't actually um, give you any, any serious prospect of, uh, of achieving knowledge where the other person didn't. I mean, it would be like, uh, it would be like saying, I mean, suppose, you know, we, we you know, we saw, we saw somebody who looked like a policeman. I mean, you know, and we could, we could make the, so we make the, you know, we, we're thinking he's a policeman and then, and so we, then we, we, so we could make the judgment, um, He's a policeman, but we could more cautiously just make the judgment: there's a policeman over there, and we might, and we might. Um, it's possible that there's a, that, that this guy is only an actor dressed as a policeman, and that there is a policeman over there that we haven't seen, and so on. But I mean, it's not as though if this the guy that we could see uh, isn't a policeman, that we that we know that there's a policeman over there, right? So that it's, um, and you know, and it's this is, I mean, w what you're describing is is not. It seems to me a description of what naturally happens when people think through uh, thought experiments. Uh, but I mean, but if you know, I mean, if if all you're saying is, well, look, he, look here's 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 a um, a weaker conclusion that that you could um, you could uh, put forward with, with, and without endorsing the stronger one, even though the the, the actual intellectual process that you've uh, that you've gone through is one that, will, that will, in fact leads to the stronger conclusion. I mean, you, you, you could, as I say, have an attack of cold feet at, at that point, but it's not, but it, that's not a, um, a description of what actually goes on normally in thought experiments. And it's not, it, it doesn't really seem that uh, there's, a, there's any uh, great intellectual advantage in, you know, in just you know, putting forward a slightly weaker claim for the sake of it, but you know, but, I mean, it's you know, it's um, I mean, it's often it's often the case that um, that you know we could we could get away with making slightly weaker claims in, a, in an argument uh, th than the claims that we do make, and 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 if we made the weaker claims and still got to the con the conclusion that then you know then uh, there's a kind of the, the, that may slightly reduce the risk of. Error, but where the actual support that we have is support basically for the stronger claim. I, you know, I, I don't see there's much to be gained by this kind of, of watering down. I just have a mini question. A tiny mini. Tiny mini. So, so this restricted thing you said, it could be restricted in such a way that uh, the actual world isn't uh, accessible yes. to itself, and then you don't have counterfactual modes of Yes, I know. Uh, so, so, yeah, I, I, I mean, so I think that. Um, I think this is an, a natural outcome of this view because when we're talking about what would be the you know what would be the case, n not just with conditionals, but in general, what would be the case, we uh, we may well be talking uh, um, under various restrictions that come from you know let's say some kind of um, scenario that we've been considering or whatever, uh, which which are counterfactual and we're, and, and that we're, so we're restricted uh, to this uh, this case and. Uh, and you know there may not be any natural antecedent that we can use. We're just we're, it's just we're focusing on a, a you know a, some kind of counterfactual scenario, and we're talking about would yeah, and we could say yeah he would be scared or something um, there, and, which is not a it's it's not a conditional you know it's it's not a, and and the he would be scared does not entail he is scared right I mean this could be a scenario where what you know how how, how are people going to react to you know. Um, you know, we think we, we've got a, we, we've been telling a story which involves a tiger coming into the room and so on, and, and you know, we but can it's say. It's awfully hard to come up with counterexamples to counterfactual ones. Both. I mean, there's something special about contexts in which we use wood in a conditional that makes 
those not good. But I mean, so it, you know, it could be that, that if we were if we were talking about um, so he he would be scared. Um, Let's, um, that, that actually, on the kind of analysis that I'm um, talking about, that would, would give us, you know, he, um, he would be, he would, would be scared um, if he were wearing a blue shirt. Right. So if, if, if he, we're talking about this, you know, this imaginary scenario where a tiger enters the room, he would be scared, he'd be scared if I, I as well, even if he were wearing a green, sh a blue shirt. Um, and so, so it, which of course is if he were wearing a blue shirt, he would be scared. Um, he is wearing a blue shirt, therefore he is scared. That's not an instance of what people call counterfactual most forms because the, the, the non-conditional premise can't have a wood in it. That's what I'm talking about. Sorry? If, if, this is... If, no, no, the, uh, this, isn't, this is not the, the premise. The, the, the conditional is if he, were, yeah. if he were wearing a blue shirt, he would be scared. He is wearing a blue shirt. Okay. Um, therefore, he is scared. I mean, supposing that he is, is me, right? So, so that um, if, it, you know, it could be true that, you know, when, when the, the relevant, um, the contextually relevant possible worlds are ones in which a tiger enters the room. It's true that if you were wearing a blue shirt, he would be scared. Um, I, yeah, and it's also true that, that he is wearing, I mean, I am wearing a blue shirt, but it's not true that I'm scared. So that, you know, I, I, think, I think that once, w once you know w where to look for these counterexamples to counterfactual by dispensers, they're actually very easy to find. And you know, I think people people have been because they haven't been thinking about the, the wood in the right way. I think they just haven't been they haven't been haven't known where to look. But they're they're there. Your book on conditional is going to be very interesting. Yeah. <laughs> so the the final objective of the, the formulating the thought experiments, like the the underneath logic of the thought experiment, was to kind of establish a case for this metaphysical claim that it's possible that there exists uh, the X and blah, blah, blah. Yes, yes. And uh, so you, some of the accounts, like former accounts, you, you, you argue that they're not uh, good accounts of like the formal uh, yes. structure of, and uh, the, 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 the one in, in philosophy, philosophy for, for other reasons, but, but I'm not talking about them. So, but the, the, the reason, I think, I mean, if I understood correctly, the, the fact that this account of restricted uh, necessity and possibility that you're making is kind of motivated by, inspired by the um, different semantics of wood within in, in, yeah. uh, like natural languages and so on. So would it be like a right call to kind of, because the final judgment that we're going to establish is a metaphysical one, but now we're using some linguistic evidence. So we are basically reading off uh, the, the metaphysics of, uh, from, from our semantics. So, so is it, is it... Well, it's not just from the semantics, because, because we're also... Um, what, 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 I'm, what I'm doing, I mean, the, the, the semantics by, by itself doesn't tell you what is possible or what is not possible. Um, it, it, 
all, all it does is enable you to, um, roughly speaking, to to give a, a you know a, a good account of the, as we might loosely say, the logical form of these sentences, and uh, and then the. Uh, once we have their logical form, we can we, that that t guides us as to you know what uh, what logical uh, inferences can be can be made in involving them. But um, but I mean it, it's not this it, it's not the semantics that that for example that that tells us that it is restrictedly possible that there is an example of this kind that an ex you know example of this kind is realized, and it's not the semantics. That tells us that um, the uh, that this that this conditional uh, is it, true. I mean, if there were any, it would be enabled on a C. It's, what what the semantics is doing is just enabling us to see how these different bits fit together and you know and generate the the conclusion which is gen which is genuinely inconsistent with the original theory, right? So so I mean I, don't, I mean this, I, I'm not I'm not suggesting that you can do. M metaphysics just by by thinking about semantics. It's it's simply that uh, when you do, you know in getting to metaphysical conclusions, you have to you, you often have to do some reasoning, and the semantics is a it helps us understand what reasoning is valid. So if what you're saying is that the semantics is kind of employed to in order for us to figure out what's the logical structure. But but it's still okay. Still, I have the same question. So, what else than than the semantics is going to? Because basically, we are. I mean, the, the, the last line on the board is going to entail the, the metaphysical possibility that we wanted to at the, at the first. Yes. Place, right? Yes. And all that is uh, entailed from the formal lines, which is which was motivated. Again. No, but, the, but these the, these two judgments here, these these two premises of, of, that something something here is restrictedly necessary and something is restrictedly possible, the the the, the kind of logical form of them uh, is um, is motivated by the semantics, but um, I mean the the analysis of that logical form, but the actual substantive judgments. That you know, if there were an example of this kind, it would be a case of, uh, of I mean, not necessarily you know, or, or, or restrictively necessary. Any, any example of this kind is a case of justified true belief and not a case of knowledge. I mean, that's that's not, the, the semantics doesn't tell you anything about that. The semantic, the, I mean, the semantics that I've been talking about doesn't tell you what, what, what you know whether e, e is a good get here case or not. I mean, that, that that's based on a a judgment that we make by um, imaginatively processing the, this um, this scenario described by E. Right, but, but, but still, uh, the, so so the semantics is is, is used for, for the logical structure. Yes. Yeah, but but still, is that is that okay? I mean, uh, I mean, do we, for example, we like material conditional or disjunction in 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 like, like propos propositional logic that we have. It's not totally, for example, uh, inspired by by what, what we have in natural languages, right? Yeah. So, so what? So one thing I should I should say here is the the kind of analysis I'm now giving is based on a an account of conditionals which I've been working on uh, uh, over the last few months, which is I, I, I certainly I would admit is a highly controversial account of, of conditionals. Um, but um, and it, I mean it is, but it's certainly one that I am w willing to to defend. Um, but you know, but I but I mean these have mainly not been lectures on conditionals. But um, so I, I, I'm not I, I'm not suggesting that you know that, that everybody is going to accept this analysis of the English um, English counterfactual uh, conditionals. So, you know, so I you know. It, I, Sure, I could be wrong about the logical form, and I mean, uh, the thing is, it, my general account doesn't really depend on these, uh, uh, on this, the specifics of what I've been saying today about the logical 
uh, form because you know I mean after all in philosophy of philosophy I had a different view of the logical form and you know and I and I gave a, you know a somewhat similar I mean an account that's very similar in spirit but it's different in in detail but 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 what I would say is it, it, on the account that I'm giving the the English conditional if is a material conditional it's it's not it's not just that it's a, a you know that, that we can replace it by a material conditional it actually is a material conditional but I, I agree. there is there are certainly lots of weighty reasons why people have not accepted that conclusion and you know and I think it takes a hell of a lot of argumentation you know actually to b back it up but I'm I, you know I, since I didn't I didn't just want to do a kind of uh, a rehash of things that, that I said in, in philosophy of philosophy so I, I thought I would tell you what my my most recent thinking of, of, of is but I yeah I, I I don't want to pretend that it's anything other than super controversial. <laughs> oh, the longest arm. <laughs> you, you had the best question. <laughs> Very simple. Um, yesterday I asked you about philosophical intuitions. And yes. At the end I asked you if we could do without the theory of philosophical intuitions, and you said yes. But today you have mentioned uh, broadly uh, intuitions. So should we should do without the category of philosophical intuitions and just appeal to them as intuitions? Yeah, but I mean, if you, but yeah, but if if you listened to to the the kind of uh, so I, I mean psychologists psychologists talk about it, intuitive judgments, right? So that I, and you know, and I don't want to tell the psychologists they're not allowed to do that. But when you actually look at the category of intuitive judgments, it's uh, as they understand it, it's vastly wider than the category of of intuitions uh, as philosophers talk about them. Okay. So I mean, the it, it, you know, in the sense, for example, my judgment that you're sitting over there is an intuitive judgment, right? Because it's not based on conscious reasoning. It's, you know. Yeah. yeah, but I mean, but it, but the but the the the, the intuitive non-intuitive distinction, uh, as used by psychologists, is uh, is just to do with whether it, roughly speaking, whether whether it, conscious reasoning is involved, and there isn't, and and so perceptual judgments on on that way of draw, drawing the line will count as intuitive. Right. So, so this is not, the, you know, this is not a vindication of, you know, I intuitions as philosophers have talked about them, which, which is meant to be, you know, a, a much more special and kind of philosophical feeling category. It's, it's nothing like that. It's, it's just, it's, it, it's uh, I mean, most of our judgments count as, as intuitive by, by this categorization. And so, you know, if you want to talk the way the psychologists talk, you can, but it, that's not, that's not the way that philosophers who've been talking about intuitions have been using the term. Okay, so what's the relation between uh, common, uh, common sense and uh, intuitive knowledge? Um, common sense and intuitive knowledge. Well, I intuitive, uh, intuitive knowledge um, is, is, a much, is a much wider uh, ca category because, you, I mean, you might, um, you might know something. I mean, so supposing, for example, that you know, in a society where slavery is a generally accepted institution, one person has, a, a, you know, uh, has, let's say, in some sense, a deeper understanding of morality than others, and, and one person, um, just, w w but not based on any conscious reasoning, but just on, based on a, you know, their refined sense of moral revulsion. You know, that, that m slavery is wrong. So that, that that might well be a piece of moral knowledge, and it would be un, uh, it would count as intuitive because it's uh, not based on conscious reasoning, but it certainly wouldn't be common sense in that society because most people in that society think that that, that slavery is not wrong. So, common sense would be like established intuitive knowledge. Um, culturally yeah, but it, but it might also it might also be that. I mean, common sense might include a bit of, of, of conscious reasoning, right? I mean, so, you know, it, um, you know I think in our society, it, we, we, might, we might well judge, you know, that, that it's, 
you know, it's, um, it might be a piece of common sense knowledge that, that 19 plus 17 equals 36. But, you know, that's, uh, but people get there by, by, con by conscious reasoning. I mean, they, they, they do the, the calculation in, in, their, in their heads. But it it's might, still might be um, common sense knowledge because it's, you know, sufficiently widely shared in our society. Right, well, I'll, I'll pick up from where I left off uh, uh, this, this morning. Um, so the kind of uh, role for thought experiments that I've been discussing is, um, is one in uh, relation to the assessment of uh, philosophical uh, theories. Um, and in particular, um, that thought experiments can be a way of uh, eliciting uh, counterexamples uh, to, to such uh, theories. Um, and so, of course, I, I, I've been, been talking about that. I've, I've been as, assuming uh, that, that philosophy is a, uh, a discipline that is concerned to uh, produce and uh, evaluate uh, theories. And, and I gave some re reasons uh, yesterday for uh, why that's so. But uh, perhaps at a more fundamental le level, um, the thing to say is simply that, um, I mean, in philosophy, we're asking, uh, we're asking questions. I mean, I was talking about that. Uh, yesterday morning as well, that you know, you know, questions like you know, what is time, what is justice, what is knowledge, and so on. And, um, and the appropriate way to uh, answer such questions is by, I mean, the, that's where the form of the answer is going to be some kind of philosophical theory of the, uh, the thing that we're, uh, we're asking about. Um, and, and then... Um, Thought experiments uh, play a uh, a role in the evaluation of such theories, particularly given that the, the theories are meant to be not simply um, universal generalizations that might be accidentally true, but but ones which which have uh, some kind uh, of uh, necessity. Um, and uh, I mean, this this morning I was arguing that there that there isn't really any. Uh, general problem in principle about uh, thought uh, experiments that that there uh, that the kind the sort of reasons for skepticism about them uh, would just generalize into reasons for uh, a, you know a much more um, devastating kind of skepticism that that pretty much everybody uh, in this debate wants to uh, avoid. Um, but I, I'm not. I'm not going to discuss uh, now the, 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 in particular, the issues to, specific to the uh, experimental philosophers' uh, critique of uh, thought experiments. Although, I mean, you're welcome to raise those in uh, discussion. But uh, one w one issue which experimental philosophers have raised, although which doesn't really depend on, on um, the experimental philosophy uh, approach, ab about the, the use of thought experiments, which I think it is worth uh, taking seriously, and although it's a quite general one, and, um, and it, it really has to to do with the the way in which, uh, as so far described, the the kind of methodology that we're concerned with is something rather similar to a, a sort of uh, a, a naive version of Karl Popper's uh, falsificationism, where uh, we, we simply have these theories which are universal generalizations, and then we test them by trying to uh, produce uh, counterexamples. And um, w w one concern about such a, a methodology, although, I mean, obviously, in principle, there's something 
uh, to that, and there's, there's nothing just as we're straightforwardly vicious about such a methodology. But it's um, a phenomenon which um, some experimental philosophers and others have, have called error uh, fragility. Um, uh, and what they, what they mean is this, that a method is error fragile if um, as, well, one mistake can lead to uh, er errors which don't get corrected. And you know, if you think about an, as well, a naive falsificationism, that is an error fragile method in the sense that you know, it, it, if, you, if you have a, a universal generalization, we, never mind about the necessity aspect of it, and, and then uh, you, you know, suppose that you reckon you've uh, re refuted it with, with a counterexample, you know, all Fs are Gs, and you think you've found an F which isn't G. Um, and, you know, if the methodology is that once you find a counterexample, you simply dis you dismiss that theory. So fal al although verification isn't uh, conclusive, falsification is. So that, as well, what, once you've got, got this far, then that... Uh, that theory is just off the uh, the table. Uh, the, the the danger is that if you make any mistakes at the observational level, if we're thinking of this in this kind of naive way, where where you do, where the the counterexamples are things that you just observe, and we, we, you know, putting aside issues about the, whatever theories you might need uh, in in actually making the observation. Um, then if you make any mistakes in your observation, you might end up dismissing a true theory on the basis of that mistake and, and never coming back to the true uh, theory. Um, and you know, even, even if we you know, insist that experiments be uh, repeatable, uh, you know, if, there's still some kind of danger here because, you know, if there's something, let's say, wrong with the the, the experimental design or, or whatever, so that or there's or there's some kind of systematic error in your observations, not just uh, you know some random accidental error that might happen once, then um, you. You know, even you may just go on repeating the same error, and and the the, the theory may be off the uh, off the table, and uh, and so that's that kind of methodology is is not very uh, robust. Right? Um, it's because you know, although in general your, your observational methods may be fine, it, it's it's inevitable because we're human beings that sometimes we're going to make observational. Errors and the same kind of issue arises in principle for the the sort of use that is made of uh, thought experiments, even in contemporary uh, philosophy. I mean, if if you th if you think about the, for example, the methodology of um, a lot of contemporary epistemology or contemporary analytic moral philosophy. Um, it does involve theories, of, uh, uh, I mean, in the, in the epistemology case, often uh, attempted analyses of knowledge or something, they're, 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 but, but there can be other kinds of theories as, as well, being dismissed on the basis of a, a, a single thought experiment. Um, that is that is taken to um, to have a, a negative uh, result for the for the theory, and of course, I mean in a sense what we have here, uh, as in the scientific case, we, we have repeatability because this is this is a thought experiment that, as it were, each person in a way does for themselves. I mean, you, you people do individually think through the thought experiments, but uh, I mean, for example, if there was some kind of bias in the human cognitive system, it, it could be that you know, it, this would be, uh, we, would we would get um, repeatedly 
uh, that people gave a certain answer to, you know, to, to the crucial question in the thought experiment, like, is this a case of knowledge or whatever, that we would repeatedly uh, get a certain answer. But you know, if that answer was wrong because of some uh, general human bi bias, then, then we might end up dismissing a, a true theory um, on the basis of this one thought experiment, and, and never really coming back to that theory. And you know, if you look, if you look at the way that contemporary um, epistemology is done, that that pretty much is the methodology, right? It, it, that that uh, you know, as, as long as people agree on the outcome of uh, a thought experiment, if it's negative, then that's the end of that theory. Um, and and so this is a a, a somewhat error fragile approach um, and and so what that suggests is that we we do need a a more uh, robust uh, methodology um, than than this kind of naive uh, falsificationism by uh, by thought experiments uh, it, so that that we have some uh, opportunity, uh, as it were, built into the methodology to 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 correct our, our mistakes, um, and I think that that suggests that we need a, a more sophisticated conception of how theories are to be uh, assessed than than we we have with the the falsificationist uh, model. Uh, and so that's that's what I'm going to be uh, talking ab about uh, today, and you know, and I and I take it that the the kind of um, model that that for a theory uh, assessment that we need is is one which is in principle already uh, available um, in the natural sciences and elsewhere, as as our philosophers have. Uh, un understood them um, in you know in what's known as an uh, abductive uh, methodology or uh, as as one might say um, it, an inference to the the, the best uh, explanation um, where theories theories are um, they're, not, they're not simply um, tested in isolation and then either kept on the table or dismissed, um, but they're, um, they're, they're compared with each other. And what we're, what we're concerned to do is to, uh, to find the, the, the theory that, that does best by the abductive criteria, which I'll, I'll talk about in, in a little bit. Um, Rather than, as it were, all or nothing uh, compar uh, assessments of uh, individual theories taken uh, in in isolation, um, and these these assessments may be ones uh, on which, uh, as it were, no no theory comes out um, as um, you know as perfect. Uh, but but some some do better than than others, and um, and I th I think a, a methodology of of this kind is is one on uh, on on which uh, as well an apparent failure of uh, fit with uh, thought experiments uh, does get weighed against other considerations uh, in in a, a manner that. Allows us to uh, to have a more robust uh, and reliable uh, methodology. Right. Um, so, so I want to say something ab about this abductive uh, methodology or inference to the best uh, explanation, and it, in particular to uh, to focus on on ways in which one, as long as we understand it. Um, in a sufficiently abstract way, we can see that this methodology is just as relevant to the assessment of philosophical theories as to the assessment of theories in uh, natural uh, science. Um, 
So perhaps if I start off by talking about inference to the, the best uh, explanation, I mean, that's, that may already raise this kind of, of challenge um, because the, I mean, the, the general picture in inference to the best explanation is that we, that we have a, uh, a body of evidence and, and then w we have various uh, theories um, competing with, with each other um, to, to provide an explanation of the, uh, of the evidence. And, um, and then the, 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 the one which gives the, the best explanation is, is the, the theory that we, that we uh, prefer. I mean, of course, th th these assessments, you know, as new evidence comes in and maybe as new theories are thought of, these, these assessments may, may change. But that's roughly what we're doing. And, and of course, an initial challenge uh, to that is, is the thought which has been uh, articulated by some philosophers, for example, Peter van Enwagen, that, that uh, philosophical theories aren't really in the business of providing explanations at all. Um, and I mean, I think that that, that claim re is really only plausible if one uh, understands the notion of explanation in an excessively narrow way. I mean, I I if you think of explanation as something like causal explanation, giving the, you know, the, the, the causes of uh, some event, then of course it's true that philosophical theories uh, are not at all designed to provide uh, causal uh, explanations. But, uh, but that picture of what uh, explanation is, is, t is much too narrow. I mean, it's, it's too narrow um, even uh, for the, the natural sciences. So that, for example, you know, w w one way in which a sort of cartoon history of science, uh, in which um, Newton's um, mechanics was supposed to advance on previous theories was that it, it unified um, terrestrial and celestial mechanics, which up to that point uh, had been treated uh, separately from each other, whereas he, Newton prov provided a set of laws which, which would explain b both the uh, what was going on in, in, the, in celestial mechanics, in, in astronomy, and uh, in terrestrial uh, mechanics. Um, you know, bodies on inclined planes and that kind of uh, thing. And, and that, was, that was not really, I mean, Newton wasn't really, it's not you know, a causal explanation of a particular event. It's really a more general set of uh, laws uh, explaining um, some more specific laws, which could be d derived from them, you know, as it were, by by, specif by specializing these more general laws to particular c cases uh, of of interest, um, and I think once we have that more general conception of explanation as the as as, as, as with where what can be explained may themselves be generalizations or uh, various kinds of perhaps other sorts of um, data, but where the explanation you know, is not a causal one, but rather takes the form of some kind of illuminating, uh, um, unifying uh, account, which you know, en enables us to, to uh, understand how these different uh, data are connected with each other and, and so on. Then uh, it, th that is a kind of explanation which, in, in principle, uh, is applicable to, to philosophical uh, theories as well. Um, and, and, but if, you know, we, we could also put this at, uh, in a more abstract way without using the notion of uh, explanation, where, the, roughly speaking, it, when we're comparing uh, theories in the, in the general abductive way, what we're, what we're doing is we're, we're comparing them on a, a sort of bunch of criteria which uh, include both uh, the, their, their fit with the evidence, but also um, how simple and elegant uh, these, these theories uh, are and um, 
and how, how strong they are in the sense of how, how informative, how, how general they are. And, we, and these, are, these are all things that, uh, as it were, are uh, virtues in a theory. And we're, we're, and we're looking for a theory which has the, the, um, the best combination uh, of uh, these kinds of, of virtue. And, and so, the, as it were, that's a, a, a more general way of thinking about what we're, uh, what we're doing. And, um, uh, and once we put things in that sort of uh, way, th there's, there's no reason why philosophical uh, theories should not be judged by ex the same kind of uh, criteria as um, the, the theories in natural science. And, you know, it, it, and in particular, I think if, you know, if we're going to um, achieve the kind of robustness and, and avoid the sort of error fragility that I was talking about at the beginning, um, then, um, then you know, if, we, if we only regard fit with the evidence as you know, w one of the criteria uh, which, to s where, um, which can, can to some extent be weighed against the other criteria that we're judging by, then we're not automatically going to uh, dismiss um, uh, you know, a theory that does badly by you know, one thought experiment you know, on the ground is just, it's just refuted. I mean, of course, the, the, I mean, we ha th these things are tricky because uh, if, the, if the result of the thought experiment is in fact correct and knowledgeable, then, um, then the you know as, as it were if if we if if it really is a case where we know that uh, F A and not G A, then uh, then uh, those are true, and so any theory which is incompatible with them uh, is false. Um, but but at the same time, you know we we. we we need a methodology which takes into account the fact that we're quite fallible in uh, judging what is part of our evidence and what isn't, and th that will, as it were, be some kind of guide you know, th that will work even you know, under realistic conditions where we are making mistakes from, from time to time. And, uh, and this, this sort of abductive methodology uh, will do that because it may be that you know, a, certain, a certain theory... Um, that is extremely uh, informative and, uh, and simple and elegant, and maybe it has quite a good fit with a whole mass of data. Uh, but, but there's one particular thought experiment where it gives what we've been judging to be the wrong result, then uh, the, the, you know, given how, how the strength of its abductive virtues Overall, that's the abductive methodology is pushing us to think. Well, we may have made a mistake in our observations, and it may be that something that we're taking uh, to to be a, a refuting evidence is in fact uh, based on a mistake. By the way, um, I've been talking as though the the, the only kind of um, data that that we that we had to um, to deal with uh, here was provided by uh, thought experiments. But I, I just want to emphasize, but, but not for the time being, go, in, in, go into details, that, uh, that I, I, nothing that I'm saying depends on the idea that thought experiments are our only or main source of evidence in philosophy. I think that, that uh, uh, well, as I said, Yesterday, in in fact, whatever we know is uh, is evidence in philosophy, and and so uh, you know I don't want to give a, 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 as a word, an exclusive position to thought experiments, but that's but one particular source of uh, data that that I, um, I have been explaining this morning. So um, so this this is meant to be something that where we ha we can have a much wider uh, range of. Um, of data. I mean, so for example, you know, I would take it that, you know, in let's say political philosophy, um, where 
political philosophy, I mean, involves um, the, the consequences of very, very complex uh, social and political uh, arrangements that, um, that the, the method of thought experiments might not give us such relevant data in that case. And maybe in that case, we, we get better data for the purposes of political philosophy from looking at actual human history that, than from do, doing thought experiments in many cases. I'm not, I'm not saying that thought experiments have nothing to contribute. You know, may, maybe the, you know, Rawls's uh, veil of ignorance and so on. But, but one might think that actually a lot of the relevant data comes from history. So, so I, you know, I want to be quite liberal about what can count as uh, evidence. Now, I, I think you know, a natural concern, or in, in some people's case, maybe even hope, um, given what I've, I've said, is that if we're thinking of uh, philosophy as a theoretical discipline which uses an abductive methodology uh, to assess theories, that the effect of that is going to be to uh, assimilate philosophical theories to theories in natural science and the philosophical method to the method of uh, natural uh, science. Um, and so that as we're, we, we'll get some kind of naturalization of philosophy, uh, not just in the sense of understanding how philosophy is the kind of thing that can rationally be done by, by human beings with the kind of nature that we have, but you know, in a much more extreme sense of, as it were, uh, pushing philosophy uh, toward much closer to the natural sciences than it, it has been. And um, so I want, to, I want to say something about why I think that is a, a, an illegitimate uh, assumption, but why the, uh, applying an abductive methodology does not have to involve the assimilation of philosophy to a natural science. Um, and I, I think maybe the best way of making this point is b by considering the cases of uh, logic and mathematics. And of course, since these are the Frege lectures, you know, I sh we should mention the possibility that maybe mathematics basically just is uh, uh, logic. So, uh, um, so that, that might, maybe that, after all, that's only one subject. But for my purposes, it doesn't matter whether we think of logic and mathematics as, as two things or, or one. Um, because I, I think it, it's it, arguable that both logic and, and mathematics also involve uh, abductive uh, theory comparison, even though they're manifestly not at all like natural uh, sciences. Now, w w that might seem like a kind of a crazy claim because uh, after all, logic and mathematics, I mean, what, what the most obvious thing about them is the, um, the central role that proof plays in them. And proof is a deductive, not an abductive um, method. Uh, so well, the, the, the truth of the uh, premises guarantees, in some sense, the truth of the uh, conclusion with deduction, and certainly doesn't with uh, abduction. Abduction can lead from, from truth to, to falsehood when things go badly. Um, and so you might think, well, surely, uh, Logic and uh, mathematics are classic examples of non-abductive disciplines. But I, I think what, you, what one needs to remember is that the uh, epistemology of logic and mathematics um, depends not, uh, not only on uh, the on the proofs of theorems, but on the epistemology of the, the first principles of logic and mathematics, so the things that we accept uh, without proof. Um, I mean, these may be, in the case of mathematics, these may be axioms of uh, set theory, the case that I was mentioning 
um, briefly that yesterday, uh, or they, in the case of logic, these, these may be uh, rules of inference, like uh, modus ponens, though not for the um, subjunctive conditional, uh, um, and, and so on. Um, and what I want to suggest is that the, um, the assessment of first principles of logic and mathematics is and should be done in an abductive uh, way. This is already a, uh, a suggestion that, that was m made, or I mean, uh, some, was an assertion that was made by uh, Bertrand Russell at the beginning of the, the 20th century. I mean, you, you know, I think the, the kind of conventional picture of Russell is uh, as someone who, um, who wanted to, to put mathematics on um, a foundation of absolute certainty you know, by, by uh, deriving it from, from logic and as we remove any doubt whatsoever about mathematical uh, principles. And I mean, maybe he, he did sort of start out like that. But I think uh, relatively early on in uh, his, uh, his work, uh, he came to the, uh, the conclusion that, that at, the, at the level of the, the foundations of mathematics, w what we're doing is proceeding um, from, from, from data to general principles from which we can derive that, the data. Uh, so as we're, if, you know, if from the if we're going in the reverse direction from uh, deduction, and so um, and the, the data that he was thinking about was was primarily mathematical uh, data. So that as we we've we've got uh, we start off um, knowing a lot of sort of well, as he would think of it mid level mathematics. Just I mean stuff like you know. 19 plus 17 equals 36, and, uh, and those kind of things. And, and uh, of course, more than that, we, knowing various you know, significant uh, theorems of uh, mathematics. Uh, but th theorems just proved you know, by, by mathematically uh, compelling arguments, but not ones proved from absolutely first principles. Uh, and then he, he thought of the, the logicist uh, project as, as one in which w we were searching for um, as were simple, elegant, uh, very, very general uh, principles um, from, from which all of this mid-level mathematics can be uh, derived. Um, and of course, I mean, that, I mean, that isn't the only uh, condition that, that we have to uh, require. I mean, we, 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 I mean, you know, in mathematics, a very um, tight constraint is actually that these, just that these principles should be consistent, right? because it's very e well. As Russell's paradox showed, it's very easy uh, to uh, to stray into inconsistency when one's giving these super general um, principles of uh, of of logic, um, and and. I, and so I'm taking it that that kind of um, the requirement of consistency is is built into you know the need for you know a general fit with our data because uh, you know if you have an inconsistent theory that will entail absolutely everything and that's a pretty disastrously bad uh, fit with the uh, evidence uh, you know when when the is telling you that that two plus two equals four, and that two plus two equals uh, five, and so on. Um, so, so Russell did not think that the basic principles of logic had to be absolutely self-evident or anything like that. Um, he he thought that. The, the, the most fundamental principles of logic would, would probably be less clearly true to us 
as an epistemological matter than the things that we could derive from them. And so these very, very general principles uh, were, you know, were, just, were justified in this abductive manner by, by their capacity to, to generate these the clearer consequences and not to generate any clearly false consequences and, and so on. So, so that, was, that was the kind of abductive methodology that, that Russell quite explicitly uh, defended in various places uh, at the beginning of the 20th century. I mean, of course, I mean, there have been alternative attempts at uh, the epistemology of logic and uh, mathematics. Um, people have tried to, to make out that the, that the principles of logic are just somehow analytic and don't really involve any kind of uh, commitment um, and, or the, the, uh, that they're just purely formal or, or something. And, uh, but, but uh, I mean, my view, none of, none of those uh, attempts have really um, come anywhere close to uh, giving us a, a plausible or uh, def illuminating epistemology of logic. And the, uh, the, the best one that we, that we have is something like Russell's. He actually called it an inductive methodology. But I think um, you know, if, if one's picture of induction is something like simple um, enumerative induction, then uh, that's it's not a very illuminating term. I think, I think abductive is much closer to the, the spirit of, uh, of what R Russell had uh, in, in mind. Um, And I, th I think that the, this uh, role for an abductive uh, methodology uh, in, uh, in logic um, is, is something that is, it, it, one can see at work in contemporary uh, debates themselves. So that um, particularly foundational uh, debates uh, about you know, w w alternative logics uh, uh, that um, w w when, pe when people are you know, discussing w what kind of logic we need to, to ha handle the uh, semantic paradoxes or the, the Sorites paradox, the paradoxes of vagueness, the liar and the heap, and, and so on. It, it, in practice, people are appealing to these abductive virtues of, of simplicity and elegance and so on. Uh, they're, they're, not, they're, not, they're not just they're not trying to do it by using some criterion of analyticity because, because that's, that gets you nowhere. I mean, of course, everybody, you know, you know, if we were playing that game, everybody would claim that their own principles were analytic and, and so on. But it, but we, it wouldn't help us in deciding between uh, these, these different uh, criteria. I, I mean, I think that the although it's clear that the methodology of of debates uh, in the foundations of logic has been non non deductive in that way um, it's I don't think people have always been very clear headed about this and so that there's um, there's sometimes there's, there's been a, a kind of interference or a, coming from an, another kind of thought about logic, which is, is that logic should, should somehow be neutral. And, uh, and so it, it should, the key thing for logic is th that um, it, it, sh it should avoid controversial commitments with, you know, w w w or substantial uh, commitments. Um, but, uh, and, and so that's, th that's encouraged some people to think that, as it were, roughly speaking, in logic, that a weakness is a strength. That, um, that as where the less the logic uh, enables you to derive, the better a logic it is, because the more ne neutral it is. But I, you know, I, I, I mean, I'm not going to. Well, I can in discussion. I can talk about this. But, but I, I mean, I think it's it's fairly plain that that that, that way of thinking is a complete dead end, because uh, there is no. Uh, useful criterion of substantiveness uh, here and that 
that, that that will just push us in in the direction of very very uh, weak logic logics which are completely uh, useless. Um, so I, I think, the, as it were, an abductive methodology is the one that we need in logic. But you, you can also see an abductive uh, methodology at work in mathematics. Of course, not, not in, as it were, the bread and butter mathematics, where people are just proving theorems on the basis of established methods, but um, in the foundations of mathematics, as done by mathematicians. I'm not just talking about philosophers commenting on mathematics, where, where people people are looking for uh, new axioms of set theory, taking set theory as the, uh, the, the best known uh, foundational theory for, uh, for mathematics. Uh, and of course, the situation with, with set theory is that although it's, it's a fantastically powerful theory in, in one of its standard forms, like for example, first order um, or second order, uh, zamelo frankel set uh, theory with choice or, or whatever, but it doesn't matter too much for my purposes exactly which one you go for. It's, these are fantastically powerful theories, but because of results of, of uh, Gödel and Cohen and so on, it's, it's known that there are um, questions, that, uh, that well-defined questions posed in the language of set theory um, that cannot be answered on the basis of the, the current axioms. And in fact, you, it, we'll, we'll never really be in a, in a position to answer all such questions. Um, and I mean, the, the standard example is Cantor's continuum hypothesis. I don't think I need to go into exactly what that, that says for, uh, uh, but I, for present purposes. But, but these, these are, these are ma mathematical questions to which the current axioms of set theory do not give an answer. And, uh, and so one thing, I mean, this, it's controversial how we should think about this, but, but one uh, mathematical uh, activity is the, the search for new axioms of set theory that would enable us to resolve these questions in a really satisfying way. That was something that, that Gödel himself hoped uh, to be able to uh, to do, and I mean, of course, it would be tr you know it's trivial that you could you could add the continuum hypothesis as an axiom, you could add its negation, um, but but do doing that wouldn't wouldn't answer the question because I, at least on a r realist conception of set theory, the the idea is that there's just you know there's a genuine question about whether the continuum hypothesis is true or, uh, or not, and. Uh, what, what we're looking for are new axioms which would strengthen the ones that we've already got, but w axioms which would be uh, motivated in some way that, that we would have good reason to uh, accept and w which would then enable us in a non-trivial way to resolve the, uh, the question. And, and when people envisage doing that, the, the methodology that they have in mind uh, is a, uh, a broadly abductive one. And I'm talking about mathematicians who are interested in, in new axioms for set theory. Not as I say, I don't want this just to be a matter of what philosophers think. Um, the, the, so they're looking for simple, elegant, powerful principles uh, which will will, will un resolve these questions and which are you know are consistent with the the mathematical knowledge that we already possess and uh, and as we're, and help to uh, to organize that knowledge in illuminating. Uh, ways, so it's it's really not very uh, not very different from the philosophical uh, case. So um, when when we look at the foundations of logic and mathematics, what we see at work is broadly speaking an abductive methodology. And uh, I'm not saying this in order to assimilate philosophy to logic and mathematics. I mean, I think logic is is a, uh, a central part of philosophy, but I, I certainly don't want to suggest that, that all philosophical questions you know, can, are just questions of, uh, of logic, but uh, the, the point that I'm making uh, here is, is that um, the, the fact that an abductive methodology is being used does not mean that we're assimilating 
the, the, the discipline in question to a natural science, because logic and mathematics continue to be done in a way which is very, very different from uh, the natural sciences, and yet they do use this abductive methodology at the, at the foundational uh, level. Um, one, I mean, there are lots of issues that can be raised about the, uh, the abductive methodology, but w w one that I particularly uh, want to address, because it is one of the most puzzling features of the abductive methodology, is the, the role of, as one might say, quasi-aesthetic criteria in the uh, abductive methodology, criteria of uh, simplicity and elegance and so on, um, which are crucial to the operation of this methodology, and yet which at first glance, don't don't have don't seem to be deserve to be there because you know, who told who told us that the that the truth has to be simple and elegant? Why shouldn't the the truth be complex and uh, and messy? I mean, w w you know, one might think it, uh, aren't these sort of pr maybe pragmatic criteria at best, or 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 something even worse uh, than that? Uh, how, how come th th these these play any role in what's uh, meant to be a, a truth-directed uh, uh, enterprise. But at the same time, you know, it's, it's very hard and impossible to see how, how this kind of methodology could be uh, applied without such an appeal. I mean, you know, if, if, you, just, um, if you just think about... Um, you know, l l let's suppose that you know some kind of um, theory that, let's roughly speaking, um, I mean, take take some take some physical uh, theory which says, l l I mean, supposing that we, as it were, w w what we currently hold in some area, is, let's just suppose it's Einstein's special theory of relativity. We just, it doesn't really matter what the, the case is, but as it were, some uh, received uh, uh, physical theory. And then supposing that somebody, you know, put forward uh, the view that um, uh, Einstein's special theory of relativity is correct, uh, except uh, that there will be a few exceptions to it in Tartu next Sunday. That's all. I mean, there are no other exceptions. Just, just here next Sunday. The, 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 I mean, so we, that theory is is not one that deserves to be taken seriously. Right? I mean, it, and uh, it, you know, it, it's not one that scientists are going to bother to check or anything. But, um, but. You know, in a way, what's 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 wrong with it is, I mean, we might even you know have a theory which specified what the exceptions will be, uh, um, and you know maybe maybe water being turned into wine or, or next Sunday or something, um, but what's most striking about that theory is is that it's it's just utterly ad hoc. It's kind of it's it's complicated and messy in in a way for which there's no motivation, and um, but that as it were quasi aesthetic as it seems objection to it also seems like you know a really compelling objection to its truth. I mean I, I think um, I, I doubt that. Anybody here is, is much inclined to take that, that, that theory uh, seriously. Um, so that it seems it's, it, isn't, it isn't just that these um, criteria are, are playing some kind of pragmatic role. It, they do seem to be ones which um, are way with us in a truth-directed Enterprise. Um, 
even though it's hard to, uh, to explain uh, why. Um, and, uh, but of course, it's, it is also the case that if we, start, if we took theories like that seriously, there would be obviously you know, what one could think of infinitely many uh, theories of that general type, and we, we would just be uh, overwhelmed with uh, you know, a, a, an infinite family of, of candidate uh, theories. That, and we would, we would never, you know, if we really had to take the, all of these seriously, we, we would never make any uh, progress. Um, I mean, I think, you know, in the philosophy of, of science generally, um, it's, it's much clearer that, that these criteria of simplicity and elegance um, do and ought to carry weight than, than it is why that is so. Um, and it may well be that the story about why, why such, as I say, quasi-aesthetic criteria uh, carry uh, sh and should carry weight is, is, is a quite complex one, that there isn't one single uh, reason. But I think the one suggestion uh, which has been made by um, Elliot uh, Sober uh, is, is w worth thinking about in this connection, because it has an application to philosophy. Um, so I, I'm not going to be concerned with the, the, the mathematical way in which uh, Sober develops uh, th this suggestion, which is controversial, um, but, uh, but just with the, the uh, broader idea. Um, and the, 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 the broader idea is, is this, that... Um, there's a phenomenon in natural science known as overfitting, which will, may sound a bit paradoxical when I, when I first describe it, because overfitting is the, the problem or, or what goes wrong when you try to fit uh, theories too closely to observation. Right. And, you know, and it might, I mean, it might see, that might seem like, how can that be a problem? Because exactly what you're trying to do is to fit the theories to observation um, as, as well as you possibly can. But it turns out this is, this is, a, this is a, a problem recognized by practicing scientists. And, it has, it, and it's, it's this, that suppose at a given time you've got a bunch of data. You know, and I mean, typically, as well, what, you, what you're doing is something like, uh, curve fitting, and um, and you know you've got a bunch of 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 data, and um, and you and you're, you're you're wanting to you know to to as it were to to fit a curve to them, which is in effect is finding an equation that that uh, predicts these data, and I, I mean it's a mathematical fact that. that uh, for any finite data set, you can always find a curve that, that goes uh, through those, those data uh, points. I don't know if it, as long as you haven't got one directly above uh, another. So, I mean, there's always some complex poly polynomial that will do the trick. If, and, and so, it, you know, it, if, if what, you, what you do is you, you just try to fit your, the current data as exactly as you can, so that, you know, you, you, I mean, you might, might be that the, the polynomial that you come up with, as it were, goes, you know, like that or something. Um, and what, what happens if you, uh, if you pursue that, that kind of methodology is that you get a, uh, hypotheses that are, are not at all robust, because as soon as you get some more data, uh, you have to change your hypothesis. You know, I mean, supposing you get a, a you know a data point there, then then of course that would immediately mean this that this uh, curve was hopeless, and you'd have to try something new. And so so you get a, a very very unstable kind of, of theoretical development where, where you're jumping around from one hypothesis to another, each of which may be an accurate fit of the data that you have, but will, will, but it's very unlikely to be a good fit to new data. Um, whereas, 
what, what Sober suggests is that, that giving weight to uh, simplicity helps us not be victim to errors in our, in our current data. So that as a way, if, if, all our, if there are some uh, mistakes in our list of observations, if we just go for a very simple theory, which, it, which fits the data less well than, than a really complicated polynomial. I mean, for example, you know, in this case, you might just say, look, the thing to do is just to put a line th through here. I mean, maybe, you know, if I were a better drawer, this, that would be a, uh, a completely straight line, just, so just a, a linear equation. And, and so what, what we're doing there is we're saying, well, look, we're not, we're not trying to fit this, this data point. It's an outlier. There was probably an error there. Um, so that by, by restricting ourselves to, to, to fairly uh, simple um, theories, uh, simple, simple equations of, you know, maybe uh, linear ones for, as a start, but, but you know, perhaps going a bit beyond that, we, we avoid the problem of uh, overfitting. Um, because, because as well, we don't allow ourselves to do these kind of fancy things. And, and that, it, it, that turns out to be a more robust methodology because it's less vulnerable to mistakes in our data. I don't think that's the, going to be the full story about simplicity, but I think it may well be an important part of the story about uh, simplicity. And, uh, and what I want to suggest is that we, in philosophy, may well have been guilty of a, a certain tendency to, towards overfitting in our theory construction, precisely because we have not been uh, assigning sufficient weight to criteria of simplicity and elegance. Um, and I think that the, the history of uh, analytic epistemology is a, a good candidate uh, example of that. Because what, one thing that's absolutely notorious in the development of analytic epistemology uh, after Gettier was that people in particular in going for analyses of knowledge, we're going for more and more complex analyses, um, complex and messy, uh, ad, ad hoc with lots of disjunctions and disjunctions of conjunctions and so on. I mean, really um, just horribly ugly conjectures. And, uh, and of course, uh, notoriously, what happened with these was that that every time we got some new data, I you know somebody produced a new uh, thought experiment. We'd uh, th then these uh, these conjectures would get refuted, and we'd have to replace them by, uh, or people would replace them by by something even more complicated and messy. Um, and and so we we had something that was unstable and was just heading in the direction of greater and greater uh, complexity. And to my mind, a very remarkable feature of this was the extraordinary uh, tolerance of epistemologists for these grotesquely ugly uh, hypotheses. Right. You know, and one can... One can um, See, I mean, there wasn't, it wasn't—it wasn't just dumb of them. It, it, I mean, they, you know, after all, they were thinking, "Look, it's just turning out that the truth here is rather complicated." And, um, but, but this was, this was leading in, uh, in a very bad uh, direction, um, and, and so, I, you know, I, I think that what was what was going on there was actually extremely similar to overfitting in the, the, the natural sciences. And that if, if we'd been applying a, a, more, 
a more systematically and thoroughly abductive methodology than, than we were, rather than something a bit closer to that kind of, uh, if you like, falsificationist uh, methodology. Uh, alarm bells would have been ringing much sooner, and that we would have, we would have realized that, uh, that th this was, was not the, the right way to theorize in epistemology. So uh, it, it seems to me that even these, the criteria which look as though uh, then they have no obvious connection with truth are in fact playing a, a key role in the, uh, the workings of abductive uh, methodology as a truth-directed enterprise, and that they're just as relevant in playing that role for philosophy as they are in the natural sciences. Thanks. <laughs> Question about abduction as, a, as the inference is the best explanation. Um, and I was, I was thinking that, or I'm wondering that, can you elaborate more on the, the part of what this to be a best explanation? Uh, and, well, and I think it might be tricky because you know um, you want to. I think you want to balance your ideas such that you know abduction versus overfitting and how to. Uh, what role do they play in philosophy and what they should play there? I mean, you want to balance those things such that I think that some sort of pragmatism wouldn't fall out of that, right? So, and so I'm kind of, I'm not sure whether it's, uh, how do you think that's, that's can be done? But, I mean, what's your idea on what, what it means to have a best explanation without pragmatic uh, uh, input? Well, so the I mean, just to give a, um, a, a simple sort of version of what I've been saying, we, we, we might think of the, the, the three main dimensions that, that we're um, assessing theories on as something like uh, simplicity, strength, and... Um, and evidential fit, um, and the and so it, the, the of course it, it, with explanation we're, we're we're looking for uh, we're looking for uh, evidential fit of a specific kind, which is not just consistency with the uh, the evidence, but uh, but um, you know in t uh, you know. Probably not entailing it either, but something close to the, to that, maybe entailing it given certain initial conditions or whatever, whatever it is, or in, entailing it something, or entailing some approximation to it, whatever, whatever we're uh, considering. And so, so we've got these three dimensions on which we can uh, assess uh, theories. So, for example, um, you know, if we took the the, the 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 kind of this very complicated polynomial curve or whatever, then that that's one that would score very very highly on on evidential fit, but very, very badly on uh, simplicity. And, and then the idea, the idea is uh, that, um, that in talking about the best explanation, we're talking about the, the, the whatever, I mean, I'm taking it that the thing, what does the explanation is the, roughly speaking, is, is the, the theory that, that provides the explanation. And, and that we're looking um, for the theory that, that scores uh, that scores best on these three th criteria. I mean, of course, w w when, when we talk about inference is the best explanation, I mean, typically, you know, we, we have uh, some very specific subset of our total evidence in mind that we want explaining, and, you know, and so we're, uh, if you like, we're applying this kind of abductive criteria uh, locally rather than globally, and, you know, and, and I think, that, I mean, th 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 that is something that we, uh, that we need uh, to do, um, I mean, just for practical purposes, because we, we can't, as we take, you know, the totality of everything we know into account simultaneously, because it's just uh, over complex. But uh, um, w what I've been suggesting is is that 
th that kind of methodology just, I mean, it, th there's nothing in, in the long run that's, uh, as it were, that's pragmatic in the sense of, um, uh, for example, substituting some criterion of, of usefulness for truth or anything like that. It, it's that the, what we're looking for is the, the, uh, the, the theory that, um, you know, we, we, we look, we, we're looking for the truth in these cases. And, uh, and we're doing that um, by, um, by judging theories on these different uh, criteria. And, and you know, r roughly speaking, you know, if you like saying, um, when we add up how their scores on the different dimensions, which comes out top. I mean, w w one thing, I, I, maybe this has to, relates to your question. Of course, when we're talking about the best explanation, I mean, really and truly, it is where in some object, totally objective sense, the best explanation is, is the true explanation. But, but it, w when we're applying the, the methodology of inference to the best explanation, the idea is that in, in these cases, we don't have direct access to the, the truth. And so we have to judge the theories uh, less directly uh, by these, as it were, if you like, signs of truth. Um, and so, so when we're talking about best explanation, we're, we're, we're talking um, ab about um, the best by these e evidential criteria, not, as it were, what the ultimate, not, we can't directly apply the criteria of what the ultimately correct explanation uh, is. But nevertheless, all of this is in the service of trying to find the ultimately correct Explanation. I think you know Peter Lipton's book on the on inference to the best explanation. You know, gives quite a nice account of of this. Okay, next question. Okay. Um, you are trying very hard to connect your theoretical virtues, the simplicity, uh, explanatory power, and uh, beauty to the truth, because you think philosophy is a truth-directed enterprise. Yes. But why don't you just give up the search for truth? Instead, you say philosophy is no longer the pursuit of truth, but the pursuit of the best theory and the best theory as defined by your methodology, abductively. Yeah, but I want to know the truth. I mean, I mean, you know, I, I, so, I mean, I mean, the point, the point of these methodologies is to get at the truth, and. You know, and all the, the, these, I mean, these methodologies are just, they're, they're very kind of, they're very broad uh, descriptions of, you know, how we're to proceed. Um, and, of course, in, in any particular case, they, they, they have to be, in applying them, we, you know, we have to use our discretion to apply them in the best way. And, and we're constantly uh, monitoring to see how we can apply them in the way that is, is best designed to get at the truth you know it, so that if we if we just as it were gave up the the point of the uh, the enterprise uh, but but kind of carried on with the methodology we'd, we would we would lose the, uh, the 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 standard by which we we judge applications of the methodology so you know I, I, I'm not I don't think that it would um, even really make Make much sense to 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 try to use this methodology, but but just saying all we're interested in is you know what does best by the methodology that we're using. But, because as I say, because you, because um, you know, it, I mean, it's a bit like saying all right, let's let's have a, a a trial where we're not we're not interested in whether the 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 accused is innocent or guilty. We're only in, interested in in whether the accused does does uh, best by the the procedural criteria of a of a court. I mean, the the, the procedural criteria themselves. They you know they they ultimately they they make sense in relation to the end of act, trying to find out whether the accused really is innocent or guilty. Okay. So uh, okay, if we all agree that the simpler theories over the more complex ones in the hope that the, our theory. It, I mean, it's less probable to collapse on by a new data that might not fit the theory, and uh, so. But it can't. It can't be that that we that 
simplicity always trumps other criteria, because otherwise we might as well just go straight away for the metaphysics according to which there is only one thing which never changes and so on. Yeah. So, so, no. so, okay, in a sense that you explained it, like, for, I'm, I'm thinking about this example, yes. which is not a good example for my, my purpose. So let's say we have like, uh, a set of data, um, distributed in a way, uh, like, on the board, so that the complex theory would be a very complex polynomial graph or something that connects all of them together. But, so the question is, there is two, because of the, the form of distribution, there will be at least two simpler theories that dismiss some of the data, but they are equally good. So the question is, isn't there a danger of arbitrariness in the choice of simpler theories? By, because the simpler theories is the one we are, I mean, for example, in your case, we, we dismiss that data in the hope of the simpler theory. But if, we, if, if there are equally good and predictive and explanatory theories, simpler theories that are available by, by giving up on the complex ones, so isn't there a danger? I mean, then, then how do we choose between those, those simpler ones which are equally good? So you're not suggesting that this is something that will always happen, but it's something that can sometimes happen. That, 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 yes, yes. Because, well, I think, I think the, answer, the answer is that um, you know, if, if we have two theories um, which, as it were, come out equal top in, in the ranking, um, that what, what we should do um, is is simply try to get m more relevant data, and you know, in the hope that in the long run, as we accumulate uh, data, it will decide between them. Yeah, but, but until we don't have the re more data, how do we choose? Well, maybe we shouldn't be choosing at that point, right? I mean, you know, it. it um, I mean, we, oh, you know, we've we've obviously got you know a. Um, We've made some progress if we've, you know, from maybe, you know, a large number of candidate theories, we, we've picked out two, and, and you know, it's, it's just these, uh, these two which are doing better than uh, uh, all the rest. I mean, that's already uh, significant uh, progress, but, but then, but we don't need to, you know, we don't need to be in such a hurry to choose between them. And, you know, and I think one of the, you know, something that I was you know, meant to, to say, actually, is that one of the, uh, advantages of an abductive methodology in philosophy is that it, um, it directs our efforts in a more constructive direction, you know, because there's a tendency um, in contemporary philosophy that, that, that you know, people, people are always, you know, suggesting that, you know, either it's a standoff or they're kind of locking horns on whether a particular theory is, is refuted by you know a particular thought experiment and these kind of things and you know yes it is no it isn't and, and so on. and um, you know as, as it were it, it's all, all sorts of situations where, where people are ju just you know it's as it were who loses their now first sort of thing and um, I, and I think the point of an abductive methodology is is just um, there is no need to direct our efforts in that futile way we we can we, we can simply widen the, the the base of of relevant evidence to the uh, and to a point where we can get a decision between these theories which again i take to be much you know much closer uh, to the um, the, the kind of attitude that we get in the rest of the sciences, where you know, if, if if scientists have come across two theories which do equally well, you know, by these abductive criteria as explanations of the current data, I mean, the, the, they're not going to spend a lot of time, you know, just um, insisting that one of them is right and the other is wrong. I mean, well, some of that may go on, but but I mean, the, the natural scientific question is, uh, okay, well, at the moment it's a draw, but so how can how can we um, find some data that will enable us to to decide between these two theories, and you know, it seems to me that that's uh, that's a much more productive attitude, and it's an attitude that we should be aiming to take in philosophy as well. Okay. Yeah, thank you very much. I'm, I'm, I'm very happy after the, the the your account. I, I, I'm not sure I understand exactly why you are you calling it, it uh, or you you connect it to abduction because it, abduction for me is something uh, rather different that 
that's interrogative. You are looking for what, which theories can enter the competition, but it doesn't really uh, tell you which, which ones to pick or how to assess them or whatever. I, I would say rather that uh, you started by saying that there, there is this naive fal falsificationist account, and the account you are presenting is uh, precisely a less naive or non-naive account. The, it's still subject to this um, error fragility thing, but, but, but less because you introduce these um, epistemological strategies that are known also for natural scientists. For instance, when you do this test of um, consistency when you, for the set of axioms, you are doing the same thing as a scientist who is calibrating an instrument, for instance, before using it or something like that. So, um, just some, the, my first question, if I can ask, is about the connection exactly with, uh, with abduction. Um, uh, specifically. And the, the second point uh, that I, I wanted to make is about the, uh, the idea of the competition between uh, theories or how to compare theories, not just how to assess them uh, individually. The, the difficulty with this is, is that uh, it might suggest that we have a kind of set of fixed data or something and then we have theories that are competing about it, while actually in practice it seems to me quite different. When, what we do is that we are not just looking for the best theory, theories to explain our data, we also look for the best data to, that fit with other, other, our theories. For instance, in, in, the, in the line and, and the points, what we are doing is that we are not just looking for the best line that goes through the points. We are also looking for the best sort of points that will go well with, 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 with a, a, a beautiful line or something that we are doing. You mentioned in, in many times Russell's theory, for instance. He, it, it was, it was um, a lot of people objected to Russell's uh, logicism, both mathematicians like Poincaré, but also philosophers like John Cook Wilson, who had the, the position of philo uh, professor of logic at Oxford precisely. And it's not because they thought Russell's uh, uh, philosophy of logic was, was, um, was less explanatory or something. It's simply because what Russell calls mathematics is not what Poincaré calls mathematics. It's not what John Cook Wilson calls mathematics. The, the objects themselves are changing. The phenomena, the data, or the, the thing we are trying to explain. So it's, it's much more complex than that. It's not just the, the explanation themselves. It's the objects themselves also are changing. So it's difficult to compare actually in practice. Yeah. Okay. So... Thanks. So just a couple of points about that. I mean, one is that, of course, you know, the, the term abduction was introduced by Charles Sanders Peirce, and, uh, and he gave different explanations for, of what he meant by it, and some of them are closer to uh, inference is the best explanation for the way. But, but I, you know, I do think that the, that the, as well as the, the form of the term is usually taken to suggest it's, it's a kind of, uh, it's, the, the natural alternatives to it are induction and de deduction, and um, and so it is. It is meant, uh, on the, as it's usually understood, to be not just a matter of the asking of questions, but also uh, as some way of um, deciding between uh, answers to them. I mean, it is it is meant to have some kind of inferential uh, force. Um, but I mean, that's that's just terminology. Yeah. So I, I mean, I think, of course, it's uh, it's true. That, that our understanding of the, the subject matter is, I mean, what the subject matter is about and so on, that, that is evolving as our theories uh, evolve. Um, I mean, I, and I, I think it's, it's certainly true that, 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 that part of this enterprise is the, um, the search for new kinds of evidence that, w that will enable us to answer the questions uh, that we're interested in. I mean, I, I, I wouldn't put it in quite, um, quite the way that you did, because that suggested that what we're looking for is just more and more evidence that will support our uh, Theories. I mean, of course, we do do some of that, but but you know, it, it's once you, once you have a theory, it's it's usually relatively easy to to come up with quite a lot of evidence that, that's consistent uh, with it, and um, you know, and and so the I mean, the, the, we, we've got to some extent to overcome our natural tendency just to to look for the things that are consistent with what we already think, and and to as it were to search for what the, what the, the most severe tests of our uh, theories are as as well. I mean, you know, I mean, for most, for example, for you know, for most um, definitions of or, or attempted definitions of knowledge, there will be lots and lots of cases which are which where they do fine uh, on, but. 
um, you know, cases which avoid certain kinds of complication. Yeah, I, I mean, on, on, on John Cook, Wilson, and uh, Poincaré, they, you know, I, I, I mean, they were, I, I wouldn't say that either of them had very much comprehension of, uh, of what Russell was doing. Of course, I mean, Cook, John Cook Wilson was, was somebody who'd, you know, as a student, he'd learned some mathematics, but I mean, he, his, his understanding of mathematics was not very advanced and was very old fashioned for the, t for the time. I mean, he, and he, he was, I mean, basically, um, he had not yet reconciled himself to non-Euclidean uh, geometry, for example, which, which, was, which was, you know, for somebody operating in the early 20th century was, was not exactly advanced. Um, Poincaré, of course, was a very great mathematician, um, but he, he had a, in, in his philosophy of mathematics, he, he had a lot of uh, constructivist uh, baggage uh, which I, I don't think really helped him in uh, understanding not I mean not just understanding what Russell was doing but uh, understanding a whole lot of the uh, developments in set theory and uh, and and so on I mean I, I mean that doesn't that's not necessarily inconsistent with what you were you, you were saying but you know I think that I mean I, I suspect in Cook Wilson's uh, Case he he his you know his understanding of mathematics would have been one which was closer to to some kind of idea of evidence. Um, I mean self evidence that, that that didn't really fit with with what was going on in, in mathematics at the uh, at the time and um, and and Poincaré's was was one which closer to some conception of you know may, well very very crudely of mathematics as as a construction which. Uh, you know, of course, there were lots of attempts, particularly in the first half of the 20th century, to, to develop uh, mathematics on that basis. But that, that hasn't really been the, the way in which mathematics has gone. So, given this sober story that you gave, so simplicity of the theory is good because it makes our theory so insensitive to mistakes in our yes. data. So this story sort of makes sense on the assumption that there really are mistakes in the data. And if we talk about natural sciences, we did have like independent reasons to believe that, that there are yes. in fact mistakes in the data. And we also have a story to tell why these mistakes might occur, be it due to, I don't know, operational technology and statistical methods and so on. Now, if we extend this story to philosophy, then, uh, so I assume that the line, for example, would be a theory of knowledge, and the different data points would, among other things, be these different thought experiences. Yes, yes. And also among those Gettier cases. Yes. So your proposal would be that it's okay sometimes for our theory of knowledge to ignore these Gettier cases because they might be or are mistaken. Yes. So my question is, do we have in philosophy actually these independent reasons to believe that they the, do involve a mistake and what would the nature of the mistake consist in? Where does the mistake come from? Because in so far as I can see at least these Gettier kinds of thought experiments are actually on par with all other kinds of imaginary scenarios that support our yeah. So, I mean, of course, I mean, my own view is, in fact, that that the Gettier cases in general are are, are right. I mean, that that when that these are not all mistakes, and um, although, the, I mean, I think one, I mean, one thing that's worth considering are, are cases um, where there's there's been a certain amount of uh, where, where the, the level of disagreement about the, the thought experiment is much higher, and in, in, the, in the case of epistemology, uh, a good example of that are the, the fake barn uh, cases, which, which are supposed to be Gettier cases, but Gettier cases which don't have to involve anybody in making a, uh, a false uh, uh, judgment. And although I think, I think in fact, 
uh, on the, there are genuine cases of that kind, but the, the fake barn cases have, there's always been a lower level of agreement on them. And I think, and, um, and there's been, there's, I mean, there's been a somewhat artificial a kind of agreement that to to take these as genuine Gettier cases, with, which a lot of people have been kind of queasy about, and so that's that's an indication that that something might be uh, might be going wrong there. So, you know, so the the kind of concern I have is it's not it's not that um, that there's anything as it were generally wrong with. Gettier cases or with thought experiments. It's just that there's nothing in the kind of account that I have been giving of um, thought experiments that su suggests that we'd be at all likely to be infallible about them, right? I mean, because uh, th these thought experiments, they're not so different from, from judgments that we make you know, about real life cases. And we're not, w w when we apply terms like knowledge and, or justice or whatever, whatever the subject matter is, I mean, you know, in real life, we make lots of mistakes about, you know, about those. And, uh, and there may be, um, there may be w uh, things like that going on with some of these thought experiments. I mean, one, one kind of error which, um, uh, you know, I think, um, one gets with some thought experiments is that w w w with quite a number of these scenarios, you, th th they're almost like duck rabbit cases. That, that there, as a way, you can see them. There are two different ways of seeing them, and you can and you can kind of flip between them. And um, and so you know, supposing the, the supposing. Oh, uh, just to, to give you the analogy, I mean, supposing that, that we took the principle that no ducks uh, have, uh, sorry, n n no rabbits have beaks. Right, and then, and then we, we, we looked at, uh, a, you know, a, a picture of a duck rabbit. And we, we, we first of all, we got the, uh, the, the rabbit gestalt, and so we, we'd say it's a rabbit. And, and then we switch to the duck gestalt, and we say uh, it has a beak. And maybe we we're even dealing with some, some and I know this, it says it's just a picture, but I think you get the picture. And so, so we, could, we could make the judgment it's a rabbit and it has a beak. And then, and then think, oh, we, so the, this is a counterexample to rabbits have beaks. Uh, no rabbits, sorry, no rabbits have beaks. But, it, but we've only done, we've done that by kind of cheating, by, you know, by doing a gestalt switch but, um, between uh, the two ways of thinking. And, um, and so um, it's, you know, I, I, think that, I think there are thought experiments in, in, epistemolo in epistemology which are a bit like that, where you know, you, you, if you think of what's going on in one way, you, know, you, can, you can make one judgment about it. And then if you think, uh, you know, let's say it's an F, and, um, and then if, if you think about what's going on in a, in a different way, you, th you can make the judgment it's not a G. And so you think you've got a counterexample to, to all the Fs or Gs. But actually, really, there are, only, there are two ways of thinking of a counterexample. And one of them just gives you that it's an F and a G. And, and the other gives you it's neither an F nor a G. And, you know, and I think so sometimes people have been misinterpreting uh, thought experiments by, by, by doing that kind of gestalt switch halfway through. And you can kind of word it in such a way as to encourage uh, that sort of uh, switch. So, you know, the, and there are... But, but also, um, there are, um, you know, the, the, there are going to be all, all sorts of ways in which, you know, our general prejudices um, can, um, can make us misjudge thought experiments. And, and that will be, you know, that will be very clear in, in, in the case of moral philosophy, for example. You know, suppose that we've got a whole lot of, um, you know, false um, moral prejudices. 
um, of you know of a general kind about you know about you know let's say about whether slavery is okay or whatever it is. Then you know it, it, w when we make judgments about you know what the right thing to do is it, with respect to some. Um, thought experiment scenario. We're still going to bring our prejudices to our judgments about the scenario, you know. And and so, um, you know, it's, so it, we you know we might well you know judge you know that 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 with respect to some scenario, look, this this is a case where slavery is okay. If you know if, if our prejudices are going that way, because you know the the kind of prejudices that we have about real life cases, they we you know they don't disappear once we we, we start uh, evaluating thought experiments. So that the, there's you know I think you know and this is the, just the very general consideration that in in any area, human beings are fallible. That, that, that there's just nowhere where we, 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 as human beings, we are immune from mistakes. And uh, so it would be utterly bizarre if, if thought experiments were, um, were an area where it's just impossible to make mistakes. I mean, you know, it, I mean imagine a bunch of Nazis um, doing moral philosophy you know, by thought experiment. You know, I mean, the, the kind of judgments they're going to make about these the, these uh, thought experimental scenarios are going to be horrible, right? And you know, they're they're going to the, 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 in their hands uh, uh, the methodology of thought experiments is going to take them to terrible places, be and that's because the, you know you, you don't divest yourself of your prejudices when you consider a, a thought experimental scenario. And you know, and we and, and we we're not as bad as the Nazis, but but we, we, we're surely none of us in this room is free of of all kinds of prejudice and error that could infect our judgment of a thought experiment. You know, and I'm not saying this to imply that there's something terribly unreliable about thought experiments. It's just this is the normal human condition, and so we've got to we've got to devise our methodology in, in such a way that it's adapted to use by normal human beings with, with the, the fallibility that, that that carries with it. Let's have a few more very short questions. Follow up. No. There's a few people lined up. Uh, but just... Right, this is actually connected to what the asked. I mean, but I thought the problem wasn't so much that... I thought that the point of insisting on simplicity wasn't so much in order to avoid um, avoid mounting, avoid fitting with bad data points or with mistaken judgments on the experiments. So that there was a point to simplicity it in, in itself. So even when the data is good, right, even when the results of the experiments are reliable, there's still a value to a theory that um, that is more simple than another theory, even if the fit with uh, with good data, even if it doesn't fit with good data as well as the second theory, right? Isn't that what well, no, I, I, I was saying that that, that the that as well, it, 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 it's, this is a truth-directed enterprise, and so that the the, um, the the so the I was making the overfitting point, you know, a way in which um, the the emphasis on simplicity is valuable. So, you know. I mean, somebody could, they could have the view that, you know, a beautiful theory is just, it's a, just a beautiful thing in its own right, like, a, you know, a beautiful vase or, so, or something. And, it, you know, it'd be nice to have it hanging on the wall, but, um, or standing, standing on the, um, the chest of drawers. Um, but I haven't been defending simplicity and elegance in that way. So... Uh, so the way I've been defending them, certainly in this talk, is uh, as well that their value is instrumental. That, that, that what, we're, what we're really looking for um, is, um, you know, is to, to what we want to get to is, is knowledge of the truth about these matters, and and that surprisingly it turns out that giving weight to simplicity is an important part of a methodology that tends to take us towards the truth. Uh, um, and, you know, which is, is not what one would initially expect, but, but that's what seems to be the case. And, um, you know, and the 
success of natural science, you know, is, is a, a strong indication of that. I mean, so I, so I wasn't, I, I wasn't concerned with simplicity or elegance uh, as an end in itself. I mean, I, you know, I do think that uh, elegance, in fact, has value in itself, but that, that wasn't the case that I was making uh, today. Uh, I actually agree with the idea that, um, uh, that logic can be, uh, can be regarded as uh, a blockchain theory. Yeah. And my question is about, um, I would like to add actually uh, one, small, one more feature which is characteristic to theories in science, let's say. Uh, and this is this feature that even the best theory uh, needn't be good enough uh, regarding our initial expectations. And uh, concerning this standard logic, my uh, specific idea is about this Soretis paradox. And I find it very hard to accept the idea how, how you explain and how it, this uh, goes together with this chart product and standard logic. My idea is to uh, somehow try to explain why a limit to standard logic is there and how, uh, why standard logic fails uh, concerning this chart paradox. And, uh, and, but still we can't... Uh, as the uh, no alternative theories are so much worse. This is the best theory, but even being the best theory is not good enough uh, when it comes to Soretis products. Yeah. So you're saying it's it's the best theory, but not but it's not a but true theory. It's not the best theory. No, I, I don't. Uh, I'm not sure I can apply uh, this truth predicate to theories. Uh, I, I think no. In physics, uh, I, I'm not sure uh, uh, telling the theories through. True or not true? It's simply well, if we are talking about theories, I'm not sure this truth predicate is, is adequate actually. But I, understand, yes. well, I, I guess, but uh, you want, your answer is uh, once I am looking for truth, then it's so. But if if, if I doubt whether it can can be described this way when when it comes to theories, then uh, yeah, I mean. If we think of theories as uh, sets of sentences or sets of propositions, and, and they can be, um, and the, each sentence or proposition can be evaluated as true or false, that then, then there's a sense in which the, the theory can also be evaluated as true or false. I mean, it's true if all the, the, uh, the sentences or propositions that make it up are true, and, and it's false uh, uh, if at least one of them is, is false. But... Um, but I mean, I think it's, it's if we're talking about logics, of course, it it it, it it's a bit too si over simple to, to to classify logics as true or false because logics are not just made up of propositions. That, I mean, they're made up of rules of inference and so on, which which we wouldn't want to just classify as true or false, but rather something like valid or invalid or truth preserving or not uh, truth preserving. Um, yeah. So on the sp on the specific case of vagueness. Of course, I, I think that classical logic is the right logic, even for vague languages, and um, that, it, I mean, fantastically, I mean, classical logic does, it does fantastically well by these abductive uh, criteria. Of course, you, I, I mean, there, I think there is, you could have a view, it's not mine, but you could have a view of the Sorites paradoxes on which as it were, so the classical logic is kind of the, 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 the best general logic we have, but that it's not com perfectly truth-preserving for a vague language, uh, but that we shouldn't be looking for some alternative logic that is perfectly truth-preserving because somehow that's not, it's not indeter it's not determinate what that would be or something. Um, and... Um, I mean, as I say, I, th that's not my view, but it's a, it's a possible view. And uh, I, I think actually some of the things that I'm going to say tomorrow morning about model building are are, kind of, are relevant to that because because you know I I think there are areas where we shouldn't really expect any simple theory to be true. Where where, the, as, where, where there are areas I, 
you know, I, 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 my candidate would not be the, the Sorites paradoxes, but uh, there are areas where we've, there's ample reason to think that the, the truth is um, far more complicated than, than any humanly intelligible theory could capture. And, that, and so that what we're trying to do is in some way to provide simple models of it, but we should not expect them to be true. And so that's something I want to, want to talk about tomorrow. And so th that may go some way to, towards what you were saying on that case. But I, but I have that, I'm, I'm suggesting that not so much about logics, but a, about the theories at a, a somewhat more specific level. So on the assumption that there are mistakes in our data, so simplicity is good because it avoids the uh, overfitting. So simplicity is good because it makes our theory not error fragile. So we seem to be reducing simplicity to error non-fragility. But you also said that this is not the whole story to go for simplicity. Uh, because you still want truth, can you tell us the whole story, how simplicity is connected to truth? Well, so I don't, I, I, I'm not saying that simplicity and uh, a non-error fragility, you know, are the are exactly the same thing. But I th but but I I, th I think the sober considerations suggest that giving weight to simplicity ha does tend to uh, make us less vulnerable to uh, errors uh, in in our data, um, but. You know, it, it's it, it, of of course the, I mean the the error. You know, it's not it's not a guarantee of that. It's it's just um, that it it tends to you know if if there are if if there are massive errors in our data, then simplicity isn't going to reckon, going to rescue us from that. It's what it, what it rescues us from are cases where the our data are generally reasonably good, but that there are uh, a few. Bad, bad apples in the in the barrel, um, and um, yeah, and well, I mean, the re I, I said that, that that you you can't you can't you can't give uh, all the weight to simplicity because uh, there are and, and none to the other criteria. I mean, you have to. Um, so you know, if if you if simplicity were were our only Criteria, and even if we were putting a lot of weight on, you know, consistency with the data. I mean, if we just, you know, if you just have the uh, the theory, everything is identical with itself. I mean, that's a, an extremely simple theory, and it some non-classical people, notwithstanding, it's it's perfectly consistent with all our data. But but you know, th that is that is not a great theory because it's it, it tells us so little, and that's you know that's why. Um, we, we also have to have you know a, a waiting for strength, and you know so the, I mean three dimensions might not even be enough to capture everything, but just as a kind of first pass, I think it's a, quite a useful way of thinking simplicity, strength, and evidential fit, and um, you know and we need all three of those dimensions to, to carry weight, and not, we don't want you know any of them to be completely trumped by the others, because uh, you know, uh, otherwise we, we, we get kind of uh, r ridiculous uh, theories coming out on, uh, I mean, or useless theories coming out on, on top. So you know, we, we've, got to, we've got to kind of keep all three balls in the, in the air at the same time. Same building, but different entrance. It's a, it's a public lecture. And now we start with the lecture number five, titled Logic and Model Building. Thanks. So here's a kind of embarrassing experience that quite a lot of philosophers uh, have. You're, uh, you're at a party and you meet, you meet somebody uh, from the natural sciences and, and they ask you uh, 
what have uh, philosophers discovered recently? And it, it's kind of tricky to answer that, that question. And, and, and that sort of experience, it, it just uh, typifies our uh, sort of uneasy uh, sense that uh, natural science uh, makes progress in a way that uh, philosophy doesn't. Of course, if, if, as soon as you think about uh, logic, uh, which uh, at least a lot of which is, is a branch of philosophy, and, and you have a look in uh, some logic journals, uh, you'll see that, that in logic, progress is quite obviously being uh, made of a pretty much exactly the same kind uh, as uh, in mathematics. But you might feel, well, that, but that's not really typical of philosophical activity, even though it surely does count as one part of philosophical activity. And, um, and so you can feel p bad about what goes on in the rest of philosophy, and it can feel very unprogressive. Um, I think one thing that we, we have to be careful about is that the philosophers, they have a tendency, I mean, unsurprisingly, to uh, compare real philosophy with ideal natural science, uh, and uh, or at least a certain ideal of natural science. And, and that once uh, one becomes a bit more realistic about uh, what, what progress is like in a lot of natural science, you can see that in philosophy, we actually are making quite a lot of that uh, progress. Uh, but that because we've had the, uh, uh, the, the wrong uh, framework for thinking about what we're doing, um, th this progress which has been going on under our noses is, is not something that, that we've been, as it were, uh, uh, equipped to, to recognize and articulate. So that's what I'm going to be talking about today, and in particular about the, um, the methodology of model building, which is a, a, an extremely widespread uh, intellectual uh, technique in the natural sciences, and which I'll argue is to some extent already um, being used in philosophy, but, but that could be used quite a bit more uh, than it, that it is. Uh, we, we haven't really fully explored the potential of this kind of intellectual methodology in a way because we uh, mostly haven't even identified it as a uh, as part of the the, uh, the repertoire that we, of, of techniques that we have uh, available. So you know, I think when when we just think in a very st stereotypical way as philosophers about uh, natural science, the uh, the the tendency is uh, to think of progress in natural science as consisting in the discovery of new laws of nature, where laws of nature are thought of as uh, extremely uh, informative, uh, exceptionless, universal uh, generalizations, which may have some kind of uh, restricted uh, necessity. And of course, uh, I mean, in, in some of natural science, such l laws may uh, really be discovered. Um, but a, a great deal of natural science is not concerned with the discovery of uh, laws of nature. I mean, I, ha I had a, a conversation with a, a professor of, um, of biology, uh, um, who also had philosophical uh, interests. And he, he, I remember him telling me that, that he found a lot of the literature, even in philosophy of biology, not very relevant to uh, biology as uh, he and his colleagues uh, were doing it, because so much of the literature was still focused on uh, biological 
laws, whereas that was not at all the way they were thinking. The, 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 these biologists were thinking that biological phenomena are incredibly complicated and messy. And that one just shouldn't expect there to be universal uh, laws of a really informative uh, kind, uh, or at least m many of them, uh, at, uh, if any, uh, at the biological level. I mean, of course, biological uh, phenomena are also subject to the basic laws of physics, but I mean, that's what, not what you're looking for in, in biology. Um, and, you know, as I were just to get a, a, a you know, kind of flavor of that, you know, if you just try to th think, I mean, to put it incredibly crudely, um, that, you know, if you try to, uh, to, to write down some laws about, you know, all tigers or something like that, I mean, you're not going to get anything very much because, you know, it's not true that all, all tigers are four-legged. You can have three-legged three uh, tigers and uh, I'm... I, Assume you can have albino tigers, so it's not true that all all tigers have stripes and so on. So that you know, if you just tried to to write down some universal generalizations about tigers, I mean, you wouldn't get very much. Um, and in fact, you know, it, it you know it seems to turn out that you know even if you go down you know to to, to a much smaller scale to to cells or or something like that, it, it, it you you're still dealing with very very complicated messy things about which you shouldn't expect uh, to just to to have the universal generalization. I mean, you may be able to get a few, but but they will be so sort of watered down and limited, as in the case of tigers, that they, they won't really give you very much understanding. Um, so what's the, uh, the alternative uh, to, to finding out laws of biology? Well, the, the, the alternative that people have gone for, and which uh, seems to be highly uh, successful, is... Um, is that of b building um, typically mathematical models of biological phenomena, where th these, these models are e extremely simplified, just precise descriptions of, you know, as it were, a simple, you know, a simple cell which de deliberately abstracts from all kinds of complications which are present in any real uh, living cell and which, and which will affect its, uh, its behavior and so on. But, but you, the idea, if you try to take account of all those complications, it, things become utterly intractable. And, uh, and so you, you just have to uh, look at super simplified uh, models. And, uh, I mean, this, of course, is, is a phenomenon that uh, is also familiar in, in physics. Uh, um, so that, uh, for example, it, you know, it, it, uh, it's a very normal uh, thing that um, that you know, in in uh, in dealing with the behavior of the planets, you, you treat a planet as a a point mass, as though it was simply a a, a, a certain mass uh, uh, attached to one point. Uh, and so you, you ignore the fact that, that planet, planets uh, have, um, have have considerable extension. Uh, I mean, I mean you, don't, you, you don't even uh, tr try to treat them as spheres. You just treat them as single points. And, uh, and everybody knows that, of course, that, that isn't, um, isn't really what planets are like. But it's, as, it's a good enough simplification that you can get a lot of uh, insight um, into uh, the be behavior of planets by making that kind of um, simplification. Um, I, I'm not suggesting that all science is a matter of model building. I think in, in order to, to, to see the point of this technique, it's important to realize that it's, it's, a, it's a specific kind of scientific activity amongst other kinds of scientific uh, activity and, uh, and one indication of this is that it's actually uh, the, the job of model builder 
um, is a, a, a recognized speciality within the natural sciences so that a, a research team can advertise a job for a model builder. I mean, they're not, not all the members of the research team are model builders, but, but some of them are. And, uh, and the model builder is the one who, who's, doesn't, who's not doing the experiments, who's not making measurements or whatever, but is trying to produce uh, a, a good model of the, uh, of the phenomena. Um, and uh, as we're is trying to see what, what kind of uh, so huge simplifications um, <coughs> we, can, uh, we can make, which will still give us uh, as it were, uh, something that has enough of the structure of the, uh, the, the biolo biological or physical phenomena that we're interested uh, in to, 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 for us to be able to get, achieve real understanding of the, the phenomena out there by seeing how these uh, models uh, work. So, I mean, one one standard uh, example of a um, a, a model uh, is the um, the Lotka Volterra uh, model of uh, predator prey uh, interaction. So, so th th this this is a model which is for uh, used for understanding the way in which. The, um, the population of a species of predator, for example, uh, foxes, uh, and uh, the a species of uh, prey, like say rabbits, uh, interacting with each other, how, how they, their population will increase and decrease over time. Um, and uh, the idea is, well, the, you know, I mean, you can, you can write down some differential uh, equations to, to characterize these because, as it were, the, the, how, uh, I mean, the more foxes there are, the more rabbits get, get eaten, but, um, and the more, but the, the more uh, rabbits there are, the, the more the, the, uh, the foxes can have, have to eat. And, and so the, that it, ter it turns out that, um, that you can, you can write down some fairly simple differential equations for this kind of situation. Um, and, um, and, and when you look at the solutions of those equations, you see that they predict certain kinds of cyclical behavior with you know, quite complicated cycles about, because the, the ups and downs of the, the predator population, the, the foxes, um, are, are not the same as the ups and downs of the prey population, the, the, uh, the, the rabbits. I mean, they're not, I mean, but. Um, and this, I mean, a model like this uh, is one which the, uh, the, the biologists are completely aware of, is, is in many respects utterly unrealistic because it's a model um, that uh, treats, treats this as a sort of closed system in which you, you only have two species to consider. There are, as it were, there are no other species uh, interacting with them, you know, for example, such as you know human beings who are interfering with the foxes and uh, rabbits. Uh, the 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 environment may be treated as completely constant, which it never is, uh, and you're not you're not looking at uh, some complicated description of. The, the population, for example, in terms of you know how, how many you, uh, foxes or rabbits you have for a, a, you know at a given age or something like that. You, uh, I mean, you're, you're uh, all of those variables, which are, which are uh, everybody knows are in principle relevant, are are just being um, left out of the of the model. Uh, but you still get enough uh, complexity um, to to get some predictions about the, as it were, the qualitative um, behavior of these populations in terms of you know, increase and, uh, and decrease, which actually enable uh, observed um, phenomena to, to be uh, understood and explained. Um, now, a, an example like that might, might not seem so relevant to uh, to philosophy because uh, it's it's obviously quantitative. I mean, we're concerned with uh, increases and uh, decreases in the number of foxes, the number of of rabbits, or or whatever. Um, 
And, and so you, you might think, well, sh look, surely this just isn't a really a relevant uh, method for uh, philosophy, or at least uh, uh, or for much philosophy. But, but there are other kinds of uses uh, for um, model building in natural science, which are, are much more suggestive about the kind of activities that we might engage with in philosophy. So, uh, for example, I mean, suppose that you're a biologist and, um, and you're interested in the fact that, that so many species uh, reproduce um, by having two sexes. And, um, you know, and you're interested in the fact that we don't have lots and lots of species which reproduce by having three sexes, for example. Um, and, and, and you want to uh, understand why that's the, the case. Um, so this isn't really something that you can just go out and, and measure. But, I mean, you, well, you, can, you can count the number of uh, uh, two species that reproduce by, with two sexes and, and so on. But, but, but if, if we're trying to explain why we, we don't get, for example, th three sex uh, reproductions, that, then, then we're talking, you know, th th because they're not there, we can't go out and measure them. What we, what we, but what we have to do is to, as it were, explore what the problems would be um, if you had three sex re reproduction. And so one way of uh, uh, exploring that, in fact, the kind of natural way of exploring it, is by model building, by as we're trying to, by experimenting with um, with uh, rules according to which um, three uh, three sex uh, reproductions uh, species might might work. About I mean, for example, about how you know how genetic material would be for the offspring would be determined by the you know the. Whatever the parents were in in this context, and and then as we're trying to to work through um, how how such uh, what the effects of those rules would be, and you know to see, for example, whether it may turn out that uh, that you get some ter you know narrowing of the gene pool or some other kind of um, bad effect, which would explain why you know we we don't uh, have have of such a widespread phenomenon of three sex uh, reproduction. Um, and, so, and, and that already feels a, a lot more like a, a kind of philosophical activity because it's concerned with just with a, uh, a hypothetical uh, possibility um, and uh, it, you know, it's not concerned with uh, predicting the quantitative values or something like that. Um, in any serious uh, sense, and um, and it's a kind of open-ended exploration of the you know the space of possible rules um, by which three sex reproduction might go. And, and this, I mean, it's a genuine form of scientific activity, but um, one which does not at all fit, as it were, the the you know the kind of cliched stereotype of what uh, scientific uh, activity uh, consists in, and so, so what I what I'm interested uh, in is uh, applying this this methodology to philosophy and to seeing to what extent we in fact do uh, apply it already in philosophy. Um, so. I'm not going to give you know some very rigorous definition of a, a model uh, here, but uh, I'll I'll just say a little bit about the kind of conception of a model that that I I'm going to be working with because you know the, the, it, in order to state it at a sufficiently general level that it makes sense. I'm talking about. Um, Philosophy as as well as natural sciences. So, um, so I'm going to um, think of models as something like uh, models of a phenomenon are hypothetical uh, examples of a uh, phenomenon. So, uh, for example, the 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 predator prey um, model. The, the 
Vol 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 Volterra model, um, which is given by some um, differential equations for the, for the change over time of these populations. That's, I'm thinking of that as a, a hypothetical uh, example uh, of uh, predator-prey interaction, of a, you know, an, a, an extremely uh, simplified uh, example. And, uh, and when I say hypothetical, what I mean, I'm, I'm putting that in partly because it, it's, not, you know, it's not an actual example. I mean, there is no case of predator-prey interaction that, that, that completely fits the, uh, those uh, uh, equations. Um, but you know, I also. But, but I mean, we also want to. And we want to exclude just specifying examples by, as we're just pointing to actual examples, like you know, um, the um, interaction. I mean, the, between foxes and rabbits in the south of England from 1850 to 1900, or something like that. We're not. We're not concerned with that kind of thing. We're. We're concerned with uh, something more like, as as one might loosely say, a, a qualitative. Uh, description of the phenomenon. So, in in the, uh, the the case I was talking about, the qualitative description is given by the the um, differential equations. If you know, when we're talking about uh, three sex reproduction, for example, it might be given by the uh, whatever set of of hypothetical rules uh, we come up with for how, for how three sex uh, reproduction. Uh, is is going to uh, to work. So we're, we're, well, these, if you like, these are examples are uh, types uh, rather than uh, tokens of the phenomenon that we're concerned with. Um, now, something that you might think that we should specify at this point uh, is that although these may not be uh, actual. Uh, instances of the uh, phenomenon. Uh, they should at least be possible instances of the uh, phenomenon. Uh, you know, and that sounds pretty reasonable, but in fact, models in natural science do not obey that constraint. And the, and the, the case I gave you of the uh, Lotger-Volterra uh, model of predator-prey interaction is a case in point. Uh, and uh, I mean, of course, the, so far, I've been, I've been, what I've been emphasizing um, is, is th that it, it's not accurate to any actual example because it's so simple. But, but it, it's, in fact, w in a way worse than that because for on broadly logical grounds, it, the model is impossible. And the, the reason for that is I've already, in fact, g given you, but, but without highlighting it. And that is the model consists of differential equations. Differential equations are for continuous functions, you know, which, which vary uh, smoothly over time. But we're talking about the number of rabbits and the number of foxes or whatever the, the predator and prey species are. And, and so those, those are natural numbers, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, which, and which do not vary continuously. I mean, you can't have, you know, 0.79 of a fox or something. Uh, um, the, um, and um, and so, so the, the, this model, as it were, pr it, it predicts the continuous change in the number of um, of the predator and prey um, populations, uh, and, um, and and that's impossible. Uh, you know, but yet, w when you think about it, you realize that uh, that's not really a very big deal. That this this may be an, a really good model, um, uh, even though. Uh, it's, it's got th this simplification in it, which actually makes it impossible for the model to be realized, I, oh no, according to the, the intended interpretation where one of these variables is designated as uh, standing for the number of foxes and, and one for the, the number of rabbits. So, you know, so even the impossibility of the model is, is, is not uh, really a problem for, for this uh, methodology. Um, So, th so th that's the the kind of um, methodology I'm concerned with. I, I should say something here ab about what kind of knowledge do we get? Just still sticking with the natural science cases um, from the, the 
um, from this model building. And uh, very crudely, we, I think we could divide it into two kinds uh, of knowledge. So w one kind of knowledge just comes from exploring the model itself. And the model is given uh, in, typically in mathematical uh, terms. Um, and, and so the exploration of the model is um, basically mathematical exploration. I mean, it, it depends a little bit. In some cases, you can explore these models by, um, by computer simulation, for example. You know, but th these are dynamic models in, in natural science. That, that, or, or I haven't built that in because that's, uh, that's something more specific than we need for the philosophical uh, case. But, but they're typically dynamic models which, which show how the, the variables that we're concerned with change uh, over time. And so you can, as well, you can, if, if you can't just, uh, as well, analytically solve the, uh, the equations, uh, what you may be able to do is simply feed the equations um, into, you know, into a computer and specify what values of the, the parameters you, you're, you're going to be interested in, and then just run the computer, and, and it will tell you, how, you know, with some initial, from some initial conditions, and it will tell you how things change over time. And that just gives, you, uh, just gives you a kind of sample of how this model works for particular values uh, of the parameters. Um, but, but in principle, the, the question of the, f the features of the model is, is a fundamentally mathematical question. It, it just has to do with the, the mathematical consequences of some uh, equations. And, and so w one thing that we can learn about in the way that we learn new things in mathematics is just by, by studying the model itself. But of course, uh, I mean, that is obviously not enough because um, you, you could study mathematically uh, some model, you know, which had no, which didn't behave remotely like predator-prey uh, interaction. And, and so uh, the second sort of thing we want to do is, I mean, the second kind of knowledge that we can get uh, is much less precise than the mathematical knowledge we have of the model, but is also much more concerned with the phenomenon that we're ultimately interested uh, in. Um, and, and, and that's knowledge of, uh, of this kind of rough, of rough kind, well, such and such a model is, you know, one kind of model is better than another kind of model in some respects and maybe not in others. And, uh, you know, in, in some way, these models fit the phenomena better. But, but this fitting is not, it isn't a matter of giving a true description because these, we know that these models will not give an accurate description of the uh, phenomena. But they will, as we're, in some sense, that they are, they're capturing enough about the, uh, the, the phenomenon to be revealing about it. And so we've got that second kind of knowledge about the, uh, how good uh, these models uh, are, which is, uh, whose content is much, much vaguer because it's really difficult to be to say very much that's absolutely precise about the relation between a a, a mathematical model and the kind of messy uh, variegated um, complicated reality out there that we're trying to uh, understand but we can still say something i mean you know so, so some models would would be completely useless as, as models of predator uh, prey interaction um, uh, and the The sort of more general thing I want to emphasize is that I think it would be a mistake to, to treat um, model building as um, some kind of um, rival to a, a sort of a, a realist con conception of what science is doing. I mean, I take it that these models are things that we build in order to understand some kind of real phenomena out there in the world which, which behaves as it behaves and we want to understand that uh, behavior. We, so uh, that's, we still have a, a fully realist conception of what we're trying to achieve in this enterprise, but we, we need a, a more sophisticated 
methodology in, in order to make progress uh, with that than in sort of simple-minded uh, uh, accounts of uh, science because uh, we need a methodology that is uh, adapted to the fact that we're dealing with these complex, messy phenomena about which it's very hard to make, uh, maybe impossible to make lots of uh, really informative, exceptionless generalizations. So that we need this alternative uh, method. Okay. Uh, so, so now the question is: um, Can we and should we apply this uh, this methodology in philosophy too? Um, I mean, there may be areas of, of philosophy, just as there are areas of natural science, where it's, it, it's still quite realistic to expect to discover uh, exceptionless laws, um, and, and where we, we don't need a model building uh, methodology. Um, so for example, I mean, logic is a good candidate for that. I mean, of course, it could be that even with logic, in fact, that, that suggestion came up yesterday in relation to vagueness and the Sorites paradox, that we maybe even the subject matter of logic is somehow so messy that, 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 we, that we can't really have exceptionless laws. But, but I think it's, I, I mean, there's a decent chance that uh, in the case of logic, we can have absolutely exceptionless uh, universal laws that are nevertheless quite uh, in, informative. And there might be some other areas of fundamental metaphysics where that's also the case. I mean, for example, Mariology, law, principles about parts and wholes, but maybe we can have some good exceptionless laws there. Uh, but if, if we just compare the, okay, the, the subject, the sorts of things we're interested in, in philosophy and those were interested in natural science uh, and think, well, the case where the, the model building methodology uh, is required is cases where we're dealing with very complex uh, systems uh, and trying to find something specific about those, those complex systems. Um, where are we doing that in philosophy? Well, one type of incredibly complex system is a human being. And so any part of uh, philosophy that is concerned with the the human world, maybe not very just the human world, but but where we we're, uh, we're dealing with uh, things at that level of complexity, may well call for a model building methodology. Um, so for, for one example would be epistemology, because um, in epistemology. Uh, we're spending most of our time um, considering uh, human knowledge and uh, belief. Now, of course, I, I, I don't actually think that that's the restriction to the human is, is, is as we're built into uh, the nature of epistemology, I think is perfectly uh, appropriate for us, uh, as, you know, as I talked about in the first lecture, to, to consider uh, uh, the knowledge of non-human animals. Um, and of course, you know, in, in theists like to discuss the, the God's knowledge and, and so on. And all of that seems to me per perfectly uh, appropriate. But, if, but well, two, two points are worth making. I mean, one is that we're so much more familiar with the, the case of human knowledge and belief than with any other kind of knowledge and belief, that uh, it's still going to be central to a lot of uh, epistemology. Um, and, uh, and the other is that um, although it, it's true that, that knowledge and belief are not restricted to human beings, um, the only creatures that are going to be capable of knowledge and belief are going to be very, very complex creatures. You know, and as a creature with no complexity just has, uh, you know, a, a, a particle or, or something. It, it does not have a, a knowledge or belief. It's, it simply doesn't have the kind of complexity that's re required for such uh, mental uh, states. Um, and and so, uh, in epistemology, we're going to be um, concerned with uh, properties of extremely complex systems, and the, exactly the kind of systems for which we might expect 
a model building methodology to be required because it's difficult to find enough in the way of uh, universal generalizations. Um, a, a, another example is uh, the philosophy of language, where a, you know, very similar re remarks could be made that, that in philosophy of language, we're not uh, in principle restricted to human language, but hum human language, I mean, even after all, animal languages, if we even call them that, are, are, are such limited uh, things and so little understood by comparison with human language that 99% that, you know, of our time uh, in, in, do, in philosophy of language is concerned with something that we're thinking of as, in principle, a, a human language. And, and so it's, it's also going to, uh, in some way, uh, inherit the, uh, the complexity of the, the, the beings that speak and hear this, this language, uh, interpret it. Um, so, that, so that's another case. I think in, in the case uh, of uh, moral and uh, political philosophy, it's exactly the same, that uh, although it, in principle we're concerned uh, with a, a higher level of uh, generality than just humans, that in practice, Almost all the time, we're, we're talk, we're, we're, what we have in mind are something like uh, human uh, agents. And in, in any case, uh, any agents for which moral and political considerations are relevant, where we, as where we can judge them uh, morally or, uh, or talk about the, the politics of uh, their society, are going to be extremely complex um, creatures of just the kind for which a model building methodology would have, tend to be invoked you know, in, in uh, biology uh, or whatever. Um, and uh, I mean, this will also be the case for, um, for example, for philosophy of art, where, I mean, where, where we're mainly concerned uh, with human uh, art. And it, it, will, it will be the case for, for a lot of metaphysics. Uh, I mean, uh, I mean, maybe not, as I said, the, the most fundamental kinds of metaphysics. But for example, you know, if you take something like um, the, the philosophy of personal identity, I mean, the p personal identity is concerned with the identity of persons. Persons you know, are, by, by their nature, highly complex uh, creatures. And so that might also be uh, something that uh, requires um, a model building methodology. And uh, of course, uh, uh, philosophy of mind, uh, I mean, the, that exactly the same kinds of considerations are, are going to apply to that, that um, although, although we may be concerned with minds which are, are simpler than human minds in some cases, I mean, you know, animal minds or, or whatever, uh, any creature with, uh, with a mind is, is of a sufficient complexity that we can expect a model building methodology that will be our well, if we would, as we were speaking from a, a scientific point of view, it's exactly the kind of methodology that we would expect to have to resort to in order to uh, understand it. Um, so, so on, uh, as we were coming at, at this um, a priori, it would, it w we would expect that vast areas of philosophy are, are ones which call out for a model building uh, methodology. Um, uh, so the question is, well, have we been applying such a methodology? Um, because it's, it's, it certainly is not the way that we typically think about what we're doing in studying these uh, topics. So I think the, um, one case to think about uh, is uh, philosophy of language. Um, one thing I should say here about what, 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 how we should be looking for model building in philosophy and what, what we should be on the lookout for. Um, I mean, model building is, is not the same as just the use of formal techniques. I mean, mathematics, uh, for example, is, uh, I mean, oh, all of mathematics uses formal techniques, but it's but it's not it's not actually a, a model building um, enterprise in in the way that that I've been uh, discussing. Um, so 
So it, it's not enough just to find uh, places where we've been using formal techniques in philosophy. Um, but, but we should expect that where there is model building, we will be using formal techniques because the, oh, I mean, the point of, of studying the models is that we can, st we can treat the models uh, as well autonomously. We can just look at the model and ask the question, you know, how does this model work without constantly having to refer back to the phenomenon that we're concerned with. I mean, with the, we, we want to achieve this kind of quasi uh, mathematical uh, understanding of the, uh, of the model. Or, I mean, not just quasi, I mean, to maybe perfectly mathematical understanding uh, of it. Um, in philosophy, I mean, we shouldn't necessarily expect these to be mathematical in a very narrow sense. I mean, these don't have to be um, qu quantitative uh, models. Uh, so we shouldn't expect that these that to be differential equations, uh, for example, although there could be. Uh, uh, but, but what we should expect is that the, the, the description of the model that, uh, is given in terms which are sufficiently uh, precise and informative that we can derive all sorts of interesting consequences from them. Um, but you know, it, it might well be that the, the model would be described in terms which are precise in a way that's characteristic of, of logic rather than the, the, the more kind of quantitative thing that we often have with, with models in natural uh, science. Now, if you think about the development of uh, philosophy of uh, language uh, you know, over the, the past 150 uh, years. Uh, of course, I mean, Frege uh, introduced uh, formal languages um, which are specified in, uh, in an extremely precise way and where, where we've got all sorts of rules for, uh, for how these languages uh, work. But I mean, I don't. I don't think that it's it's particularly helpful to think of of him as uh, as engaging in a model building enterprise. What really what his focus uh, was just on producing a a, a language that would be uh, pr precise and expressive enough for scientific uh, purposes. I mean. I mean, in a way, his remarks about natural language are somewhat in incidental to that, although they're extremely uh, illuminating. And uh, w when w when we come to sort of the, the sort of next generation, uh, Russell and early Wittgenstein, for example, who are also concerned with uh, formal languages and are, are as we're in a way more concerned about their relation to. Uh, the way we actually uh, think, in principle, uh, than than uh, Frege was, um, they're, they're still not. They're not really thinking of it in model building terms because uh, what they're sort of <laughs> more inclined to think is that this might be revealing, simply revealing the actual logical uh, form of uh, of our the sentences of our language, even though it's. Uh, very, very um, well concealed by the by the surface form. Um, I mean, maybe there are early examples, but but uh, it seems to me that that w where you really get a kind of model building uh, approach coming into philosophy of language is with uh, Carnap, um, where he's. For example, in um, Meaning and Necessity uh, from 1947, uh, he's, he's giving um, descriptions of model uh, in languages with intentional operators. He's, sh he's showing how to, as it were, to go beyond the sort of truth f functional extensional kind of uh, semantics that works for the ordinary um, the, well, for the language of mathematics, in order to to be able to handle modal operators such as possibly and uh, necessarily, and uh, and he's doing that by an an early form of, of 
what we would now think of as, as possible worlds semantics. And, and in, actually, he does make the connection with, with Leibniz's possible worlds. But he, he's thinking, he's, officially, he's thinking of them as state descriptions, something more linguistic than possible worlds. But for my purposes, the key thing is that what he's doing is describing hypothetical languages, which he's, he's not interested in um, these as, you know, he's not claiming that, that, that these languages are, are capture the underlying structure of all natural languages or whatever. It's, it's something more like what, what some people would call a proof of concept. It's, he's showing how a simple language with intentional operators, operators which operate on the, the possible world uh, dimension, um, can work. And he's, and he's giving absolutely precise rules for, uh, for the semantics of this, uh, this language um, so, th uh, th so that you can calculate the, uh, the intention of uh, complex expressions from the uh, intentions of their uh, components, and um, so that you, you can you can simply calculate what the consequences uh, of uh, his his stipulations are. You can you can work out which formulas uh, are equivalent to each other, you know, which which entail each other, and and so on. So so it, it seems to be there that it's. It's quite appropriate to say that he is using a model building methodology to to understand uh, how um, some intentional operators work. He's he's seeing how how we can get them to work in a very uh, simple uh, case. Um, uh, and if we if we sort of zoom forwards to uh, to contemporary. Uh, philosophy of language. Again, I, I, on the whole, philosophers of language uh, don't describe what they're doing as model building. I mean, they, they describe, you know, they're trying to do the semantics of some expression uh, of natural language, um, and um, and their their descriptions are often, you know. Of, of the methodology, or of, you know, so, so people made a certain proposal, and then that gets refuted by a, a, a counterexample, and then we make a different proposal, and so on. And you know, and it, one can, one can, you know, if one describes what's going on in in traditional terms, it just seems like you know a, a record of abject failure of one uh, proposal after another being refuted by counterexamples. But you know, if you think that. In effect, what is being provided of various kinds of uh, model for how bits of language can work, um, then it seems to me that we can understand the, the kind of development that we've had as involving very considerable progress. I mean, we, 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 both, both that, you know, of both kinds of knowledge that I mentioned in respect of uh, the knowledge that we get from the model building methodology in natural science. I mean, we're, we're both getting lots and lots of knowledge about how these semantic uh, models uh, work. Um, and I mean, as it were, the, the kind of purely logical model about what their implications are. And we're getting a lot of um, knowledge of this more, less precise kind about how well they fit the phenomena of uh, natural language. Um, so, it, you know, w once we under reinterpret what's going on in terms of a model building methodology, as a, maybe that doesn't even recognize its own nature, it, um, that it, we can have a, a much more upbeat assessment of what's going on. And it's, it's not that we're somehow cheating in our assessment, it's that we're, that we're just considering that the kind of progress we're making is the kind of progress that actually is made all, all, all the time in the natural sciences. Much, you know, we, we, but as we're, in order to do justice to the natural sciences as well as to philosophy, we need to recognize this kind of progress according to a model building uh, methodology. Um, I think somewhat similar remarks can be, can be made about uh, epistemology where 
the, the, uh, where I think th there's actually perhaps more a tendency already to, to think of what we're doing as, as model building. Although I think there are a lot of old, sort of more old-fashioned epistemologists who don't really understand what model building is and uh, sort of don't recognize this. But I think in formal epistemology, um, people are building models of uh, epistemic um, phenomena, things like uncertainty and uncertainty about uncertainty and those kind of things. And in, I mean, there are a couple of traditions there. One, one is uh, the sort of Bayesian uh, tradition of uh, probabilistic modeling, and the uh, other is the uh, tradition of epistemic uh, logic, uh, going back to Hintika, um, where we're, we're more focused on a knowledge and belief than on probability, but, 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 but those two traditions can also be, uh, to some you know, extent, uh, combined, and you can, you can have models which have both a probabilistic and a knowledge and belief uh, dimension uh, to them. And, and so we're, we're exploring epistemological phenomena by this model building uh, methodology, and I think in that case too, we're making progress of exactly the kind that is made in other model building um, disciplines in other areas of of science. Um, you know, in the case of um, moral and political uh, philosophy, uh, which I mean, that might seem a, a lot less uh, conducive to this sort of thing, but you know, I, I think that. You know, if you consider the role that um, decision theory and game theory have played in moral and political uh, philosophy, I mean, a lot of the time they're concerned with um, with model building. So, for you know, in, for example, um, with prisoner's dilemma or something like that. I mean, prisoner's dilemma is a very, very simple model of uh, certain kinds of uh, moral dilemma. Uh, were involved well and moral and even in, in, in incipiently political because they involve you know the, uh, the interaction uh, effects but between different agents and so on. Uh, um, so so that I, I think in fact quite a lot of model building uh, activity has been going on for the, you know for decades in in philosophy um, and. Uh, we should we should recognize that that's what we're doing. That we're making progress of the kind that is appropriate to the methodology, and that the methodology is appropriate to the complexity of the phenomena. But also, I, I think we should be looking for um, new ways in which to apply this methodology. That that the, the, the there may be all sorts of uh, cases where. Um, we could make better progress than we have been making by starting to think in terms of uh, this model building methodology. I'm not suggesting that, that everything has to be done in a model building way, but I think there is a lot of scope for uh, this kind of methodology. Uh, and it's going, to be, it's going to be very different in feel from uh, the way that we've been uh, doing things. Um, I, I got some understanding of of this um, when it, when I had a colleague uh, who was uh, in, in Oxford who was a uh, a theoretical economist. I mean, one who actually knew, knew quite a bit of uh, philosophy as as well. I mean, but but uh, I mean, we wrote some joint papers together, and um, I, I'm, in discussing a lot of these uh, issues. Um, I, you know, I was struck by how different his his take was on a lot of the things, even though, I mean, in theoretical economics, there's lots of work which is pretty much philosophical, in fact, about, uh, I mean, partly, you know, in decision kind of theoretic areas, but also a lot of the work that's been done in epistemic logic has, in fact, been done by uh, economists. Um, but, uh, you know, who are interested in in things like common knowledge, you know, and so on, because uh, you know, game theory is uh, in, is very important in theoretical e economics, and uh, game theory depends on things about um, what whether all the players know that all the players know that all the players know something, and and, and so on. So the, the, I mean, it turns out that epistemic logic is is very important for theoretical uh, e economics, but it, but it, 
in, I mean, to give you an example of the kind of culture shock of uh, you know, talking to somebody who was thinking in these terms, even though they were thinking about you know, pretty philosophical issues. Uh, we were talking, uh, I was talking with this economist colleague uh, about Gettier and, uh, and about the effect of uh, his counterexamples. And, and, and my uh, economist uh, colleague said, yeah, well, in economics, uh, Gettier's paper would not have been considered publishable. Um, and... Um, you know, this is, this is as well, supposed to be one of the great triumphs of analytic philosophy. And, you know, and so, and, and, the, and the reason that it wouldn't have been considered publishable is that people using a model building methodology take it for granted that the, 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 the generalizations built into their models are, are not exceptionless, that, that, that they, they, don't, they don't accurately fit uh, reality. Um, and, and so somebody just pointing out that, that, that as it were, one of these assumptions and built into a model doesn't accurately fit reality is only telling people what they already expected. Um, now, of course, in a way, that's a completely unfair criticism of Gettier, because after all, the people that Gettier was criticizing, uh, they certainly did intend their analyses of, lo of uh, knowledge to be exceptionless and in fact necessary uh, universal generalizations. And, and so if somebody's putting something forward uh, like that, then uh, of course it's, it's relevant to point out that, that it does not meet the standard that the person who, who put the analysis forward uh, intended uh, to meet. Um, but, but if we were work, if we're working in a, a more deliberately model building spirit, then counterexamples are, are not going to play the same role for, the, for, for this reason. And the, the spirit of the methodology is, is much more this, that as it were, the, the way, well, not so much to defeat a model as to, uh, to go beyond a model is by producing a better model. Counterexamples don't cut it in this methodology, but because the, I mean, a counterexample in you know a, a, a way uh, of kind of you know a, a case where the the assumptions aren't uh, of the model aren't true. It, all it is is it's a a stimulus or provocation to um, to develop a better model, that a, a model that can reproduce the successes of the previous model, but also can enable us to understand this further uh, complexity which the original uh, model couldn't uh, capture. Um, and, and so if, if, you've, if, you've got, um, a, if you've got a better model, uh, then, then, you go, then you publish your better model and you, and, and you use the counterexample to show in what respect it is a better model. But you don't regard this as a refutation of the previous model, and, and, you, and you take it for granted that the new model will also uh, have all sorts of assumptions built into it, which in some respects are wildly inaccurate. Um, it seems to me that this kind of methodology um, is, a, is a much more constructive one for us to be uh, engaging in. Um, I, I mean, it's, it's both, as it were, it's a more positive take on a lot of the activity, but it's, it's also a, a, a more productive uh, way of directing our energies, rather than locking horns about whether you know, a particular um, proposed counterexample uh, works or, or not. Um, we, what we should be doing is just, is just improving, um, improving our models, and, uh, and and then in that process we can take uh, we can take care of the uh, of the current examples and um, I mean handle them as they should be. I mean, uh, and so for example, one kind of thing that I've been interested in doing is is coming at Gettier uh, cases using a model building methodology, and I've. I'm, um, I've, you know, I've been arguing that, in fact, if, if you think of these phenomena not so much in terms of thought experiments, but uh, in terms of uh, models, 
you know, and you try to model you know, a justified tree belief analysis of knowledge. What, what, what you realize is that, that um, from on just on in model building terms, you would not expect a justified tree belief account of uh, of knowledge to to work because it just it just constrains things in in an extremely uh, unnatural uh, way. I'm, so I'm not suggesting that model building should simply supersede uh, thought experiments. I think thought experiments are an important source of insight in philosophy. But I think we get a much more robust uh, methodology if if we use both thought experiments and model building. And in cases where those two uh, kinds of method converge on a, 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 you know, a single answer to a question, then, then we've got a, a much better basis of support than, in, uh, than when we're relying entirely on just uh, one of those uh, methods. And the final thing I will say about model building is that um, but once you get into the spirit of it, it's actually an extremely enjoyable activity. It's like you know, it's like having a Lego set and you know, and, and playing about with your Lego. And you can build all sorts of of things, you know, strange buildings. And um, and it has one huge advantage over. Lego, which is that, that, you, that you don't run out of bricks when you're two-thirds of the way through the, the construction. And I'll recommend it to you on those grounds. <laughs> Some areas in philosophy might be areas where you can't build models. Um, like you mentioned that, for instance, in logic you don't need to build models. Uh, perhaps also in, in the philosophy of mathematics, where we, uh, maybe that's more metaphysical about the nature of numbers or something, uh, where we have to make assumptions. In order to build a model, you have to make some assumptions about logic and mathematics. So those are the tools that you use in building the model, uh, at least they're often involved. And so, somebody building a model, if you assume classical logic in building your model, then that, that methodology probably won't help you see how good like, that atheist logic is building, building already. Yeah, but, so with model building, what, what we're concerned with, um, is comparing models. I mean, you know, because we, 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 we don't regard models as things that you either prove or refute or anything like that. Um, and and so, if it, I mean, w within a model building methodology, the the challenge would be to a um, a dialetheist to give to give their account of the methodology and. Um, and you know, in, in particular, um, you know, it, whatever whatever kind of thing we're, we're doing, there would be the, the dialetheist would be expected to use uh, the dialetheist logic in uh, studying that whatever models they were concerned with. And I, you know, and it's pretty clear what will happen. They with dialetheist logic, it's too weak to prove anything very much about models. So so that, so actually, uh, dialetheism will kind of tend to grind to a, a halt uh, on this um, methodology, and that's it, one of its problems. But, but I guess my worry is rather that suppose a dialetheist puts forward like, some model, and then you, looking at from a, from a classicist point of view, will say, well, that you're clearly wrong because you're, you're, what you're saying is inconsistent. And so the dialetheist will say, you, but yeah, but I mean, you, but you don't have to make that criticism. I mean, I mean, so, so for example, um, you know, suppose suppose that the dialetheist is trying to show um, how mathematics uh, can be developed within a dialetheist framework, um, and and so I think. Um, you know, uh, uh, 
some aspects of model building, I think, come in very naturally there almost at once because, because what, we, what we'll be expecting is that what they do is to take a, as, were, as an extremely simplified bit of mathematics and, you know, this, and, and just show how, um, how a dialethist account would work for some very small fragment of mathematics. I mean, so th that's not all the f features of um, the model building methodology, but it's it's some, and we were concentrating on a you know on a simple uh, example, and uh, and then we can say, all right, you know, so let's you, you take this simple case, uh, just you know, go ahead and d develop develop your mathematics in this simple case using your dialetheist logic, and you know, I mean, the ge the general problem is that dialetheist logic is so weak that they can't develop it, uh, you know, and. Um, that uh, and uh, it's, you know, w without making very at some level making some some classical uh, assumptions, and uh, I mean of course this is now to some extent just going to the uh, more general uh, abductive methodology. But you know, but, but we do, we don't you know I don't I don't think that the that, that the classical critique. Of uh, of dialetheism has to be of the form. Look, your you know your, your theory is inconsistent. So, I mean, we say, all right, go ahead, just do things your way. Let, let's see, let's see how you can do it. And and what actually happens is they have to sneak in classical logic somewhere. And you know they have various kind of justifications for, which they offer for sneaking it in, but but the, 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 um, none of it properly works. You know, so the, I mean, the, we judge them by their fruits, and they can't produce any. Thanks. Um, yeah. So my question is about two kinds of knowledge situations. Um, uh, so. As far as I understand, you said that the model building sort of first of all gives us mathematical knowledge about the model. Yeah. And secondly, then we can figure out in a less exact sort of vague way which models are better than others, how they fit the phenomena. Right. Uh, but you also talked about uh, repeatedly about understanding the phenomena. Yeah. And um, so my question is about. Uh, do you distinguish between knowledge and understanding in this context? Uh, in that uh, understanding can be perhaps not factive, something like that. Um, so maybe like close to being true or something like this, uh, in this ballpark. And um, and if so would the so they, because we presumably we make models in order to get yeah. the phenomena. We're not interested in the models themselves, but rather the world around us. So would you take the so the aim of scientific inquiry then to be understanding of the world. Or so uh, I, I mean, it's a, it's a little bit unclear what it means for not understanding to be factive because we 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 normally just talk about understanding why you know but 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 I I think it, I mean my own view is that uh, that understanding must be understood in terms of knowledge and so that understanding, um, it, I mean so. Uh, will will be factive, you know, fundamental. You know, once we we kind of tease out what that will require. Um, but but of course, when we when people are talking about understanding, they're typically talking about understanding why something is the case or how it's the case. So you know, if if it's if, but you know, uh, un, you know, if it's understanding uh, why um, p, um, I take it that. That really, under, what understanding YP involves is um, knowing something of the form um, P, knowing that P because Q. Um, because the, understanding YP is basically knowing the, the answer to the question. Uh, why p, <laughs> and the answer to the question why p will be something roughly of the form p because q, um, and uh, and and so uh, knowing that uh, p because q requires it to be true that p because q, so the so so it it do, that does need to be factive, and and, and that's. But that's consistent with what I was saying because because we we have this weaker kind of 
I mean, messy sort of knowledge, you know, of, of the form. The knowledge, the the um, the mo this model is better in some respects than in others, and um, and then that gives us some kind of, as it were, <laughs> vaguer knowledge of, of uh, you know, the the, the, the let's say the the development of what the population over time exhibits such and such a pattern or whatever um, because uh, of it's some it's something like this you know and so you ha you have I think you have to build in qualifications like you know r r it's approximately the case that into the content of the knowledge you know it, so the I mean because you can know that it's a you know a pro that it's a, roughly the case that P even, and that requires it to be true that it's roughly the case at P, but it doesn't require it to be true that P. Right, but it also, could also be roughly the case that P because of Q. Yes. Uh, so there's the story about the proximate yes. causal. Yes, yes, yeah, because, I, you know, I, I, and I think this is, this is a natural thing to say about the uh, understanding uh, that one gets from models, in, in, in that, it, it, it's natural to say that the understanding you get from these models uh, is not perfect, complete understanding. You know, it, it's a kind of um, a sort of loose understanding. You know, and 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 it's the kind of understanding that that you get. Um, you know, when you know that it, you know it's roughly like this. But, but the, the roughness or the vagueness is built into so what is known. So it's yes, it's it's built into what is known. That's right. Yeah. And so it, has, it really has to be true that it is roughly like this. <laughs> so I was wondering, uh, is, is model building a, an, an abductive enterprise? Because apparently there, there's two uh, very uh, important factors playing a role in both of them, which is one is simplification, and the other one is, um, I, mean, I mean, simplification and uh, both Prediction and explanatory power seem to be very uh, like some virtues yes. in both of them. Except, yeah. except in, in model building, it's kind of I think better in a, in a sense that it, it is relying on mathematics, which is which is a much more reliable source of I don't know justification or, or making a theory. And then then if if that is the case, then I'm I'm wondering why are people resistant more. Whereas model building approach or methodology rather than abductive one. Well, more resistant about model building. Yeah. Yeah. But I, well, if you're talking about philosophers, I you know I think that I, I'm not sure to what extent they're resistant because the, the, this this is not you know it's it's not really a, an option that has been very much discussed until until extremely recently. Um, you know. It, 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 I mean, you know, one or two papers have have been coming out over the last decade about it, but but it's not been at all, you know, central to um, meta philosophical discussion, um, and and so you know, I think it. I mean, it may be. I mean, people whether how how resistant people will will be remains to be seen. Really, I mean, I've, what is true is that 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 there. Uh, th there are various aspects of their practice that um, that don't that don't fit very well with a model building method methodology. And there's certainly, I think, the, you know, the, the, there's um, the, there's a certain amount of incomprehension of a model building methodology, uh, for example, amongst uh, epistemologists, because they they kind of they don't understand um, that that models are not intended to be you know hypotheses you know which which you're, which you're advancing you know as because uh, you think they're genuinely or may genuinely be the, the, the case and so they they don't kind of understand that the that the the role of counterexamples is is completely different and you know and less central than they're, they're used to it but but. Um, but I think that that may be um, more to do with unfamiliarity with this way of thinking than than with, as you were, considered resistance to it. Just, just, just do, you, do you agree that this is uh, like model building is some sort of abductive? I mean, I think it's uh, it it has a lot in it has a lot of abductive 
uh, features. But of course, I mean, the, not all abductive methodology is model building because we can be using abduction, um, you know, when we really are trying to um, to find out exceptionless uh, laws. Um, and I think uh, it's. I mean, one way in which it varies from as with the kind of standard cases of abduction is that, that we're putting much less weight on f fit with the evidence uh, than, than in standard cases. I mean, I mean, of course, in the end, we, you know, we want some kind of fit, but, uh, but of a much looser sort. And, you know, when I was talking about the abductive methodology yesterday, the idea that we have a loose, uh, uh, you know, that we don't, uh, allow fit with evidence to to trump everything else was w that was just there in order to recognize that we can be mistaken as to what our evidence is but w when we're model building um, even where um, there's there's no mistake at all about what our evidence is, and no doubt as to what our evidence is, and no doubt that that the assumptions of the model are not perfectly accurate. The you know the, the model, rem as it were, remains can or can remain in in good standing. So you know it's a it's a kind if you like it's a cousin of of, of the abductive methodology. Thank you. So uh, you were making a point about the prevalence of uh, impossible models in natural sciences and how they're worthy of consideration even though they're not possible and also maybe of some use. So my question is, would you attribute any success to these kind of models in different areas of philosophy? And if you do, how seriously should we be pursuing them? OK, so um, so I, I th I would think that that's um, fine um, in philosophy uh, too. Um, I, I mean, here's quite whether it's impossible or not, but, but I mean, here's a very extreme idealization that is standard uh, in epistemic logic, which, one which is known as uh, logical omniscience. Um, so standard models of um, epistemic Logic. I mean, they have they have the implication that that it, you know if you've got some premises, let's say p one to um, to p n, and and they entail a conclusion q, then if you know p one to p n, then you also know q, you know. And so if you know the, if you know the elementary axioms of mathematics, you also know Fermat's last theorem, and so on. And so, um, and, and, and there's no, there's no um, qualification of the form as long as you've derived Q from them. It's just if Q does in fact logically follow from P1 to Pn, and you know these, then you know that. And, and so, now, I, I, I mean, people have different attitudes to this. So somebody like Stolmaker thinks that this just is a truth about not knowledge. But, uh, it, it, you know, if you're thinking about it, it, you know, in a way that corresponds more to our computational um, capacities, then, um, then this uh, it seems like completely, uh, completely false. And, and, it's, and, it, and by the way, there's also a similar thing with belief, that if you believe all of these, you, ca you count as believing Q as well. And, and one effect of that is if you have inconsistent beliefs, then it turns out that you believe absolutely every proposition whatsoever. You know, and that, it, it's very hard to, to say that that's, that is really the case for human beings, that, that, that any human being who, who has inconsistent beliefs, which presumably is pretty much every human being, um, also, also believes every proposition. Was. So, 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 you know, I think a, a reasonable way of, of viewing these is as um, extreme uh, idealizations. And, um, and I... And I think, uh, in fact, a lot of epistemologists have dismissed the relevance of epistemic logic because they because they thought that these idealizations uh, were uh, were too ex you know were, were just well were they just thought these are counterexamples so we don't need to pay any attention to this. Now, uh, another aspect I haven't been emphasizing so much about the model building methodology is you know you, you, in applying it you do need some kind of skill and judgment about uh, wh where these. Um, you know, idealizations um, matter, and you know, um, um, in, and where uh, 
you know, what conclusions you can legitimately draw from the model. And so, you know, if somebody were to, to use epistemic logic just to, just to insist that you, in fact, do believe all the uh, logical consequences of what you believe, I mean, th that, would be, that would be an abuse of the models because that's really an, an assumption built into the models. And it's like somebody, pretty much like somebody is insisting that planets really are point masses or something. But... I mean, I'll just, just to give you an example of the kind of way in which um, I, th I think it's uh, this this kind of idealization is actually extremely helpful in philosophy. Is you know uh, w one of the things I've been interested in is um, what what kind of uh, implications do, do uh, the limits on our perceptual capacities, our capacities to discriminate in, in vision and other, right, other senses. What, what implications do those limitations have for the structure of our knowledge? I mean, in particular, things like, do, you know, do, do they have any implications for the principle that if we, if we know then we, the P, then we know that we know P? And, um, and, and so w w there, what we're interested in doing is studying the, the consequences of one kind of limitation, perceptual limitation. But it's actually very helpful in doing that to, abs to eliminate other kind of limitations on our knowledge. For example, limitations that come from our, the, the, our limited computational capacity, our limited powers of drawing consequences. And so, you know, uh, so in effect, if you study um, models of epistemic logic where um, there are p limits on people's powers of discrimination perceptually, but there are no limits on their logical powers, then th whatever kind of limitations are on the, uh, in the structure of their overall knowledge emerge from that, they're really coming from the limitations uh, on their perceptual discrimination, not from any other limitations. And so that you can, as it were, you can isolate the, the consequences of one type of, li of limitation by abstracting away from the other types. So that, you know, it's not just that, that th these are kind of simplifications that we have to put up with uh, because otherwise we, we can't derive anything or something. It, th these are, uh, abs these are uh, uh, abstractions which often help us to, to focus in on one aspect of the phenomena of, of, of interest. And, you know, and so, uh, you know, I think, um, I, mean, I mean, you might, perhaps you could even argue that, th that this kind of logical omniscience I've been talking about is, that, is, is impossible for, for any, you know, because of a creature that, you know, that, that actually, ex you know, genuinely has knowledge and belief will have to have some kind of uh, computational processes and 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 maybe so may, maybe necessary that there are there are limits uh, on on our computational powers and that and that they will have li imply limitations on uh, the extent to which we um, you know our beliefs are closed under logical consequence uh, but even so even if these models are in fact impossible they're still giving us a lot of insight into you know, something else, i.e. the effects of um, perceptual, limited perceptual discrimination on the structure of our knowledge. So, so my answer is, yes, the, um, this methodology is fine in philosophy even when the, it, it involves impossible assumptions. And, you know, and I think the, the, the case of, of, of how how that works in biology, you know, it kind of shows that, that we, we should not regard that as a very paradoxical conclusion, although it suddenly sounds very strange when we, you, you first hear it. John, Hi, thanks. Uh, I'm very happy with this idea that what we do or we should be doing when we do philosophy is to some extent model building. But I'm puzzled by the way you introduce the notion of model building, because you argue that these models in science typically are based on uh, differential equations yeah. and their variables. And I take that some of these variables are bounded by universal quantifiers. So in the end, it seems to me that they are uh, universal laws. But the, the, the models, I mean, they're, these, these are universal, uh, I mean, the differential equations, uh, they're universal principles, but, but they're, uh, 
but they're false universal principles, right? I mean, because the, differ the differential equations, um, they, they require, um, I mean, so for example, you know, a, uh, you know one consequence of the differential uh, equations will be that um, if, if at, at one time there are 29 foxes, and at a later time, there are 30 foxes. So at some intermediate time, there were 29.5 foxes. And that's false. There were never 29.5 foxes. Um, and, and so that I agree that, that, that we're in the, in the models, we're, we're making assumptions which have the form of universal generalizations. But, uh, but these universal generalizations are ones that we know perfectly well are false. Right, but they might be true or false. That's not my point. The point is that they are universal laws. Yeah, but it, well, but I mean, it's not. If it's false, it's not a law. It's just a, 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 a failed candidate for a law. I mean, the what I was contrasting the the, the model building methodology uh, with was um, a a search for universal laws uh, where these laws are meant to be true, right? I mean, you know, I was saying exceptionless laws, so, um, and. Um, and w where, uh, you know, if, if, so if we're in the mode of uh, seeking universal laws, um, as soon as we find out that, that a generalization isn't true, then we, that, then we realize that that is not what we were looking for. Well, I think it's more a matter of attitude that we have toward these laws, as opposed to the fact if there are laws, if we're dealing with universal laws or not. I don't think that that's really the issue. I think what kind of attitude should we take toward them? Yeah, but I mean, but the, so one thing is, are we dealing with universal generalizations? Yes, both laws and models involve universal generalizations. But but the the difference is that that, that when we're engaged in a as we're a search for laws of nature, what we're seeking are are, are universal generalizations, which at an absolute minimum are true. And and when we're model building. We're not expecting that, the, that any of the universal generalizations that, that, that we're using to define the models will be true. So I'm happy with this idea that it's a return of attitude. Thank you. Okay, more questions then. Thank you very much. Well, <laughs> thank you. Okay, let us begin. It's, it's an honor to present an um, eminent Oxford philosopher, Timothy Williamson, giving a sort of public lecture here. Yeah, it's, it's a part of Frege lectures he's been giving for the past few days. But this is a public lecture. It's, it's supposed to be a little less complicated and a little more open to, to the public. The lecture is called Knowledge from Imagination. And then Timothy will tell you all about it. But before that, um, maybe a short description of the person. So, <laughs> Timothy Williamson is the Wycombe Professor of Logic at Oxford University. And then he's the author of several books and papers, including such books as, as Wagner's, uh, Philosophy of Philosophy, the Modal Logic as Metaphysics, mm. Knowledge and Its Limits, it's a really important book in epistemology. And most recently, Doing Philosophy, which is really closely related to the, to the content of these year's Frege lectures. So the lecture will run about an hour, and then there will be sort of half an hour for questions. So I hope you will enjoy the event. Thank you. Well, thank you. It's a it's a pleasure to be uh, here. I'm I'm going to be talking this this afternoon ab about the the relation between two things that all of us uh, do a lot of: uh, knowing things and uh, imagining things. Um, and I, I think if one first starts thinking about the the relation between uh, knowledge and imagination, it's it's quite natural to to jump to the conclusion that that these are uh, opposites, and and that's the, the sort of stereotype that that we associate 
with them. So roughly speaking, uh, we tend to think of uh, knowledge as concerned uh, with the world of fact and imagination as concerned uh, with the uh, world of uh, fiction. And what I'm going to be doing today is suggesting that um, that uh, picture of the relation between uh, knowledge and imagination is completely wrong, um, and uh, that it would be much closer to the truth to think of uh, imagination as a means uh, to knowledge, as a way of getting knowledge than as the opposite of knowledge. Uh, but I, I will also say something um, at, about the uh, imagination and, and its role with fiction, but, but rather uh, suggesting that, that that is not the, the, as it were, the central role for um, imagination uh, to, to play. So that's, that's what I'm going to be uh, doing. Um, I think a, a good uh, starting point for uh, thinking about the uh, I imagination is uh, in a kind of uh, utterly speculative way to think a bit about uh, why it might be uh, that, that humans uh, have this very elaborate uh, capacity for imagination, and uh, how, I mean, how it is that we might have uh, evolved uh, to to have uh, such an imagination. I mean, as where if one thinks of imagination as the kind of thing that one that enables us to to write novels or something, it's not very obvious why human beings uh, would have evolved to have the capacity to write uh, novels. Um, I, I should make a. a few clarifications straight away. I, I'm going to be talking uh, about the, the human imagination today, because after all, that's the, the form of imagination that we are uh, by, um, by far best acquainted with it. But I'm not uh, assuming that we are the only animals that have uh, some kind of uh, imagination. Um, I, in fact, it seems to me uh, quite uh, plausible that, that other animals, even, for example, cats and dogs, uh, do have some, some form uh, of uh, imagination. Um, and, uh, and I think as I, as I continue, you'll, you'll see why the, the, some of the basic functions of imagination are things that we might very well uh, share with, with other animals. But I'm not, I'm not going to be uh, focusing on uh, on them, uh, but of course, it is relevant that uh, the the evolution of imagination uh, uh, may be something uh, that that happened not not just in the history of the the human species, but to uh, as well our non-human ancestors. Uh, the second thing is, I'm, it's not, of course, it's not automatic that if we have imaginations that uh, that we, as it were, evolved imagination because the imagination plays some uh, function. I mean, it could be that uh, the imagination is something that we have as just, as it were, if, uh, a, a byproduct of something else, some other kind of mental function, which, we, uh, which did serve some, as it were, e evolutionary uh, function. And then we got the imagination for free alongside that. But I, I think that's, a, I mean, that's something that, in principle, uh, we, a, a hypothesis that we could entertain. But I think there are far more uh, direct uh, and explanatory uh, hypotheses that, that we, we should uh, consider b uh, before that. Um, even assuming that, as it were, the, that we, in some sense we evolved to, uh, uh, to have uh, or imagination, so as it were, the, the imagination was something that was uh, directly uh, selected for. I mean, that would not automatically have to be because uh, it, uh, it served some uh, practical uh, purpose that, that was independent uh, of... Uh, 
it, the, the effect of the imagination on, on other human beings or other members of the species. Um, I mean, we, you know, one could uh, try to tell a, a story a about uh, the, the evolution of the imagination, which would be more like uh, a, one kind of story that you might tell about the uh, evil evolution of uh, the magnificent uh, tales that uh, peacocks uh, have, where, um, where, I mean, it's not, as it were, that, that uh, the, the, their tales serve any direct practical purpose. I mean, they, can't, they don't use them for fighting or anything like that. But, uh, but I mean, they, they evolved uh, because uh, the females, the peahens, they, they like those uh, that kind of uh, tales. And, uh, and it could be that, you know, one could develop a story about the imagination uh, like that, that, uh, that people with a, a, a good uh, imagination are, you know, they're, they're going to be more fun to be with and, uh, and so they'll be, uh, they'll be better at, at acquiring partners. Um, I mean, they'll dance more imaginatively and they'll talk more imaginatively. And, I mean, you know, generally the, the imagination, you know, can be, be sexy. And, um, and so in that way, as it were, they, they got to uh, propagate themselves um, more than the unimaginative ones who, you know, who fail to, uh, to find uh, a partner. And, you know, if, if, if you think about the 1001 uh, Arabian Nights. Um, that's that's pretty much uh, what happens to the uh, Princess uh, Shahrazad, who uh, uses her imagination to to tell all these stories and and uh, keep herself from being uh, executed. And and in the end, you know, she gets to uh, to pass on her her DNA to the the children that she eventually uh, has. So th and and so she, that's the case where the imagination ha uh, had survival uh, value because of uh, it, it, the way it in which it impressed uh, another human uh, being. So that's that's as more the, more like the the peacock's tail kind of story about the imagination. And I, I'm not excluding that uh, that that uh, plays some role, but. Uh, I think that there is a, a more straightforward kind of uh, function that the imagination plays, which uh, we should we should focus on, uh, and give uh, more weight to. Um, and I, you know, I think one way of of getting at at that is is just to well use our own imaginations and and think about some some group uh, of our uh, ancestors uh, you know, traveling through uh, maybe some unfamiliar uh, territory, uh, um, for example, uh, entering a forest where they, they hadn't been before. And, and just ask yourself the, the question, um, what, what use would an imagination uh, be to, to those uh, people as, as as they uh, in went through this landscape, and and I think uh, pretty immediately uh, what that um, brings to mind is that uh, the imagination is is something that is going to be useful to them because uh, it uh, will suggest various kinds of. Uh, possibility to them that they need to be prepared for. Um, I mean, both uh, negative possibilities, dangers, and positive possibilities, opportunities, uh, so that, uh, for example, uh, they can be uh, prepared on, on the lookout uh, for dangerous wolves that might be uh, in, in the forest, um, and um, they can also be on the lookout for uh, edible berries uh, to pick and feed themselves as, as they wander through the forest. So that, uh, I mean, that's some pr rather direct practical use that the imagination uh, is, uh, is going to, uh, to be to them. And I, I think even at this very sort of elementary uh, level, we can, we can make... Um, some comments on 
uh, what the I imagination has to be like to, to serve this kind of uh, purpose. Uh, so, I, I mean, one, th one thing that, that it clearly has to be is uh, selective to some extent, because, I mean, if, if when they enter the, uh, the forest, uh, their, their imagination floods them with uh, hundreds of different possibilities, they're just not going to be able to, uh, to process that. I mean, that you c we can't handle hundreds of different possibilities, different scenarios to think about. Uh, and so the, uh, the, the imagination will just have to uh, select a, a small number of uh, possibilities. And uh, it, it's, it's only going to be useful if it selects possibilities in a broadly speaking, reality-oriented uh, way. Uh, so, for example, you know, one, one possibility that the imagination could uh, suggest to them um, is that uh, in the forest they will meet some, uh, some bears which will uh, cook them a delicious meal, and, uh, and that, I mean, that would be great. I mean, that's, I mean, that's certainly something that they can imagine. Uh, can imagine. But th and it's pretty much a waste of time to imagine something like that. I mean, what they, what they need to imagine are, the, uh, in some sense, the more uh, realistic uh, dangers and uh, threats, and on the other side, uh, opportunities. The ones that, that are much more uh, likely to... Uh, the, to be encountered. So that although the uh, imagination here is, is suggesting uh, possibilities, and these possibilities may or may not be actual, uh, it, it's only going to be useful if, it, um, if it's selecting ones which are, as it were, <laughs> realistic, which have uh, some chance of being actualized, or which you know, perhaps, as it were, are... Um, would be actualized, you know, if things were only slightly different or, or something like, uh, like that. Um, so th that's already a way in, in which it, it, imagination to serve this purpose can't just be completely uh, detached uh, from uh, reality. Um, a second thing to, uh, to notice uh, is that the imagination in these kind of uh, situations, it can operate in two different modes, which we, we might just describe as uh, voluntary and involuntary. Um, so, w voluntary uh, exercises of the imagination are ones which are, to, uh, uh, to some extent, under the, uh, the control of the, uh, the, the person's uh, will. And, uh, and so th those arise, for example, when we're dealing with some kind of uh, problem solving. So, for example, let's suppose that, that they, they come to a river and they, they, they have to find a way to get across the river. Um, then, then they can, as it were, direct their imaginations towards solving the problem of getting across the river. I, I've been finding a place where they can ford it or, or finding a tree that they might be able to cut down that, that, will, that will form a bridge over the river or, uh, or whatever else uh, it is. And so, I mean, to some extent, we have uh, control over our imaginations, and it's important that we have that uh, control. Uh, because th that way we can, we can turn them to solving problems that we need to solve. But it's also uh, important that, that imagination can operate uh, in an involuntary way. Uh, so, for example, you know, imagine them as they enter the, the forest, they're, they're, just, they're laughing and joking, having a good time. Um, but Sometimes it may be important that the imagination breaks in on that, uh, maybe even against their will, and uh, forces them to, to think about the dangers of the uh, forest, and even if that spoils their good, uh, good time. Um, and, and so uh, the imagination has got to be able to, um, to 
to break in against our will on our trains of thought sometime, to, to force us to, to focus uh, on things that it's, it's, we need to focus on, even if we don't particularly want to. Uh, and in, in that respect, I think the imagination uh, is, is like um, the, the faculty of uh, attention. Um, for example, attention, attending to something uh, in, in perception. So attention also has uh, both voluntary and uh, involuntary modes of operation. So uh, I mean, an example of voluntary attention, I've been supposing that, that you're, uh, you're a hunter and uh, a, a, you know, a, a rabbit has gone into a hole and, and then you want to, to watch the, the, the hole to wait for the rabbit to come out again and then you, maybe you can sh shoot it with your bow and arrow or whatever. And so, so in watching the hole, that's a form of voluntary uh, attention. But it's, it's also important that uh, the attention on something can be involuntary because, for example, you know, it, it's, it's important that, um, that your attention can be drawn, even when you're supposed to be, you know, when you're w wanting to think about something else, that your attention can be drawn, for example, by some slight movement on the, the periphery of your vision, which might turn out to be a tiger, you know, whatever it is, uh, lurking in the, in the bushes. And, uh, and so, uh, so we've got the same dichotomy with attention as, uh, as with imagination between voluntary and involuntary uses. And in the kind of uh, examples uh, that I've been uh, talking about, um, the, we might even think of uh, imagination as a kind of um, mental attention to possibilities, uh, perhaps in a slightly metaphorical uh, sense. Um, so, so both of them have this dual mode of uh, operation. Now, I mean, I think what I've been saying uh, so far is plausible, but it, it doesn't take us very, very far from the, the original kind of uh, stereotype of the uh, imagination. Um, and in, in, in articulating a bit more clearly w why we haven't yet got very far from that stereotype, uh, I want to, to use a, uh, a distinction which was uh, drawn by the, the philosopher of uh, science, uh, Hans Reichenbach, uh, between uh, what are known as the, the context of discovery and the, the context of justification. And I'll, I'll explain uh, this distinction as it op operates in, in the philosophy of, uh, of science and, and then apply it to the, the case of the uh, imagination. So it, the idea is in the philosophy of science is that the context of discovery is the context in which you come up with ideas or hypotheses uh, in the first place, in which, in which as it were, they first uh, enter your, your mind. And, and the, the, if we're going with a kind of stereotypical version of this contrast, um, the context of discovery, of just of thinking of these things in the first place, uh, is not really bound by a, a criteria of uh, rationality. So that you know, if if in uh, in order to think of, of new ideas, it, it helps you to uh, to get uh, to get drunk or you know to take drugs. I mean, f fair enough as far as uh, discovery goes on the on this stereotype. I mean, wh whatever it takes to come up with these. Uh, ideas, but uh, hypotheses. But of course, w once we've come up with the the hypotheses, then the the further so, you know, so so that was the context of discovery. But w once once we've we've got that, then uh, w w the further question arises: are, you know, are these hypotheses true, uh, or are they supported by the uh, evidence? Uh, and, and, and then once we, uh, once we want to, to 
address that question properly. We've, we've got to sober up or come down from our high and, uh, and enter the context of justification where suddenly um, <laughs> rationality becomes central in, in, in actually assessing these hypotheses, whether, whether they, act, they, they correspond uh, to, to reality. Um, so that's the, the, as well the general kind of uh, contrast in philosophy of science. I mean, of course, a very simplified thought between context of discovery and uh, context of justification. And what, what, what I w want to uh, point out is that the kind of uses of the imagination that I've been talking about so far are basically ones uh, in the context of discovery rather than in the context of uh, justification. Um, that they have to do with the imagination suggesting possibilities uh, to us, uh, and then we might th th then rationally evaluate these possibilities once uh, they've, they've come to mind. I mean, already actually one or two of the things that I've been saying are suggesting it's more complicated than that because I've been emphasizing that we, that we want the, the ideas that uh, occur to us to be reality oriented and and of course that's also complicating the picture um, in uh, in philosophy of of science as well i mean it's it, it, it we, we it's not enough that as we're just kind of randomly to to think of hypotheses so i mean they've got uh, even at the level of select of as we're trying to, to devise hypotheses they you know we've got to somehow focus on the promising uh, re, in some way reality uh, oriented ones. Um, but still, uh, to, at least to a first approximation, we've, we've, got, we've got this distinction and we've only been talking about imagination playing a role in the, the context of uh, discovery. Um, so uh, what, I, what I want to uh, argue now is that, that the imagination goes further in its kind of cognitive uh, uses than just the context of discovery. It doesn't, it doesn't merely uh, enable us to, to think of uh, hypotheses uh, in the first place. It also plays a role um, in our evaluation of hypotheses as true or false, uh, or as supported or unsupported by the by the evidence, and so that it, it in fact plays a second role in the context of uh, justification. And the kind of case that I, I think it's useful to consider here would be, um, well, here's an, uh, an example that I like to, uh, to use. Uh, so again, let's w w consider one of our ancestors who's, who's um, Traveling through the mountains, and and comes a, across a, a a stream which is which is blocking um, his uh, pro. It's, it's the stream is running between him and where he needs to get to, um, and this this stream is you know it's it's rushing between the the rocks, um, and you know it's 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 not it's not a trivial little uh, stream. And, and the question is, uh, should, he, should he try to, to jump over the, the stream? Um, and, I mean, the, si the situation is this. The, the, um, the best case is uh, where he tries to jump and succeeds. Because if he, try, if he tries to jump and succeeds, I mean, that's, that's something that's very quick. It doesn't take that much energy, and, and then he'll just be able to go on his way. So that's, that's great. Um, the worst case, however, um, is, is where he, he tries to jump and fails. Because if he, if he tries to jump and fails, then he's going to fall 
into the uh, stream, um, he, he may get, um, he may be drowned, he may, he may break his leg on a rock um, I, and, uh, and then starve to death or whatever. So that, that I mean, the, the cost of failure is very, very high in a, in a situation uh, like, like this. Um, and of course, there's an intermediate case where, um, where he doesn't try to jump. Um, and, you know, uh, let's, let's suppose that um, if he doesn't try to jump, he, ha he maybe has to, has to, to follow up the stream towards its source and go on some long, long detour, which, uh, w w which is, will not be uh, in danger of, uh, of killing him, but, but will involve very considerable uh, loss of, of time and uh, energy. And, and so th he's faced with the, the problem of whether to try uh, to jump. And, um, and really what he needs to know is whether uh, if he tries to jump, he will succeed in, in getting a across. And I mean, let's, let's assume that this is not one of the, the kind of cases where it's extremely easy to succeed, nor is it one of the cases where it's hopelessly difficult uh, to succeed. And it's not, it's not a case which is exactly like uh, any that, uh, that he's faced before, because the, I mean, no, the man is that these things, they're all different. All these problems are slightly different from each other because the, 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 the rocks that you have to run over to get up speed to jump over and, and where you're landing and how slippery the rocks are. And they, I mean, every situation is a bit different. So you can't do it just by a simple extrapolation uh, from, you know, from some previous case where you tried and succeeded or some previous case where you tried and failed. So uh, the, the question is what, what is the, the natural way of trying to, to solve this uh, problem for a, a human being? Uh, you know, a, a human being with, without lots of mechanical resources or, or whatever. And I take it that the, the natural thing to do is uh, to, to use your imagination. So what, what, what you do is you, you, you stand there, I mean, you're looking, you're looking at the exact place where, where you'd have to try to jump. I mean, the, on, the only place where it maybe, let's say, where it's, it's at least might be feasible to, uh, to jump across. So you, you have to pay attention to that. But then you have to imagine yourself doing the jump. And then the question is, well, when, when you run on that, use, uh, uh, that exercise of the imagination? Do you end up imagining yourself uh, falling in the stream, uh, or do you end up imagining yourself getting to the other side? Um, and you might, I mean, if you're not sure, you might, you might try that exercise uh, several times over. So th this is a kind of natural exercise. To, for us to try it. Now, it can, this can easily seem like a totally crazy way of solving the problem. Because, um, after all, however hard the stream is to jump, I mean, you know, even if, even if the stream were a kilometer, uh, you know, it was, well, more than a stream, you know, it was a kilometer wide, you could still imagine yourself uh, trying to jump over it and succeeding. I mean, you can, um, you know, I, I mean, it's possible to imagine oneself jumping over the Atlantic Ocean, right? I mean, um, you, you, you can do that. I mean, um, and on the other hand, however narrow the stream is, and if, you know, even if it was a, 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 just a trickle a couple of centimeters wide, you, c you could imagine yourself um, failing. I mean, you could imagine yourself as you were jumping, suddenly shrinking to the size of a, a mosquito and falling in, a, you know, all, all sorts of things. So you might think, look, uh, th this is a completely pointless exercise because we can imagine whatever we like, irrespective of how hard or difficult this stream is to, to jump. But I think 
what that kind of um, objection uh, neglects is the distinction that I made earlier between voluntary and involuntary uh, uses of the uh, imagination. Because the, the, the kind of imaginative exercise that we're considering here is one that actually involves a, a combination of um, the, the voluntary and the involuntary. The, the voluntary part of the imaginative exercise is that you will yourself to, to try to, uh, to imagine trying to jump. Um, so, that's, so it's the trying to jump, which is uh, the part that you voluntarily imagine because you're, because you're interested in the consequences of, of trying to jump. But then, what you, what you do is not, as it were, interfere with your imagination any further. You let your uh, imagination uh, continue this scenario in an involuntary manner. And you, you rely on the, uh, the imagination to, uh, to, to do that in a reality-oriented way. So this, this, this is not an exercise that you can just fix. I mean, the, the, when I was talking about you know, imagining yourself succeeding even if it was hope, a hopelessly difficult stream to jump or failing even if it was an incredibly easy one to jump. Uh, those were both voluntary exercises of the imagination. But what, we're what we need to do for this exercise to be a good test uh, is uh, to, to, to let the imagination run on in an involuntary uh, way. I mean, of course, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's certainly possible for, for it to give you the, uh, the wrong uh, answer, but it's, it's, not, um, it's not a bad method. And, you know, I, I mean, the fact that I'm here to give this uh, lecture uh, is some evidence that it's not a bad method, because when I'm walking in the mountains, this is a method that I sometimes use, and, and so far it's, it's served me uh, okay. And, and, you know, various friends of mine, you know, that have told me that this is exactly the method that they use. And it seems like the, the natural uh, human way of uh, solving this uh, problem. So that uh, our imaginations actually have some um, cognitive capacity here. And, uh, and what they're, um, they're doing is, is not just suggesting possibilities to us, uh, they're actually, in inappropriate circumstances, they're actually enabling us to know uh, a truth or to the effect of, of, of whether, if we tried, we would succeed. And of course, that's c very, very closely related to the question of knowing uh, whether we are able to, to jump across the, uh, the stream. Right. So, so the... the these are cases where the Im imagination is uh, playing a, a role in the context of justification. It's actually justifying a belief about whether we would succeed or not if we tried to, to jump the, uh, the stream. Um, and I mean, that, the case that I've just given you is, is a particularly uh, simple kind of case, but, but often we, we can use our imagination uh, in much more uh, elaborate uh, ways, uh, so that, for example, you know, if the if the problem that we were facing was uh, uh, whether to to climb, uh, you know, to try to climb a cliff, let's say, where, uh, you know, not, not the not the, uh, the most impossibly steep cliff, but uh, you know, kind of very s but but very steep, rough ground, and um, you know, again, which might be barring the way that we want to go, and. Uh, and again, this, it might be a similar situation where if we try to climb it and succeed, then that's the, the best option because, because that's a relatively quick and uh, not too energy consuming um, option uh, by comparison with, with going some very, very long way around. But of course, the worst option is that we, we try uh, to climb the cliff and fail because that, I mean, that might easily involve falling and, and killing ourselves. Uh, or whatever, and in a case like that, it's not simply, a, as it were, a simple act of 
uh, as, as it were, a one-off imagining. It's, it's more like uh, as we're trying to, to trace a, a route from the bottom of the cliff to the top, where at each stage, you, you know, you're, I mean, you're looking at the cliff, but you're also imagining yourself going up the cliff and, you know, do you, at this such and such a point, do you go left or do you go right? Would you be able to, to, to reach that, that rock and get on top of it and, and so on? And, and you're, you're trying to find a route up to the top. I mean, that's, that, th there you can have extremely complex imaginative exercises, but they're, they're basically trying to solve the, the same kind of of a problem. And by the way, I don't think it's only human beings, as I mentioned before, who do this. I mean, I used to, to have um, cats uh, uh, that lived at home, and, and sometimes I would see the cats um, looking, I mean, sitting at the bottom of a, of a tree and, uh, and looking up to a, a sort of you could see them kind of tensing their muscles and, and they, they were in a position to jump, but they were just sitting there to kind of twitching and, you know, uh, uh, who knows, but, uh, but it seemed to me that what they were, as far as I could tell, what they were doing was kind of mentally rehearsing the jump to see whether they could actually get up onto some branch and, and doing the very same kind of exercises that, that I, I do when, you know, I'm trying to, to see whether I can, I can get through, you know, somewhere in the, the mountains. Um, but I, I also think that, that the kind of this kind of uh, mental exercise that, that we do is, is one which is, remains something that we rely on for, for all kinds of purposes, including uh, very uh, important uh, purposes. So, for example, um, I mean, suppose that, that, that you have to decide um, whether to take uh, a new apartment. Maybe you're moving to a new place for a new job, and and uh, you know some you, you're, you're looking around an apartment to decide whether to to um, to rent it or not. Then you've got to decide, you know, whether I if you live there, you'd be happy. I mean, you know, or in, in more maybe in more. <laughs> Freudian terms, whether you, you would only be ha, have normal human unhappiness as, as opposed to some um, <laughs> the, the kind of misery of living in a really horrible place. And so, so the, the, what you have to do is imagine what it would be like to live in that place. And, you know, I mean, that's, that's, you know, quite an important life choice. And, I mean, you can think of all, other, all sorts of other life choices uh, which we have to make about our futures. And, of course, we don't always get them uh, right, where, where we, we have to do it on the, uh, the basis of imagining what it would be like to take the different options. I mean, of course, sometimes, uh, you know, the imagination fails. But in lots of cases, we can actually use the imagination to get knowledge of these kinds of uh, things. So that in, in these examples, uh, the, the Im imagination is, is giving us knowledge, of, roughly speaking, of uh, conditionals of the form, you know, if I were to take such and such an option, then such and such would, uh, would follow. Right. And uh, you know, if, if the imagination is uh, something that uh, can give us knowledge of, uh, of those kind of truths, which have this important and very direct practical uh, value, then that would certainly help to uh, explain why such a cognitive uh, faculty has uh, evolved. I think we can also understand a bit more about uh, its role in our cognitive lives if, if you compare I imagination and uh, and prediction of the the future, even in cases where we're not thinking about hypothetical uh, possibilities, uh, because the, we, we've got to be able to to predict um, all, all all sorts of things. So that, I mean, so some of the, the some of these predictive uh, capacities may be more or less hardwired uh, into uh, into our brains. So that, for example, you know, if if you 
if you see a, a, a you know a stone uh, being thrown, um, you you know you may have to uh, to predict where it's going to land and, and you know act uh, accordingly for for one reason or another and uh, and that that kind of prediction of the you know the direct trajectory of a of a, a stone that's i mean that those the expectations we're forming there are uh, are more or less uh, automatic ones but of course there are uh, all sorts of um, other kinds of uh, prediction which are um, which involve much more uh, reasoning. So, um, that I mean, for example, you know, some, sometimes uh, you know somebody brings you uh, you know a piece of of news. Let's say the um, I don't know the, the I imagine a shepherd who, who's um, looking after some sheep, and somebody r rushes uh, in to to tell her that the uh, the sheep have uh, escaped. Uh, from the the sheepfold, then she's got to think about well, where will the uh, the sheep have have gone? And so, that in that case, the, uh, the this this is some capacity to uh, to predict the the future or where will they go? Let's say if, if they haven't already uh, gone there, so that she knows where to to go uh, to follow them. Um, but if you think about it, these abilities to um, update our beliefs on the basis of new information that we get are, are very, very closely related to our ability to evaluate kind of hypothetical conditionals of the, time, of the kind that I've been talking about. Because um, I in the case where, you, where the shepherd has actually brought the, the news, uh, the sheep have escaped. Uh, and then she thinks, oh, they will go down to the river, let's say. Um, that there's an analogue of that where nobody brings her the news, but she's just thinking about what would the sheep do if they were to escape. And then, um, and then she, as it were, she goes through a kind of imaginative exercise, uh, which is very similar to the one that she goes through when she actually gets the news, because it's, um, she's considering a conditional of the form, if the sheep were to escape as opposed to getting told the sheep uh, have escaped. Um, and so to some extent, what, what seems to be going on here is that these uh, imaginative exercises are a kind of offline version, to use computer jargon, um, of uh, the of an online updating process. In the online updating process, you, you get, as it were, a piece of information about how things are, and then you update on that. Whereas in the uh, imaginative uh, case, uh, what happens uh, is that, that you, you don't get told this piece of information. You just, you just, as it were, treat as input to the same kind of cognitive processes, something purely hy hypothetical, like if, you know, the sheep, if the sheep were to escape, but then you process it in, an ex in, a, in a similar uh, way. Um, you, you know, for example, you, the shepherd, uh, shepherd does that using her knowledge of the, the sheep's habits and so on. So that these, these imaginative exercises, we can make them a bit less uh, mysterious by by understanding that that what's typically involved in them is, is just this kind of offline version of an online um, mental process l like uh, prediction of or updating of beliefs on the, on the basis of uh, of new information. Of course, w w w with the imagination. Um, in many of these processes, there's a very, very complex interaction between the imaginative part of the exercise and a kind of online um, 
processing of perceptual information. Because in the cases that I was describing of you know, w w assessing whether you, w whether you could jump the stream or um, the, decide you know, whether you could climb the cliff and so on, it's important that you pay very, very close attention to the perceptual information that you get as you look at the stream and, and where all the rocks are and how slippery they are and so on, or to the, the cliff and, and where all the different, you know, where the different places that you could try to, to m make a route up. Um, so there's, there's an, uh, even there, there's an online element, but then you're adding to that something offline, which is the imagined uh, you, uh, activities of, of yourself. Um, so that, that in a way, w w what we're concerned with, with the imagination, is this capacity to, to run um, offline simulations of uh, mental uh, processes which we can uh, also run online. What one thing I should, I should say about these I is that the kind of examples that, that I've been giving are ones which uh, naturally involve uh, some kind of um, mental imagery, uh, something pretty m close to just entertaining pictures of these events, as it were, picturing yourself as succeeding or failing to, to jump over the stream and, and so on. And, th and those are particularly natural where it's, it's a problem that is set uh, in terms of the environment as you are currently uh, seeing it. But I, I, I don't think that it's right to, to think that that is essential to all uses of the uh, imagination. Uh, I think there are some which don't really depend on um, on mental imagery. So, for example, uh, suppose suppose that you've that you've made um, an an arrangement with a friend that you're going to meet for lunch, and and now suddenly something comes up, so it's actually rather inconvenient for you to meet uh, for lunch. Although perhaps you perhaps you, you you know you could still do it, but it's awkward, um, and and so maybe you know you want to uh, to work out. Um, whether if you were to, to cancel uh, the, the lunch, your friend would be disappointed, or how disappointed would she be if you cancelled the, the lunch? And uh, you don't really, it's not really a matter of forming a mental image of, of your friend. I mean, of course, you know, you, you could do that by, you know, seeing, you know, w you know do you imagine her with a, with a sad face or a happy one or something like that? But, but that, I don't think there's, there's any a particular need to do it that way. I mean, you might well be what, trying to imagine things from her point of view and, and not really in terms of, of what she would be um, actually seeing or hearing, but, but the, way, the, the way that she would feel about it. And uh, I mean, there are much more uh, elaborate uh, cases of that as well. So, for example, um, in in politics, political decisions often involve um, the use of the uh, imagination to predict what would happen if such and such. You know, so uh, you know, if if, um, if North Korea w w were to uh, invade South Korea tomorrow, how would uh, President Trump react and things like that? Or, you know, a politician trying to work out um, how their supporters would react if, if they backed, uh, you know, a certain um, you know, piece of tax legislation or, you know, whatever it, uh, it happened to be. And, uh, I mean, those, those are quite genuine uses of the imagination. I mean, they're, you know, a good politician needs some kind of political imagination to be able to th think through such possibilities. But, but mental imagery is really uh, not the, the key thing there as well. So it, it's, this is a much more general kind of uh, cognitive faculty that we have to, as it were, to in some way to simulate uh, uh, offline what we can uh, do online uh, in the sorts of ways uh, that I've been uh, describing. So, so we've got this a whole range uh, of um, of uses of the imagination, which are are there to um, to enable us 
to, to acquire knowledge of uh, quite, quite practical down-to-earth things. Because I, I, mean, I think often when people think of knowledge by the imagination, that, you know, they're, they're thinking of uh, some knowledge of very deep truths, you know, as it were, that supposedly conveyed by um, great novels or something like that. And the imagination may have a role there, but, but the kinds of knowledge that I've been talking about in, uh, in this uh, lecture are of, of very practical kinds of uh, knowledge. I mean, and just to give you a few more examples, because the, the, the examples that I've been giving all have to do with, uh, so far, with, with things about human uh, behavior. Um, but, but the imagination isn't, isn't confined to that as well. So you know, another kind of way you can use your imagination is, you know, suppose that you've got some uh, table that you, that you have to, um, to get, or you'd like to get from, from one room into the next room. And, and you need to, to think, well, will, will the table go through that door? And, and then you may do, do some kind of imaginative exercise in which you imagine maneuvering the, the table through the, the door. And, of course, you won't always uh, get a definite answer, but in some cases, using your imagination, you will, you'll be able to tell that uh, there's no way that table is, is going through the door. You, there's no point in even trying. And in other cases, you'll be able to see that it should be possible to, to maneuver it through the, the door. And so that's a case which, is, that's not really, co I mean, concerned with the, you know, whether you're able to, to lift the table or something like that. It's, it's, it's more actually just solving a kind of geometrical uh, problem about whether that table will geometrically fit through the doorway. And, uh, and that's something that, that we can do in a rough and ready way with our imagination. So that, that the, the uses of the imagination go, go well beyond uh, knowledge of um, human uh, capacities and uh, dispositions to, uh, to something much more general about just physical facts about you know, w w whether a given object will fit through uh, a given uh, opening. I mean, you, you might think that maybe in the long run, uh, all these uses of the uh, imagination uh, will be superseded by, by science. Um, and so, the, as well, this, the imagination is just a kind of temporary thing that we, we, we're using while we wait thousands of years for, for science to solve these uh, problems. Uh, I'm pretty skeptical uh, that, uh, that we're ever going to uh, be, be able to, to do without uh, the imagination. I mean, w w one uh, suggestion I'll just throw out without really developing it uh, is that, of course, the whole, the, the whole of uh, science depends on mathematics. I mean, uh, I mean, you can't really do any advanced science without various kinds of application of, of mathematics. Um, and when, when you think about our knowledge of mathematics and w why it is that we have such confidence in the, the principles of mathematics. I mean, some of it just comes from the fact that so far mathematics has done all right, but, but it, it, there's a, a bit more to it than that. I mean, the, the, the reason that, that mathematicians are, are, are pretty confident of um, the, the correctness of the, the first principles of mathematics, which, roughly speaking, these days are the axioms of, uh, of set theory, uh, is because um, it's not just that we haven't found any inconsistency in them, but that they actually um, correspond to a, uh, a coherent way of uh, thinking about the, the structure of uh, the hierarchy of sets and sets of sets and sets of sets and, sets and so on. And, uh, and in doing that, um, 
that confidence comes from a kind of I imaginative engagement with the sort of picture of uh, mathematical reality that the axioms are giving, which, which makes its uh, coherence uh, and uh, clear. And so it, I, I think there are lots of other ways in which we won't ever be, really be able to dispense with the imagination. But I think even right at the foundations of mathematics, where you, you might think that the imagination has no role to play, it's actually quite significant in uh, our basis for confidence that, that, for example, that these, these axioms are, are consistent with each other. So, uh, on the kind of picture that I've been giving, the, uh, the use of the imagination uh, in, for example, uh, you know, the writing of, of great novels is uh, extremely marginal to the reasons for which we actually have uh, imaginations. Uh, I mean, that doesn't mean, of course, that there's anything, as it were, illegitimate about uh, such uses of the imagination. I mean, the, the, uh, I mean they're magnificent, but, um, but I think, to, you know, to, if, if, we, if we took as our kind of paradigm of the imagination the great works of uh, art, and we tried to understand what the imagination is uh, in uh, relation to them, it would be rather as though, w in trying to understand why we have arms and legs, we took as our paradigmatic use of arms and legs their use in dancing. Right? I mean, dancing is great, but um, but you know, if you try to understand arms and legs in relation to uh, to just to dancing, you are kind of getting the wrong end of the stick. Uh, not, not because there's anything wrong with dancing, but, bec but because it, it's something, as it were, it's, uh, roughly speaking, that's our ability to dance is, if you like, an unintended consequence of our ability to do lots of other somewhat more basic uh, things with our arms and legs. And similarly, our ab ab ability to, to create uh, great works of uh, imaginative uh, fiction is an unintended uh, consequence uh, of uh, our imaginations, which we have for very much more uh, mundane purposes. Thank you very much. <laughs> we have no standing questions, but are two microphones, so please wait for a mic to start speaking. So thank you for the talk. Uh, so given that there are some, some uh, misfires of, of our imagination, for example, when we want to cross a road or something that, and, and correspondingly, we have some road kills, uh, both for animals or, or, or humans or any, any such incidents, then uh, <coughs> I was wondering, are we justified to say that uh, imagination uh, produces knowledge, given all these uh, misfires of imagination that that uh, apparently don't. I mean, definitely they don't. Those misfires don't produce knowledge because they don't correspond to reality, right? And <coughs> so, are we justified to say that they do, they our imagination often uh, produces knowledge rather than uh, given the successful uh, cases of our imagination corresponding to reality, those, those, those cases are basically uh, some kind of accidental correspondence to, to reality? So all human cognitive uh, capacities, I mean, of a general kind, are, are very fallible. Uh, so uh, and really what you're doing is just pointing to the, uh, the fallibility of uh, the imagination in the sorts of functions that I've been um, talking about. But I mean, if you just compare it with the case of perception, I mean, of course, people often misperceive things. Uh, you know, we, are, we off, in vision, we, you know, we, we, we form beliefs 
you know, as w about what we're seeing, which often turn out to be, to be false. But that doesn't mean that we can't know anything by uh, using our eyes. I mean, you know, right now, uh, you know, I think all of us can see that there are more than 10 people in this room. And, and the fact that sometimes we misperceive things uh, doesn't mean that under good conditions, uh, we, we can't get any knowledge by perception. And similarly, uh, in the case of, of memory, uh, an, an, an enormous amount of our, our knowledge uh, from, by, is from memory, I mean, just memory of all sorts of facts and also memory about experiences that we've had and, and so on. But of course, sometimes, sometimes the, uh, the memory uh, <laughs> We goes wrong, we, we misremember things. But that doesn't mean that knowledge by memory is impossible. It just means that, that you do, it doesn't, it's not the case that every time you think you're remembering something, you really are. But um, you know, unless we're going for some kind of completely general uh, skepticism, which is, wipes out all the, the kind of cognitive distinctions that, that we really need to, uh, to make, uh, we just have to understand that that cognitive capacities are, are typically are ones which give us knowledge in favourable circumstances. But when things go wrong, they can they, they we wind up with uh, with false uh, beliefs. Um, and I, th I think it's really just the same uh, with the the imagination that in in favourable circumstances, uh, there's a lot of stuff. That, uh, that we can know by the imagination. But there are also cases where the circumstances are less favorable and things go wrong. So I don't, I don't think the imagination is in a, a fundamentally different position from ordinary sense perception and memory and other cognitive faculties in that, that respect. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Uh, uh, yeah. Assuming that abduction is possible because of imagination and considering the role it plays in the context of justification, can there, can there be any inferential process that does not appeal nor involve imagination at any level? Yes, so... Um, I mean, there may, there may, for example, be... Uh, I mean, w w when perhaps just a, a very me mechanical uh, calculation um, is something that we can do, which is a, a kind of inference. You know, when, when we're by calculating, let's you know, the, a, an addition or something, we're, we're inferring the the answer, and and maybe uh, something like that d doesn't involve the uh, imagination. But but for example, um, in um, in more complicated kinds of argument, I, I mean, we're typically having to consider. Um, statements of the form, you know, if x, then then y, and uh, the the normal way of assessing uh, statements of that form of if x then y is by uh, supposing x and then and then assessing uh, y on the supposition of x, and that is a a broadly um, imaginative uh, ex exercise. Um, so, th of course, th there's a question about you know how how narrowly or broadly we we want to uh, apply the term uh, imagination. Um, but as I say, uh, you know, I, I think it, it's pretty clear that there are lots of imaginative exercises that don't involve sense perception, and um, and so I you know I'm prepared to to apply the term uh, extremely uh, broadly so that. Uh, you know, w when we're making suppositions, as you know, as we do, you know, hy hypothetically, and then arguing on that basis, that's a kind of imaginative exercise uh, too. And so, I, you know, I, I don't mind uh, the idea that that the imagination is something that plays uh, a role that kind of runs through a, a huge amount of of human cognition. That was actually a quick follow-up to uh, Amir's question. So, um, um, so uh, the idea is that you can misperceive things, you can misremember things, and these faculties are in a way fallible, right? But uh, there seems to be like an important disanalogy between imagination and perception. Is that uh, perceiving is affective, 
uh, mental state, right? So if I perceive that P, then I can uh, infer that P, right? Uh, whereas imagination doesn't seem to be similar in that sense. So, or would you be prepared to say that if I imagine something incorrectly, then I'm just misimagining? And imagining that P would always sort of be factive in that sense? Yeah. So, I, I mean, it's true that, that, you know, when we t talk about I imagining that P, that, that I, I, there's no implication that P has to be true in order for us to uh, I imagine it. Um, there's, there's certainly is such a thing as, um, you know, I imagining um, something wrong, you know, I mean, so that, for example, before I came to Tartu, you know, supposing that I'd uh, imagined uh, Tartu as, um, as a, a little group of uh, enormously high skyscrapers uh, surrounded by uh, 15,000 foot mountains or something, I would have been imagining it wrong. Um, so, um, you know, I, I guess th there's, there's a, a question ab about w why, we, why we don't have a, a factive, a truth-implying um, verb that we, that we use uh, so much in the, um, in the case of uh, I imagination. I, I mean, in... I mean, part, I think part of the reason for that might be that, that imagination is such a broad thing in a, in a way that, uh, that it, it, you know, it, some of these cases, you know, it, it corresponds to a lot of different uh, cases. But, um, but I, you know, and, and so that, w that a lot of the time, you know, we're simply um, des describing it using the, the more general term, uh, uh, you know, n no. Um, uh, but um, yeah, so uh, yeah, it would be it would be n it would be nice if there were a verb that that corresponded, you know, a factive verb that corresponded exactly to imagining as you know as uh, r you know seeing that and and remembering that and so on do in the, the perceptual and memory cases. But, I, but that's not essential to the, the argument that I've been making. Hi, I have a sort of clarifying question on the argument, uh, because I don't, I don't think I understood what's the position you're arguing against. Because if we were to sort of equate imagination and creativity, I don't think you would find a scientist who would claim that science isn't profoundly creative when we're building hypotheses or conceptualizing or uh, deciding on what and how to measure or uh, like analyzing stuff and it's at, at all parts yes. of the process it's very very much creative so like who are these people who think that uh, science and imagination and knowledge and imagination don't have anything to do with each other well that was that was why um, I I'd made this distinction between context of discovery and context of uh, justification, because as I say, I, I think, I in fact, if you look, if you look at the at the philosophical discussions of imagination, um, the the they are uh, they do tend to to go with the kind of stereotype that I began with. I mean that, that so that philosophical discussions of the uh, imagination, uh, you know, they they they're very often focused on. Um, Fiction and fantasy and those sorts of things, and the you know, so that al although you might think that what well, I'm uh, a lot of what I've been saying is is common is common sense, it is in fact not at all uh, the, the the standard thing to say about the imagination. But in, in the in the case of what of the as well the kind of the scientists. Role. Uh, uh, I mean, what the scientist view of the role of the imagination in science. Um, I, I mean, I agree that I, you know most reflective scientists, if you ask them, does the imagination play a role in, in science, would say yes. But I think they would. I mean, and I think they would describe it in the kind of terms that you're doing. But those those terms uh, seem to to focus mainly on the context of discovery. 
that as well, you, you need an imagination to, um, to come up with, with new theories, new hypotheses, and, and so on. But I, I don't think that it's, it's such a central part, or that, that this is, it's a standard view among scientists that the imagination plays this role in the context of justification. So that, that was why I spent so much of the lecture on arguing that, that imagination plays a crucial role in the context of justification, because I think that's, that's the part that, that goes well beyond uh, what scientists uh, probably uh, would agree is, is the role of imagination in science. So at first, so my impression was that you want to distinguish between two kinds of, let's say, thinking, offline thinking. One of those you call imagination, and it is imagination in so far as it involves some kind of usage of imagery. Now when you responded to some of the earlier questions, I got this new impression that you say that no, imagery actually is not necessary, that actually this what you call imagination is much broader and pretty much any inference making involves or consists in, in, in imagination. So my question is, like, if, if that's the case, so what is it that is left to imagination that keeps it from collapsing into any kind of offline thinking, if not this imagery well, uh, so that w what, I w what I was, um, I mean, th I started off with a whole bunch of examples where um, the imagery was playing a, a, a central role for those examples. Um, and, uh, and then, and then I, I gave other examples, which also I think are pretty clearly ones involving the uh, imagination, but where uh, imagery is, is not... Uh, required and um, and what what those all all had in uh, in common w was that w that we were explore uh, there was uh, this kind of hypothetical aspect to it the the uh, which is often expressed you know with in uh, if statements uh, um, uh, which were equally relevant to the um, to the uh, to to the non-imagistic uh, cases, so um, I'm not sh I'm not sure w what the uh, what kind of offline uh, cases th you're think thinking of that w that we shouldn't be applying the term imagination to. I mean, I'm I'm quite you know I mean if if it turns out that that all as it were offline thinking counts as a use of the imagination. I, I mean, that, I don't see that's a that's a problem for me because the as it were the offlineness uh, is um, is already something distinctive. I mean, it, it, it of course we you know we we have to be you know decide a bit about exactly uh, how we were going to to demarcate things because you know I, I think the um, you know, in, in the case that I, I mentioned of, you know, doing a mathematical calculation of a purely mechanical kind, not one that involved anything uh, hypothetical. I mean, you, you know, you're, you're not, you don't have to be doing that uh, by uh, attending to your environment. So, that, I, mean, you, I mean, you might be doing it in your, just purely in your, in your head. Um, of course, you know, e even there, it, it might be that there is actually a, a, an imaginative element to that. I mean, it might even be that when you're doing a calculation in your head, you're actually, you know, imagining, you know, the, the, I imagining the numbers as, as if they were, you know, they were written on a piece of, of paper. But, I mean, it, was there a particular kind of offline process that you, you, you thought it was important not to describe as, as involving no, no, the imagination? No, rather the opposite, that I, I thought that what you want to, you want to say that there's this bigger, bigger category, offline thinking and such, and then within this category we have imaginative thinking, and then I was a little bit confused, yeah. because no. in the end I thought that you're willing to accept that all kinds of offline thinking are actually imagination. No, so, no, no, that, so the, it, it, wasn't, it wasn't that I, I was 
making a, a distinction you know, between the, some narrower category of the imaginative and, uh, and then a wider category of the, of the off, offline. It, I mean, it was really, I just started off with examples which involved mental imagery and then emphasizing that, that this, uh, this offline kind of uh, processing is much wider than, than just the cases involving imagery. Hi. Um, so uh, one place where uh, imagination is, well, like many people believe that imagination, imagination plays a role in the context of justification is in simulation theory in thinking about knowledge of other minds. Yes. Um, and I was wondering how that sort of view relates to the one that you're putting forward. Is it just a special case of what you're talking about or is there some way in which it's categorically distinct or different? So. A, a lot of a lot of the cases of uh, simulation are ones that that I would certainly would kind of fall under the account that I was uh, giving. Um, I mean, one difference I think is that sim simulation is supposed to be a simulation of mental states right that you you know you're, and and some of the cases that i was describing as i said would fit very nicely with that in the case you know where you're simulating uh the uh, you know you're wondering how how disappointed your friend would be if you cancel the lunch appointment and then you you might be trying to simulate their mental states when they get the news uh, or if they get the news that uh that you that you're cancelling um but a lot of the cases that that i was uh describing don't seem to be ab about simulating uh, mental states. They seem to be about uh, simulating events in the, in the world, like you know, w w whether you actually succeed in jumping the, uh, the river uh, and uh, or whatever. Now, uh, there's, there is um, a, you know, an attempt that people have made to assimilate all of these other cases uh, to the the case of of mental simulation by saying that really what we're doing in these cases is we're we're simulating and the mental states of an observer uh, who's who's observing these uh, uh, events. Um, I'm not uh, very uh, sympathetic uh, to that. Um, I, I mean, I think it involves a kind of uh, sort of Bishop Barclay sort of uh, fallacy. Um, because, I mean, of course, you know, when, when, we, um, when we simulate um, things in a, in a, even in a, vi a visual way, we're, we're kind of simulating what they look like. Um, but, but we're not, we're, we're not sim but, but simulating what they look like isn't the same as simulating that somebody is actually looking at them. You know, and so it seems to me, for example, it's perfectly possible to, uh, to simulate what a room looks like when nobody is in it. Uh, you know, and, and I don't think that, that we're, we're kind of really simulating what it looks like when an invisible observer is, <laughs> is in it or anything like, like that. And, uh, and similarly, I, you know, I think the, you know, in the case of um, some of the political uh, Examples where you know we're simulating you know w w what would you know what would happen. We we're not necessarily simulating any uh, any one person's uh, mental states. So, uh, so that um, you know, I, I think that there's a kind of al although there's certainly overlap. I think as were the the simulation literature. It, I mean, trying to assimilate all of these examples. I'm not suggesting that you were doing this, but but people have tried to assimilate all these examples to the simulation literature. And and the problem is that that involves a kind of uh, psychologization of the uh, the content of imaginative uh, exercises, which which is in many cases quite uh, inappropriate. Thank you for, for your talk. Uh, in the recent uh, literature in philosophy of mathematics, they, the imagination is often opposed to, uh, to rules. 
So the question is not about our representations, whether they are internal or external, but more about how, how you, we manipulate them. So some would say that we manipulate uh, our representations by uh, informally, by imagination, and others would say it's by uh, rule following. You know, the, uh, and in this literature, there are two limits that are uh, often mentioned when it comes to imagination, and I was wondering your opinion about them. So the first one is that precisely that imagination might be very helpful for discovery and you know, this uh, um, productive, uh, productive ambiguity of imagination, but it, it cannot account for rigor. And so my first question was, how, how, how can you account for rigor when it comes to uh, mathematical imagination? Can you use imagination in order to, to, to say about the proof, for instance, that it's rigorous, etc.? And the second one is that you cannot imagine mathematical impossibilities, or that you can imagine physical impossibilities. You can, you can think about things that look impossible physically. You can think about traveling in time or something, but you cannot imagine something that's mathematically impossible. You cannot think about a number that will be uh, um, bigger than five but smaller than three or something like that. So do you think th these two objections will uh, hold? Yeah. Um. So I, I'm not, I, don't, I don't think I agree that you can't imagine a mathematical um, <laughs> impossibilities bec because um, so you know if I mean if you take something like let's say um, Goldbach's conjecture, which, which you know that uh, every even number greater than, than two is the sum of two prime numbers. I mean, this, which I, I think is still un, undecided. Uh, so it, uh, as it were, as for all we know, it's true, and for all we know, it's false. Um, and, you know, I, and I think that, that you, can, you can imagine it being true. Um, I, you know, and there are various things that it's being true would involve, you know, so that we never find a country example and so on. And you can also, you know, you can imagine it being false. You can imagine somebody discovering a, uh, a country example to it. Now, of course, uh, th there are limits to, to how far we can fill in all the details of those imaginative uh, exercises. Uh, because, you know, we, we, if, if, we, if we try to, as we specify exactly which number it was that was the counterexample, then, you know, we'd get into, into trouble because we, we don't know of any counterexample. But, um, but, you know, it's not a precondition on imagination that you fill in all the, all the details. I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's not, I mean, you know, it's, it's not a, a precondition on, you know, on imagining, um, the, uh, let's say the events in, in Hamlet that, that we imagine exactly how many hairs Hamlet had on his head or something. Um, so so I, you know, I, don't, I don't think that mathematical impossib impossibilities are um, unimaginable uh, in this the kind of sense of my imagination that I've, I've been talking about. Um, I think often when when mathematicians are, t are talking about uh, I imagination, and th I mean, the, 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 they're particularly thinking about examples uh, where they're, they're using um, their, their visual imagination to, to think about some mathematical uh, problem. And, you know, maybe as were some, some kind of geometrical uh, imagination or, or something like uh, like that, although well, it doesn't, it, they don't have to be only those uh, cases. And so, you, and you were asking about uh, the the relation between uh, th those kind of imaginative exercises and uh, and and rigor. So, I think many mathematicians, in fact, regard these these imaginative uh, exercises where you kind of get the gestalt for what, you know, why this result holds or how the proof works, th they think that that's the real heart of the proof. And, uh, and that w when you, as it were, have to w write out all the details of the, uh, the proof, um, that those, those are kind of just the, the boring details that you have to do because, you know, the, the, that, that is the, the, I mean, for good reason, that's the, the protocol. Uh, in in mathematics, um, and and in fact, even you know, even in the case of um, checking proofs in mathematics, I mean, maybe that 
uh, we're slowly moving towards a time when proofs can be completely mechanized. But you know, it, the kind of proofs that get published in mathematics uh, journals uh, are, are often, I mean, they, they often are, are extremely elliptical so that you, you need to, to know an enormous amount about the subject, uh, even to understand a proof you know, it, it, uh, in advanced uh, mathematics. And, uh, and, when pe so, and when people are, are, as it were, are testing these proofs, are checking the proofs, um, they're, they're typically not doing something as, you know, as mechanical as just going through it line by line and, and you know, checking is this an instance of modus ponens or whatever. Because it, in fact, every single step is one that you have to have quite a lot of mathematical understanding to, to, to ass assess. And, and the, I, I think a, a, a more typical process of uh, proof checking uh, is where you get experts reading the proof um, and who have a sense of, as it were, w which bits of the proof are just kind of business as usual and which bits are ones where uh, something special or different is going on and, uh, and who have a sense of you know, if there, which, which bits sound as if they might not be quite right to begin with and then, and then they look much closer at those and think through very carefully those bits. So that as it were, the, even, the, even the process of, of checking a proof uh, is, is one which uh, involves a lot of mathematical skill and, uh, and where it, it, might, it might easily uh, be that uh, you know, what, what satisfies the expert who's checking, who's checking the proof, maybe as a referee for a journal or whatever, is that, that you know, they look at that step and what, at first they can't see how it follows and then they, as well, they, then they see what the picture is that, that, that makes sense of this step and, and, and then they're satisfied. So that, you know, although, I, you know, it's true that uh, th there is a... a, um, a some difference between just having an initial picture and actually writing out the proof. It, the, it, it's not as black and white a difference as you might think, and that the, the, the process of uh, applying mathematical rigor, in particular in the, in the, the checking of uh, proofs, itself typically involves a lot of um, mathematical insight, which may involve these, exactly these kind of imaginative exercises that I've been talking about. Uh, thank you for your talk. Um, um, my question is about embodied cognition uh, philosophy and recently... Could you speak up a bit? I yeah. Uh, embodied cognition and inactivist philosophy, they recently highlighted the role of non-representational knowledge in human cogn cognition. And I, I was wondering what would be your take on it. Could it be that it's not the imagination but kind of a sensory motor experience of previous um, similar movement, like a habit of similar movement that um, we use to assess uh, our ability to climb the cliff or jump uh, the stream. I understood that you are operating with a very wide, uh, broad um, meaning of imagination, but this embodied um, concept offers a convenient hierarchy between habit, perception, stimulation, mental representation, and imagination. Yeah. So I, I certainly don't want to exclude um, a role for, so for uh, as it were, sensory uh, motor uh, habit and, and experience if, uh, in some of the exercises that, that I was uh, talking about, but of course, uh, in the sorts of cases that that I was I was talking about, um, that does have to be integrated uh, with uh, with perception, and um, and you know if you think of, the, of something like the the case of climbing the uh, the, the cliff. Um, so I mean, supposing you're you know you're looking at the cliff from some from some different from some distance, um, I mean you can't tell exactly which 
uh, sensory motor routines are going to be involved in, you know, step by step or anything like that. Um, but nevertheless, it, it is often possible to see, oh yeah, there's, there's that kind of grassy ramp, that, and so what, if I can get up to there, I'll, I'll be okay for, the, you know, going up the rest of the, the way. So that, um, you know, I, I, th I, think, I don't think that the kind of imaginative exercises that I've been talking about can just be uh, reduced to sensory motor habit. And e you know, even in the case of the, um, the, the jumping the, the stream, which was the, kind of the simplest of them, you know, I, I was you know, emphasizing that, um, th that each, each of these uh, challenges is different from, the, from others you know, because of the, there's a I mean, you have to take account of the exact ways in which the rocks and, uh, are distributed and how slippery they are, whether you can run. And so, uh, although, I, I, as I say, I, I'm, 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 I'm perfectly happy with the idea that, that the, the sensory motor uh, routines and habits are, are playing a role, I, th I, th I think something more is involved as in, in addition to, to that to solve these complex problems. Okay, thanks. Um, so, somebody asked me, how do you know that there's a, a green uh, uh, well, blackboard in front of me, right? Um, I answer, I see it. Yes. Right? Or I see that there is one. Yeah, right? You can see that there is a green, black, uh, yeah. green board um, in front of you, yeah. Somebody asked me, how do you know that, um, <coughs> I don't know, how do you know that if you, if you punch the blackboard, um, well, either no, my fingers would hurt, or yeah, or there would be some sign on the blackbird. I, I, could I answer? Well, I imagine that. Would that I mean, would have the same kind of weight, or? In so, I mean, it, in that in that case, m maybe maybe you don't you don't need to do, to do an imaginative uh, exercise for. Although I think it's quite natural too. But but I mean, you 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 know, it could be uh, that that you. I mean, maybe you, you you know you just know well the boards are hard and 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 you'd hurt yourself if you if you punch a, a hard surface or something like like that. So so that um, for for some of these very simple ones, um, you know, I think just uh, doing it on the basis of uh, stored knowledge plus perceptual knowledge m may be enough. But um, but I, I th that was why I was I was focusing on. Um, challenges w with a bit more complexity to them than that, uh, w where uh, th there isn't you know, some kind of uh, straight comparison that you can make uh, between um, you know, pr previous, previous cases or some generalization that you know or, or, or something like, like that. And, um, I mean, one, one thing I, I, I should say is that, you know, something about the relation between what I've been talking about and, um, and just ordinary uh, induction from, from past cases, which, which is that, I mean, the way philosophers discuss uh, induction, they, they're thinking that, that as we're... The picture is that, as a way, you have this huge database of previous cases that you remember, and then and then you apply induction to extrapolate from the from this database, and th that seems to me a, a, a rather unrealistic picture of of how human beings, in fact, do these things. Because, you know, I, for example, you know, when I'm in the mountains, I, you know, I do not have some database that I can call up, you know, of 200 previous cases where I've got across the stream or something like that. It, and it seems to me that the, um, that the, the role of, of previous uh, experience uh, is, uh, is involved in, in not so much in, in uh, compiling a database of past experience, but of, uh, rather it, uh, it, it just calibrates the way we uh, use our imaginations. 
You know, so it's ca it calibrates imagination. Um, but anyway, it just in, ca in relation to the, the very simple example you were saying, I, I, don't, I, I don't need to insist that those very simple cases can, be, that can only be solved by the use of the imagination. I mean, the, we, we do have some stored knowledge which in simple cases may, may sometimes be enough.